let's start our day three, uh, which is low redshift cosmology. And um, the, this session will be chaired by Anjan Sarkar. So without any delay, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Sodov. Uh, so welcome to the morning session of day three. We'll have two talks before uh, tea break. First will be given by Shiv Shetty. We'll be talking about detecting H1 in the post reionization universe. So thanks, Anjan. And thanks, organizers, for inviting me to give this talk. And I noticed that today we have moved, I think, progressively are moving to lower redshifts. Like first there was inflation and CMB, and yesterday it was EOR, and and today it is like even lower redshifts. I'll start with this. I mean, I think this is quite a legendary figure in some way because I've seen it a thousand times in other stocks, and I've myself shown it quite a few times. So now there is a good point of reference for everybody to see that. So this figure gives us a sense of. The history of the universe, so you, somewhere it may have started here, wherever. After 300,000 years, so it, the recombination occurs, something we have heard about a lot. And then there is, it's followed by the recombination era, is followed by what is called dark ages, and we have heard about it yesterday. And then commences an era which we call, call cosmic dawn initially, there are many names, which is roughly here, and then it follows. It is followed by what is called epoch of reionization. These are two connected eras, cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization. And this is when the first sources form and they ionize the medium around them. And this process finishes to the best of our understanding around the around a redshift of six. And that's what it is. The universe is close to a billion years old at that point. And we are going to be focusing on this part of the evolution of the universe. And you can see actually the even the way it is plotted, it is different that what has happened is here, the medium is more diffuse. Right, that's how it, how it is shown, and these are like ionizing bubbles which are expanding around in the region. Here, it is all galaxies, and uh, proto galaxies, and that's what happens. So, after epoch of reionization finishes, the temperature of the medium. So, I'll, I'll say a bit because I'm not going to cover it later on. After the epoch of reionization finishes, the gas is photo ionized in the intergalactic medium with a typical temperature of 10 power 4. Gas generally remains at 10 to the power 4 even in the interstellar medium. So 10 to the power 4 is a typical temperature of gas. And in that kind of gas, the kind of halos that form are atomic cool halos at least, like masses few times 10 to the power 8 at least or heavier. And that has to be worked out from the lambda CDM model. And these halos have to be optically thick uh, to the ionizing radiation around them, but otherwise they'll get ionized again. So they have column densities what I call objects, and I'll keep referring to halos and objects, these have column densities well in the excess of 10 to the power 17 that is needed to keep it optically thick. So they are what are called damn Lyman-Alpha clouds or close cousins of them, 10 to the power 20 to 10 to the power 22 uh, column density. So that is what these objects are in H1. And this is our aim, to, uh, to see them in H1. Of course, they are seen very nicely in optical, infrared, radio, but not so readily in H1. And I will again start with a very brief discussion on this point. I wanted to make this talk like somewhat self-contained. So H1 is like, it's a hyperfine structure of neutral hydrogen. I think we, people have heard it, spin-spin coupling. And a very nice discussion on this, if anybody wants to actually see the quantum mechanics of this, is a book by Peebles on quantum mechanics, which actually works out most of the quantum mechanics of this line in pretty, in detail. And final lecture, of course, is always a good reference for this. So this was predicted in 1940s, detected in 1951, so not that long ago, not in the, uh, like uh, the era of quantum mechanics, which was 1920s and 30s, which was like really the heydays. This was a bit later. One of the things that marks this line, and that is what we're going to come back again and again, is that it has an incredibly low transition rate. If you put an atom in an excited state of 21 centimeter, it's a triplet singlet uh, split. So there are three uh, levels in the excited state and a single at the bottom. The transition rate is 10 to the power minus 15, that means if you took, put an atom there, it takes a million years for it to decay on its own. And for comparison, you have to compare it with Lyman alpha, which is 6 into 10 power 8. So it's a factor of 10 power 23, quite large factor here. So this makes it easier to detect in extremely low density interstellar medium, which was the case. And now we are trying to do it in cosmological context, which has a density of one particle per cc as compared to Earth. And it was indeed first detected in the interstellar medium and not in the lab. lab it was done in the 60s. And one another thing that marks it, and that's what makes it easier as our choice of method for detecting H1, is that these are two levels. The ground level has split, and these levels are very, very close to each other. And the difference is corresponds around 0 0.06 Kelvin. That means they are easily populated. There's almost nothing that is colder than this in the universe. I mean, the coldest thing 
we generally come across the CMB. I mean, and this is well, well below this. So this is easily populated by collisions and radio. The point is whether you have the transition rates compare favorably with expansion rate. So this is the only probe we have of H1 emission, and this was, this has to be kept in mind. One may ask why not detect H1 using the regular Lyman series line of hydrogen, but after all, they have much larger A coefficients and why not do that? Well, that is actually a good probe of ionized hydrogen and I will not go into that and not so much of the neutral hydrogen. One of the reason of course is that if you try to actually heat the gas to a temperature where this will, these levels will get excited, Lyman alpha is 10.2 10 electron volt, you will end up ionizing the gas. So neutral gas which is at a typical temperature between 100 to 10 power 4 Kelvin, this is the way you detect it, otherwise the gas get ionized. Here, so this is our aim detecting H1 in the post recombination era. So the, in this era, I already said the neutral hydrogen is in halos with virial temperatures and virial temperatures could be in the range between 10 power 2, 10 power 2 is on somewhat on the lower side, 10 power 4 more like it or 5000 Kelvin. So I mean, but cooling mechanisms we do not really know so well, so this is fine. So this is in a halo and what this makes and this is the first lesson, this is the first difference between this era and what was yesterday, that was the epoch of reionization that the H1 density is at least 200 times more than the background density. So you have formed a halo and it is 200 times and it is more than that actually. So this causes H1 to be collisionally excited. Now this happens and you may have heard it yesterday when you were listening to talks on cosmic dawn and there is an important thing that the, the spin temperature of the H1 gas can actually be below the CMB temperature and that means that, that H1 is seen in absorption and not in emission. So here during this epoch, we don't really have to worry about it. To the best of my knowledge, I mean, we really don't have to worry about it. So this collisionally excites the gas and the spin temperature of the H1 is comparable to the kinetic temperature, which is well about TCMB. So we don't have to worry about it. All the gas that's available to us in the halo is seen in emission. And that's the first lesson here. It's all in emission, not in absorption. Okay. So the next task is we have want, want to know if we can actually detect this individual halo. Now, this is a very simple calculation, anybody can actually do this. You can compute the flux at any observed frequency from the amount of mass that is given to you and I take a typical mass of 2, point, 2 into 10 power 10, take 10 to the power 10, put it at ratio of 1 and ask what is the observed flux of this halo at the line center. Well, this is close to 10 microjansky. Now, this is very weak, this is not much, 10 microjansky is weak in the sense that and I will give you typical numbers as I will discuss more that if you take for instance GMRT which is the largest telescope in the world now, even now 10, 610 megahertz others are catching up. So and this will this is actually from an actual observation run noise around one gets a noise around 250 microjansky a channel okay. Now compare it with 10 microjansky 10 microjansky is way too low even if I put SKA SKA is going to have uh, well I mean it is an area 10 times maybe more than uh, GMRT these are numbers which are which change all the time. Even then, you can see that to detect a 10 microjansky halo at ratio of 1 will require 100 hour observation. This is not a typical galaxy that you just go out and observe, even with the largest telescope you are going to have, not now, but in the future. So if you are going to be able to see this, you have to devise other methods of detecting them. This is not going to suffice. You can't just take a telescope, try to integrate as long as possible. In any case, if you integrate longer, you hit systematic some, somewhere. So, most of my, the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about these methods and there are three of them I'm going to discuss and all three have succeeded in the recent past and that was partly my motivation for giving this talk. The first method is stacking. So this is like fairly straightforward and you look at it and you know that this should work. If you know the 3D position, but you need to know the three dimensional position of your galaxies, you need to know where the galaxies are located from optical survey and I'm going to talk about one optical survey in some detail. So. You take n galaxies from optical survey, you know their three dimensional position and you also need comparable optical and radio spectral resolution which is going to be the case here, right. I am going to talk about an optical survey like DEEP2 which has a spectral resolution for the best around 60 kilometers a second and with GMIT one can get 30 so it is fine even, even though the halo is much larger than that so that is fine. So what you do is you shift and add those galaxies. You don't detect a single halo, but you can shift and keep adding and you keep adding until, so you get an average flux is going to be this, the flux of a typical halo, but the noise would be smaller by a factor of n to the power half because noise is going to be uncorrelated across different halos. So you get a factor of n to the power half improvement by doing this and this is going to be demonstrated, it works. The other way and that is why I said flux and brightness temperature 
that if this does not work, this works by the way if you know the 3D position of the galaxy otherwise it does not, then you want to do what is called surface brightness fluctuation, which is called intensity mapping also at times. So, what you do is you want to detect it for multiple halos, not from a single halo, from a multiple halo. So, your beam is large on the sky, I mean like GBT and I am going to come to those telescopes. So, if there are multiple sources and they are clustered and if you look at a single, single experiment, if you can only measure fluctuations and the density perturbation is 0.1, then you can actually get net emission from within that beam of around 10 percent of the sources. So, sources could be 1000, you get emission from 100. And there is one more advantage actually which can you can call a disadvantage, you always have Poisson fluctuation. If I put four sources like this, they are always going to be Poisson fluctuation which is square root of the number. We typically want, we do want to beat the Poisson fluctuation, but within the context of this talk, you can even see Poisson fluctuation as a method of detection actually. It is possible to detect it just using Poisson fluctuation if possible. So, this is a method of choice. The third thing I want to say here is that when you want to statistically detect using radio interferometry, there is, this is an advantage over direct detection and I will not go into this factor, I mean this takes a while to get hold of this factor, that you do get an improvement when you do statistical detection of by this factor and this factor could be large, it is a fair fraction of this you can actually get, right. So, you can get lower noise, you can get flux from multiple sources, so you have a better chance of detecting it by using a variant of these methods. First, I will speak about the stacking method and this was based on, this is an n-body simulation which was done for deep two fields in 2011 and this is actually, so I am going to change the chronology a bit, this was actually motivated by the H1 experiment that had already been done, but I am going to come to it a little later because I will talk about stacking first. So, this is just deep two is an experiment which detected spectroscopically the redshift of a large number of galaxies close to 10,000 or so. In typically the redshift range between 0.7 and 1.304 and uh, spectroscopically we knew the redshift pretty well and the idea was you can simulate these fields using an n-body simulation and once you simulate that field, you do not have to do an n-body simulation for this work. I mean this was done for clustering which I am going to come to later, but that is a byproduct of the simulation. So, one can actually ask given a typical telescope like GMRT, can I detect it and here are the results. So, we do not know the masses of the halos of deep two galaxies, so you can have many models. In one case, the minimum model mass is 10 12.5, in the other case 12 in the other. And, and this is, the, here the number of halos is pretty large, that is why there is less fluctuation. So, we took at that point two noise levels per channel, 71 micro Jansky, I do not know where this one came from, 70 would have done and this is 420 strain number, but well, that is what it was, the two numbers we actually took at that point to just explore the possibility of detection of these halos by stacking. And in both cases, it seemed possible and like I gave you a number, I gave you a number right in the beginning 250 which is halfway between them, which was actually achieved in an observational run. So, it seemed possible to be able to detect H1 using simple stacking and GMRT uh, from such a field, deep two field. These are four fields roughly two degrees to one degree across, right. So, this is a simulation of one of them, okay. Of course, the number of halos cannot be matched to the actual observed halos because we still do not know their mass as well nor can we match a luminosity to a mass. Here is an actual experiment. So, this was based on this GMRT data of 850 sources which were stacked in using the method I just talked about and once you stack those sources, you come down to a noise level and that is what you should read around 2.5 micro Jansky is the noise level of this. So, you can actually compute very quickly 250 micro Jansky per channel average over 9 channels to get a halo because that is what you think the halo will be 270 or so and then you stack 150, get a square root of 150, 850, you get roughly here. So, this is pretty good with theoretical noise. So, you reach here and this gives one courage that well, if you go with more sources or you go deeper, you may actually detect it and that happened in 2020. It was detected with UGMRT data, difference between UGMRT and GMRT is GMRT has a bandwidth of 32, but UGMRT is far larger than that. So, in fact, it contains 7500 deep two sources in a broad redshift range and uh, once you did that, there was a detection and you can actually see there is a roughly a 5 sigma detection at the center and, and hello mass are from 10 power 10 solar masses. So, this is pretty good and this was also achieved by the legacy data which was uh, again low bandwidth, but the number of the number observed hours were both like 450 hours, but I am not showing you that figure. So, the point is the method of stacking sources to try to detect H1 works 
and that is what uh, uh, the moral of the story is here, right? And this was the highest at that point and now I think Nirupam is going to talk about his work where I have detected H1 using a gravitational lens system at a ratio of 1.3 comparable to this, right? But that is a single object. So we will hear about it later in the day. So one, so we, this is a cosmology conference, so we have to say something about cosmology. There was no cosmology in whatever I said until now because cosmology said has to come somewhere. So this, there is a lot of astrophysics there which I am not discussing, right? But to cosmology, one of the feedbacks here is that you can actually determine the average amount of H1 in the universe and that is something we use in cosmology all the time. And this is a point that is put here close to a ratio of 1, right? This is the red point. And you can see this uh, 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 green curve, this, this comes from Diam Lyman Alpha system of SDSS and these other bars are much smaller. This comes from absorption studies, there are some 5000 of them which are used to actually get those figures. And these ones below a redshift of 1, this one is a local measurement but these are all from magnesium system. So in fact there is a clear desert here you can actually see in the determination of H1 between redshift of 1 and 2 because UV studies only allow you to so, because Lyman alpha has to come into the optical band and that happens around a ratio of 2.5. So you go from here to here but there is a desert here and that desert is likely to be filled by the kind of observations I am talking about, hopefully. So this is what cosmologists have got from it, the average amount of H1 at cr close to a ratio of unity from this measurement. And you should also note of course this is a minimum because we are just looking at some galaxies which are pretty heavy probably, 10, 10 solar masses, quite large galaxy. So there's, there could be quite a lot of H1 in smaller halos which we do not know about, not yet at least. This was one technique, the other technique this work and is the cross correlation technique and this was actually done first and this was the motivation for the end body simulation really. That you take a known galaxy position and correlate it to the brightness temperature of H1 line. Now why brightness temperature, why not fluxes because you have a telescope like GBT which has a one arc minute resolution, there are so many sources in the field of you can't stack or anything there, right? So if you have, so this was done using GBT. So what you do is you compute brightness temperature, the average brightness temperature of the line rather than trying to detect fluxes of individual objects. But you know where there is a galaxy, that's where the H1 emission should be also on large scales. We expect that, right? And that is a simple formula which is written here if I try to cross correlate the brightness temperature to the dense, op, the over density of the optical galaxies, which is again deep two here. You can do get a simple formula like which is linear in the brightness temperature and this is just a correlation function of the density field of observed in a different wave band, one in red H1, the other in optical and you can plot it as a function of RZ. RZ is written because in the first measurement that was actually done, they could only do it along the line of sight. Of course, they have changed it with chime and I am going to come to that. So this also detected it and it is linear in brightness temperature. and this was the first detection and I am going to show you some figure and come back to this uh, again. So this was the first detection by Chang et al which was 4.5 sigma detection again. So this is correlating these two fields like I said along the line of sight and we actually our aim is for the end body simulation was to actually simulate it to see if you can actually simulate it. Indeed you can simulate it uh, actually far too well, I mean almost all, uh, it's difficult to devise models which don't give you this. Like so we had three models, they are all within the error bars. Partly is the error of the error bars but uh, the uh, it captures the clustering of halos and sub halos pretty well in modeling this, right. So this is what it is. Now this was the first result, there was another result in 2013 which I am not going to show. The main result in the recent past and this has taken, this, there is a lot of focus on it, is chime. So in 2022, they actually detected using exactly the same method. Now this was much higher significance, uh, 7.5 to 11 sigma detection. Again, cross correlating H1 brightness temperature, again chime like GBT has, uh, I mean angular resolution is poor, it is a few arc minute beam there. So you do exactly the same thing, you take, but in chime they did it in two dimension and they could make images pretty well. And so they cross correlated H1 brightness temperature with three different density fields. I mean in the redshift range, now redshift range is also more 0.8 to 1.4 and I will come back to these scales in a minute. First I will show you the results. So this, these are chime results. How much time do I have? Okay. So these are chime results. So what you do is you take a field of optical galaxy, smear it properly to create a density field out of that. You take a field of the redshifted H1 and you match them uh, like this such that at the center, 
it is again a stacking kind of an experiment except that it is surface brightness that have been stacked against the density field not fluxes. At the center you get an emission and that is what it is. You shift the field and you get nothing. So, point is if you shift and you can actually see here as a function of delta phi and delta theta. So, there are two angles here. So, these figures are actually a cut across either in this direction or in that direction and you can actually see there is a clear peak at the center and the model it is in agreement with the model reasonable agreement it seems to me and if you go far away you get nothing which means where there is there are optical galaxies h1 correlates with them that is where the h1 is but on large scales we are not talking here about small scales we are talking here about large scales I mean way outside the galaxy. So, this is actually telling you about the clustering properties of galaxies right rather than the property of an individual halo and its sub halos that is that is the idea unlike the stacking experiment which is far more sensitive to what is there in the halo and just around it. This you can do in frequency space also. So, these are the three optical surveys with which this was this cross correlation was done and it succeeded in all three. So, you can actually see there is a peak at the center at delta nu is 0 delta nu is basically the distance along the line of sight, but if you shift it this goes to 0 and that is what you expect. If you shift it by around a megahertz or so it goes to 0. So, this is an experiment that has actually worked and this has reported detection in the recent past and one of the problem with this experiment is and this is something that I will briefly discuss is that this again on in cosmology we want information on large scales. We want information on scales which are linear at that redshift of interest. These are not linear at redshift of interest, these are 0.3 mega parsec inverse and the linear scale would have been a factor of 10 if you could get up, then we would be happier, but that is a problem. So, these are upcoming missions like higher X chord and that is this is the aim. So, the aim is a, like roughly a factor of 10 I mean below this. How it will be achieved I am not sure. But having said so much, now I will move on to the final part of my talk. So, this is like in some way you can say holy grail of like what you want to do with detection of H1 because you really do not want to rely on knowing op positions using an optical survey. So, stacking requires it, cross correlation requires it, but what you want, what you can do is you can just go to an empty field somewhere where you have, you have no idea what galaxies actually exist and you take H1 field, you detect it and you auto correlate it with itself. This is called intensity mapping. So, this does not require redshift identification of galaxies and this is exactly what people in UR do. They have no idea where a galaxy is, even though I am sure like UR studies cross correlation might become possible with JWST detection. JWST has detected close to 100 sources between redshift of 10 and 20, right, maybe more. A problem with JWST identification is the redshift identification is pretty poor. I mean, I mean this is photo, these are photometric redshift delta z by is close to 0.1 I mean this does not work with 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is I mean so, uh, just a comparison we are talking about spectroscopic redshift which has an error of less than 100 kilometers a second. This is 30,000 kilometers a second so no way. So, let us see where this goes, but you can actually implement it with auto and cross correlation in frequency space directly with H1 field and this was one of the things that long ago Soam and I had worked on and some of some others too. And uh, we, we thought about GMRT at the sheet of 1 and 3 possibly if we can actually implement this kind of a thing. So, you auto correlate the field. Now, this does not work easily. You can compare signal strengths though. So, you can compute signal strength from the observed brightness temperature. So, you take all the H1 that we know. I mean, at from absorption studies, we had some idea how much H1 out is out there. You can compute the brightness temperature, it is around 0.2 milli Kelvin, looks too small at the sheet of 1. You can compute, typi compute typical fluctuation you might expect at k of 0.1 which is a scale going non-linear around that time or around today and you can compute the signal strength which will be like this. You can compare it to the UR signal. So, UR everybody is doing UR these days. So, UR signal is a little larger because all the baryons are in H1 at that point right. Here omega H1 is 0.10 to the power minus 3, there the omega B is 0 0.05. So, this is a factor of 50 below. So, factor of 50 of that gas has been captured, it is not in H1 any, anymore. Even though because it is at larger frequency, they are actually comparable sensitivities for brightness temperatures fluctuations actually, you can actually compare them to see, you have to multiply by a factor of the lambda 4 to this lambda 4 and you can see they are comparable sensitivities. If you could just take the ratios of intensity fluctuation, only you will have to devise a telescope which has larger baselines because lower uh, redshift will require larger baseline than higher redshift 
and so this is this was always possible there was no question that if you can do eor you can do this with much more easily because at higher frequencies uh, everything else is better right from the point of your physics this is comparable right and this is i have taken 0.25 for ionization inhomogeneous from eor which is about the maximum you will typically get lower than this so this was of course realized by a lot of people that you see before you do eor where you know you have problem with ionosphere and you have very bright sky actually you see there is no field in uor studies which doesn't have a one jansky source the fields that i discussed actually for the deep two there is only i think one 200 milli jansky source in all of it at 600 megahertz so this is possible and indeed there was fair amount of effort on this also but i'm run out of time now huh, four minutes okay i'm very brief about this actually i think you would have heard it already so you want to do it with radio interferometers and uh, with radio interferometers, you uh, H1 is statistically homogeneous and isotropic. So you actually have to map the pro properties of the interferometer, which is like a baseline and the frequency coverage, to the Fourier modes of the H1 signal. And this is how we actually do that. So you can actually work through the correlation function and show that U and V are the baselines. And this is the frequency coverage. So these are the third axis here. So an interferometer, interestingly, from the point of view of H1 signal, measures two Fourier modes and one real mode. It, on the plane of the sky, it's two Fourier mode, and there is this frequency axis, which is the real space. So you can convert it into all Fourier mode by taking another Fourier transform, and that's what typically is done. So these are the three Fourier modes of the H1 signal, which are compared here to the observed property of an interferometer. So this is typical in the field of EOR, of course, you see more in EOR or in this field. So I just wanted to introduce it here. The quantity of interest now in these variables, k parallel and k perpendicular, is you can compute what's called multi-frequency angular power spectrum. And so I think we'll cover some of these things later on during the day. And you can simply compute it, or you can take a Fourier transform of it and directly compute the pH1. I mean, this is typically done. And uh, you can actually ask what are the important parameters to be estimated if you ever detect this signal, like uh, th some of the parameters are standard code rate distance, I mean, uh, supernova, CMB have done it endlessly. So uh, not much out there. Uh, retrospect distortion parameter is done by galaxy surveys themselves, so you can do it there. Uh, the most important parameter here, and that has to be kept in mind, is R prime actually. You can detect R prime from H1 far more easily than from any galaxy survey. Now, this is called alcock pichinsky effect, so you can actually have local information of the expansion rate. So you can construct expansion history far more reliably than computing integrals to different redshifts. So that is an advantage here. And uh, this is something that we have worked on. Many, many other people have worked on. And this is how the signal looks like. Redshift of 1.5, 4.5. And you have to multiply by L square, divide by 2 pi to get a sense. And I already give you a sense of the signal. Two minutes. OK. So this is what the signal will look like, somewhat featureless. This is how it looks in the third dimension, and this is the key to detection of this signal. That if I take a map at one frequency and I try to cross correlate to do map another frequency, and I have to do it, I need three dimension to detect it because of foreground. So you can see this is L of 100, this is L of 1000, this is L of 10,000. The signal decorrelates pretty quickly uh, within a very short delta nu, for between 0.1 to 1. Only for L equal to 100, it's largish. So this decorrelation allows us to distinguish this signal from foregrounds. Again, I will not go into foreground like, I mean, I just, you know, this is how you can actually non-parametrically isolate foregrounds. Quite, you can do it analytically, actually. And you can do it both for point sources as well as for diffuse sources. And this is important because foregrounds are correlated across the frequency space. And uh, the signal is not, and this is the only way you can detect it because foregrounds are far stronger than the signal. And this is how the foreground, for instance, a wedge looks like, and this is actually, uh, just pay focus to the scales here, 10 to the power 16 to 1, actually. This is what we want to roughly achieve, maybe not, not this far also, but a factor of this. So foregrounds actually have come in this plane on the bottom side. And this region is very clean, and this is the region in which people want to detect EOR, we want to detect whatever, like the H1 fluctuation at lower redshifts. And it is indeed possible because it has been demonstrated at least two times so that you can do this, not for EOR yet, that I think is still some distance. But I want to uh, mention this, and this result came three weeks ago. And uh, we are glad about the fact that this the first author on this paper, 
I mean, he's a RI student and uh, he gave a talk last week here on this. So, this is the first detection which is a redshift of 0.3 and uh, using Meerkat, 90 hours of Meerkat data and made it possible to try to detect this and this is like again a 7 sigma detection, it is a clear detection and uh, yet again like I am trying to understand this paper, I have not fully understood it yet. So, this is very encouraging and this is at redshift of 0.44, the same detection, I mean and you can see there is a pattern here. Problem again in both of these figures as you can notice is the scales in the problem. You see you do not want, you wanted linear scales, you wanted to go beyond here, but that is not what you are, like this is 1, this is 0.4. So, again you are in the territory where you did not want to be and uh, what can you do? You have to live with what you get, but this is the first detection of intensity mapping. One thing that it has demonstrated and that is the, uh, that is the important thing, foregrounds can be isolated. Like cross correlation techniques already showed foreground can be isolated, this shows that too. But much more decisively, again the redshifts are low, sky is pretty clean, this is 1000 megahertz, sky is pretty clean here, there are not that many radio sources to deal with, but it has been demonstrated. So now I am going to stop here, this is going to be my last slide. So emission from redshift H1 hyperfine line has been detected using three different methods and that is what I talked about, three different methods. In the redshift range 0.3 to 1.4 and one wants to go to higher and higher redshift. Important thing is that at least two techniques have shown foregrounds can be managed, they can be isolated, you can get a detection which did not seem possible. So, boost for UR studies, maybe UR will, will do it, no idea, that is the future. And uh, this probably will go to higher redshifts and uh, I do not know because a lot of ongoing galaxy surveys at higher redshifts rely on photometric redshifts actually. Photometric redshift to its very best would go to around 1000 kilometers a second, even 1000 kilometers a second. I think will not allow you doing using stacking techniques or the cross correlation technique. So, it has to be spectroscopic redshifts for doing this to the best of my understanding. One aim of both of these is to determine H1 power spectrum at linear scale, that is what we want BO, everybody talks about BO as if like BO is right there, but this may not, this may become possible in the future, I always wonder the minimum accessible K, K parallel is this and uh, it is dangerously close to a nonlinear scale actually. Right, because whatever studies that I have been involved in and I did not talk about that using UR data and uh, at least the 10 first channels are contaminated at, from the bottom. So, that will take you into the non-linear scale. So, I, I do not even know if it is going to be possible, but we will always hope. There are ongoing this called which is the next generation telescope, Hyrex already working. ORT, big hope, ORT, there was a lot of work which was done with ORT the UT radio telescope to try to understand because UT radio telescope has been turned into an interferometer and one of the aims of that was to try to detect exactly this, right, that redshift of 3, UT radio telescope works around 327 megahertz, maybe, right, maybe we will be able to go there, maybe we will not be able to go there. Future telescope, SK may, may have some play, something to say about this, so that is for the future. I think I will stop now. Thank you very much. Yeah, time for some questions. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little on why you say the AP effect will be much better measured by 21 centimeter? Uh, because it is actually an inherent, it is a three dimensional map you see. See H1 measurement is in three dimension. When I measure a galaxy redshift, I measure one redshift and I measure another, I am looking at correlation properties, right? But I do not know the galaxies are sparsely populated. Right? So, you are talking about the short noise here? Yes. Okay. I mean short noise is one thing. For sure, absolutely. Short, you can say it short nice. Yeah, we do not even have those. We may not even have coverage. But here, it's a three-dimensional map, so you can always do that. So, Shiv, I mean, since uh, I mean, even the latest uh, Meerkat detection, you are saying it's mildly nonlinear scales, and probably the future ones will also be like that. For some no, I'm time. not saying that. <laughs> I, I, I wonder. When you please go yeah. ahead. Yeah. But I mean, still, uh, there could be a lot which can be learned from those scales also, right? I mean, I don't know. Outskirts absolutely, of halos absolutely. and no, no, no. I'm, I'm not. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to go there. I mean, bias, for instance. Yeah. See, some of the parameters which have been determined from this, right? I didn't show those. So, the relative bias between H1 distribution and optical galaxies will say a lot about astrophysics or formation of those objects. Absolutely, I am not saying it will not. But the, one of the aims when, for instance, when these experiments are planned, right, BOA always takes like this, okay, everybody talks about BO, is going to detect BO. That may not be easy, okay. But sure, it, I mean, detection itself is big achievement in my view. 
So I didn't mean that. Yeah, but sure. Yeah, so. Uh, actually, if you could even measure the turnover of the power spectrum, that itself would have a possibility. But turnover is point zero 0.02, right? So yeah, point. Have, yeah, but point zero. No, no, yes, I agree with you, but the point is like again, BO is uh, comparable to that actually. Okay. See, BAO, in fact, they are saying 0 0.05. Turnover is even beyond that. Yeah, 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 that's right, even before that turnover. So, you should turn over. So, turnover is around 0.05. No, but turnover is a, it's not only that. Uh, I mean, the BO is a very small, tiny feature, right? That is true. That the is turnover true. is yes, a very yeah, big yeah, feature. Right. It's easy to measure. I mean, you are, yourself have Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely, I agree with you. So, <laughs> tiny feature like BO may not be measured, but turnover, even at larger scale, right. if you can say that, yeah, absolutely. But you see the K parallel, I mean, uh, when you look, look at the typical numbers, we can discuss it, right? So, uh, what? We have written the paper on this. Yes, we have. <laughs> All right, okay. Yes, you can see, we have. All right. So, the whole point is, uh, we'll talk about it. it. I wonder if it is possible. Because the 10, at least the 10 bottom channels where I do a Fourier transform are reasonably contaminated. And after that, they become accessible. Huh? All right, I should be optimistic. So, one says I should be optimistic. Optimistic I am. So, already it is possible. Right. Any more questions? Okay, if not, then let's thank the speaker. We shall go to the next talk, Mahishudis. The challenge to the standard is hard to take. I've got it. Well, it's great to be back at RRI again and to meet so many friends and colleagues after a three and a half year break nearly. And I'm particularly grateful to the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to present some recent work we have done challenging one of the fundamental tenets of the standard model of cosmology. So I'm, um, I have only half an hour to present a, a large body of work, but I would be very happy to continue our discussions afterwards, I expect there will be some concerns and queries. What you see here uh, is a depiction of the standard lambda CDM model in the form of a, the dark sky simulation, a Hubble volume simulation with, you know, a huge number of particles, etc., uh, which illustrates the formation of structure from an initial assumed Gaussian, assumed approximately scale invariant uh, set of fluctuations presumed to have been generated by some early universe process like inflation. And it shows you this familiar so-called cosmic web of galaxies, clusters, superclusters, and so on. And it is clear that although this picture has got a lot of structure, statistically it is isotropic. In fact, you can uh, determine that quantitatively. And it's also the case that if you average over volumes which are larger than a couple of hundred megaparsecs, it is homogeneous in the sense that the amplitude of the fluctuations drop to whatever level you would uh, like the criterion for homogeneity to be. Now, that's because we, it was put in by hand. The underlying metric is assumed to be the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric, which is the maximally symmetric metric of space-time. So, it is, of course, the case that the answer turns out to be like this. The question I'll address in this talk is, is the real universe like that? And uh, I'm led in this direction, uh, guided by Dennis Sharma's uh, assertion that we should, before we ask the big why questions in cosmology, ask the how questions. What is the universe really like? Because let us not forget that the model that is depicted here was formulated back in 1922, 100 years plus years ago. At the time, there was no data at all. It was based on a philosophical principle. And that philosophical principle needs to be put into cosmology because it is different from other physical sciences. We can only make observations of the universe from our particular vantage point along our past light code. We can't move somewhere else in the universe like here and draw another light cone and see whether the intersection, this time-like surface in the back is the same. Of course, in the context of this uh, standard model, we talk, refer to that as cosmic variance. And we know the statistics, they're assumed to be Gaussian. So, you can calculate this cosmic variance. But in general, we really don't know what's outside our light cone. So, uh, in order to therefore be able to do anything at all, 
it is necessary to assume following Copernicus, if you like, that our position is not special and this is what's called the cosmological principle. It was actually formulated in the 1930s uh, by Edward Mill, but in fact, it's implicit in the work of Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, Einstein, De Sitter, all those who came before. Now, you uh, may not have uh, uh, kept in mind that this cosmological principle is actually absolutely fundamental to the inference of lambda from the data of the standard cosmological model. We are shown pictures like this of omega lambda versus omega matter. The point is that it's that assumption of maximal symmetry, uh, isotropy and homogeneity that allows you to reduce the 10 couple Einstein equations to just the one, the friedman lemaitre equation, which is possible to write down as a sum rule, uh, which is familiar to you, the fractional energy densities of matter, curvature of spatial sections, and the cosmological constant must add up to one by definition, because those are the only terms we are allowing uh, to influence the friedman lemaitre equation. So what we do is we make measurements. Uh, for example, we measure the curvature to be close to zero from the first peak of the CMB. That gives you this diagonal constraint. We measured uh, the difference between uh, omega matter and omega lambda to be a small negative number that gives you this diagonal constraint. And when they intersect, we have a third constraint from measurements of clusters, baron acoustic oscillation. So everything converges on this so-called uh, standard lambda CDM model or concordance model. And omega lambda is not directly measured. It is inferred from this to be 0.7. And that means that since omega lambda is lambda over 3 h naught square, that lambda is of order h naught square. So a fundamental quantity, which is identified with vacuum energy, has its scale actually set by the present day Hubble parameter, which I think you'll agree with me is neither fundamental nor a constant. However, for some reason, this did not cause alarm bells to ring. And uh, we live with this and worry about the fact that this is actually a tiny scale. It's 10 to the 28 centimeters, the size of the universe, uh, H naught inverse. And that corresponds to a particle physics scale of 10 to the minus 42 GeV. In fact, what we do is we actually write that omega lambda in, uh, as energy density, which means multiplying it by uh, Planck mass square or dividing by 8 pi g, you write it in Planck units. And that means that you get some number, which is the geometric mean of 10 to the minus 42 GeV and the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 19 GeV. And that's 10 to the minus 12 GeV, which is the present day inferred energy density of the vacuum. I say inferred because we have seen no direct evidence of vacuum energy. It has negative pressure. If we saw, for example, the rate integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, in cross correlation of galaxies with the CMB at high significance, then you know we could believe that. Uh, in fact, this will be soon be forthcoming. You need at least five to six million galaxies with spectroscopic redshifts. Daisy will provide that very soon. So I think there is lots going to happen in the near future. But for the moment, we live with this, and it is called a simple model that's considered to be a virtue. But that depends on how you count parameters. I won't go into that. I think we all agree that it lacks a physical foundation. There is no uh, meaning, no physical sense for such an energy scale. Nevertheless, uh, I think we all, many of us know this, that it's just a placeholder and ultimately we hope for a more physically well-grounded model. But for the moment, we live with this and the focus has been on what's called precision cosmology. We need to measure the equation of uh, state of dark energy to the, I don't know how many decimal pl places and so on. I would like to turn the conversation back to testing these fundamental assumptions. And the data for that has recently become available, which makes it rather exciting. So first, let me highlight the virtues of the Lambda CDM model. It actually does reproduce that structure formation picture, the observed distribution of uh, galaxies on the sky here mapped by Sloan. And as you see, uh, we do see structures on the scale of the survey. This is 600 megaparsecs, and there is, there is this great wall and so on. So it's not quite clear if you have reached homogeneity. And in fact, locally, if you look out to about 200 megaparsecs, this is from the cosmic flows group, it is extremely inhomogeneous. We are at the center here, part of the Virgo cluster, 
uh, these fine lines uh, denote velocities. We are moving towards Shapley supercluster. That's at about 262 megaparsecs. And out to that point, we see gross inhomogeneity. So this makes one a bit uncomfortable because typically this is approximated as homogeneous. It is assumed that we are a typical observer, although surely it matters whether we are in a high density region or in a void. Surely it matters what direction we look at. Do we look along uh, empty regions? Do you look along superclusters? Nevertheless, we do not, we kind of brush over these issues and we talk, for example, about the Hubble tension, which I will not talk about. But you can ask yourself, how easy is it to measure uh, expansion rate in this field to 1% accuracy? How much uh, effort do you have to put into making corrections, for example, for peculiar velocities? How well do you know them? Let's turn to something uh, in principle simpler, the cosmic microwave background. And you all know that there is a dipole in the cosmic microwave background, which is a hundred times bigger than the small perturbations that give the, gave us that structure. And this was actually predicted by Dennis Sharma because he knew that we have a peculiar velocity and therefore we could not possibly see the microwave background, which had just been discovered uh, in 65 as isotropic. And it was uh, soon detected by George Smoot and collaborators and uh, Peebles and Wilkinson gave this formula for the temperature in a direction theta compared to the uh, hotspot. Uh, if you are moving at a velocity beta, this is the standard exercise now in special relativity that we set our students. And it actually matches the data pretty well. So we interpret it as our motion at about, this is a milli k, so that's a thousandth of the speed of light and that's what we infer. Our actual motion is more complicated because we are moving around the galaxy in the opposite direction to, our, to the hotspot. So the two velocities add up at the local group is actually moving at more like 620 kilometers per second. Now, we assume that there is such a frame which we call the cosmic rest frame or more colloquially the CMB frame. And we transform all our measured redshifts, luminosity distances, etc., to that frame because it is in that frame that the Friedman limit equation should hold, not in the frame that we are observing them. Now, uh, we know that there is inhomogeneity in the matter distribution, but this should, of course, average out, as I said, on scales bigger than of order 100 megaparsecs. And we should therefore see this bulk velocity falling off in accordance with the lambda CDM expectation. Uh, something else we can do is just count galaxies in uh, spheres of increasing radius to see if the so-called fractal dimension starts scaling as r cube. And people have done this exercise, and they say that it does in, for example, SDSS and Wiggle Z. Um, I have concerns because the spheres are actually of the size of the boundary of the survey. The surveys are extremely convoluted. They're not really large enough yet. And so uh, the spheres tend to burst out of the volume of the survey. And then, as in Wiggle Z, they fill the part that is outside the survey with numbers drawn from a random uh, uh, simulation, which, of course, is homogeneous by definition. So uh, I'm not happy with the answer. Let's look at uh, peculiar flows. This is a compendium done by a group from the Anglo-Australian telescope of peculiar velocities, which are very hard to measure because you need independent distance measurements. You can't use the redshift. So you use something like the Tully-Fisher relation or uh, for elliptical galaxies, the fundamental plane, or you use type 1 as supernovae, which are uh, uh, even better calibrated. Uh, fundamental plane is good to only about 15% uh, so far, it's calibrated with SGSS. And you see that this is the expectation in lambda CDM uh, for how the bulk flow should fall off as we average over increasingly large scales. This is assuming a top hat box of that scale. The data are uh, very uncertain for the reason I just gave, uh, but they systematically do not indicate a fall off, but you can't really tell very much from this. Just a couple of weeks ago, a new result was announced by the Cosmic Flows 4 survey, Brent Ali and collaborators. And that uh, seems to have clear water between it and the expectation. Now, one can have concerns about the size of that error bar, uh, how good their distance estimates are. Uh, I refer you to that uh, preprint for uh, looking at it more. I'm just showing this to indicate to you what the state of the art is in directly determining uh, uh, whether we have conformity with the lambda CDM expectation concerning bulk flows. Uh, recall that this is all the effect of gravity. So we don't care about, I mean, it's dark matter. 
it's independent of bias and all that. We are not actually using uh, in any way dependent on the model of structural formation. Now, we can of course ask if this can happen by accident. If you're in a Gaussian density field, anything can happen. The probability of seeing a flow out to here at that amplitude, we estimated to be less than 1% by integrating the dark sky simulations. Now, this data point, which is much further out and much more uh, deviant from the expectation, uh, Tali et al. say that the likelihood is 0.003%. So most definitely, we are not Copernican observers. We are not typical observers. We are very unusual, even in the framework of lambda CDM. And what does that mean? That means that uh, for the uh, people who are working on these things here, that this is the coherence for Copernican observers. This is an expectation from a paper by Hui and Green that is widely used in analysis. The actual covariance for observers like us looks like that. And you know, these are some of the patterns of the actual fall off around local universe like observers. So we spent a lot of computer time interrogating dark sky to determine this. And as you can see, it is quite different from what is usually assumed. What this does is impose a considerable bias in cosmological parameter estimation so that, for example, the inferred value of omega lambda, you can see here, is totally degenerate with the assumed bulk flow. Right? Uh, this paper, by the way, by with Roya Mohai and Mohammed Ramiz uh, is as yet unpublished because the referee does not like this figure. It sort of casts serious doubt on the uh, precision cosmology program for omega lambda. And it seems to be the practice these days to not show, let the public see things that they should not see. Let me turn to something which is much more robust and much more simple and doesn't have any uh, physics other than uh, special relativity. So this is the phenomenon of aberration, which Bradley uh, discovered actually at Oxford 200 years before special relativity. Uh, but which is a special relativistic phenomenon, namely that objects in the sky are displaced in the direction of the motion of an observer. And uh, this angle relates to this V over C of the observer. In fact, Bradley inferred C from this to within 10%, 200 years before Einstein. Of course, uh, we also have to take into account that we are looking at objects with not necessarily a black body spectrum, as in the case of the CMB, but say a power law spectrum. And we'll be sampling a different part of that spectrum if you are moving. So we have to take into account that the flux distribution of the sources also typically is a power law. So if you have a flux limited survey, then in the direction you are moving, some of the objects will be boosted above the flux limit. And in the opposite directions, they'll be boosted below the flux limit. So that you will generally see more sources in the direction you are moving. And the dipole we can compute, again from uh, standard special relativity, to be that familiar V over C cos theta, but now multiplied by 2 plus x times 1 plus alpha, where x and alpha are the indices in these power laws for the flux distribution and the, power and the individual spectrum. Um, of course, no spectra are exactly power laws, but we don't really care. We only care about what the slope is near that threshold. Right? So we have done this exercise uh, with a catalog of about 1.5 million quasars which our colleague Nathan Sacrist, who is at the Naval Observatory in Washington, uh, had his hands on because he had prepared it using data from the WISE satellite, uh, which uh, scanned the sky for many years. Even after the cryogen ran out, it continued scanning uh, uh, in a so-called new OIS phase. And it mapped the sky at various mid-infrared frequencies, uh, where, uh, as you know, there is no extinction. And uh, we have therefore a map on the sky of all these quasars. Some regions such as the large Magellanic cloud, uh, small, we have to blank out because um, uh, there is source confusion there. And similarly, you have to uh, mask large part near the galactic plane. We are fortunate that a subset of these galaxies, I mean quasars, have had their redshifts measured spectroscopically by uh, EBOS, a program as part of SGSS. And this is the redshift distribution. You can see that the median is over 1. Okay. We have also done a cross-correlation of the uh, catwise catalog of quasars with the uh, two-mass uh, point source catalog. There were only 1492 sources in common. And uh, we, when we reject them, uh, the answer is robust. So basically, we can 
put our hand on our hearts and tell you that all these quasars are at cosmological distances that are none so close as to give you a so called clustering dipole which can arise by accident due to structure. If you smooth that map you clearly see the dipole and what we can now do is to look at the distribution of the spectral indices and the distribution of their fluxes, sample from these randomly and create mock skies and then ask if the distribution of amplitudes in the mock skies, uh, how consistent is that uh, uh, with the observation. But before that very quickly since there are astronomers here I just want to show you that we can select quasars pretty well. These are mid infrared which means we are looking at the accretion disk around the central black hole uh, emitting dust basically uh, quite different from radio sources which have extended lobes emitting synchrotron. And as you can see here a simple cut on W1 minus W2 allows us to reject uh, you know regular objects spiral galaxies stars etc etc. And we are therefore pretty sure that we have a sample of quasars and we also uh, choose an uh, a, a intensity a magnitude cut that gives us complete coverage and smoothness. We also can actually see the spectra for that subset that was measured they are quasars. Now uh, we make further quality cuts I mentioned this galactic plane cut uh, for source completeness. Then we look very carefully to see if there are uh, any correlations with the scanning pattern of the satellite. It was in uh, earth orbit polar orbit and uh, you would expect maybe some correlation with the ecliptic latitude and there indeed is a very mild one which we find and we correct for. This is just to impress upon you that we have spent two years cleaning up this catalog we do not just put it out there and measure a dipole. However, when we do measure the dipole we find it is consistent with the direction uh, of the CMB dipole. However, the amplitude is not consistent. This is the distribution of 10 million simulations uh, which give you uh, the expected value according to the standard cosmological model in which the CMB dipole is due to our local kinematic motion. That would then require the quasars to have this dipole. They in fact have this dipole. And only 5 of these 10 million simulations accidentally get up to an amplitude as large as that. So very transparently, no fancy statistics here, the p value is 5 10 to the minus 7 for a one sided Gaussian that is 4.9 sigma. It confirms the indication of an anomaly that Ashok Singhal had previously found with the NVSS catalog of radio sources. However, they were much fewer and the similar chance probability of seeing a large dipole in that was 2.8 sigma. So I think now uh, we are in business. What we have further done is to take the NVSS catalog and do the same uh, uh, work on it that we did on the catwise catalog. We have uh, cleaned it up much further. Some of you might recognize the Haslam 408 megahertz map superimposed. We want to make sure that none of these radio sources are in our galaxy. And similarly for the WISE catalog, we lowered the flux cut a little bit to get a few more sources without losing any quality. And interestingly, these two uh, dipoles are consistent with each other. It means that means that there is no frequency dependence. Uh, these are obviously at hugely different frequencies and that was indicated by uh, another group that is not the case. Uh, interestingly, the agreement between these two dipoles which are pointing in slightly different directions improves. If we subtract out the kinematic, uh, the, the CMB dipole, if you assume that to be kinematic. Uh, now that you have two independent catalogs which have no sources in common, we can actually treat them as two independent experiments and combine the p-values and for that we are prepared to be more generous. We do not even care uh, about the direction that the dipoles are in. So we allow for the CMB dipole offset to be any angle and here are the actual observations these two squares for NVSS and Y's and these are the contours from uh, simulations of mock skies. So if you combine the p-values now as you might expect the significance exceeds 5 sigma which is uh, you know at least in particle physics you would start taking something seriously if it crosses that threshold. Now uh, people have some concerns that this was all based on a special relativity formula surely you are making a cosmological measurement and this was pointed out by Roy Martins and collaborators and more recently has been computed by uh, 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 Ruth Tudor and collaborators including Hamsa who is here. We have done the uh, 
calculation ourselves rigorously in general relativity. I don't have time to go into the details, but I'm just showing you that what we get when doing a very careful calculation is the Ellis Baldwin formula of 1984 plus a correction term which depends on the redshift distribution of the objects. And uh, for that, we need to know uh, this actual distribution of uh, redshifts, which we got from uh, catwise. And that is the distribution. Uh, and if we actually plug that in into our calculation, then we find that the correction is less than 0 0.001 of beta, whereas the actual effect is about 10 times beta. So it's quite negligible. Ellis and Baldwin rule. Okay. Now, uh, in this calculation, we allowed alpha and uh, x, the uh, power law exponents of the spectrum and the flux distribution, to be independent, because that's what we expect for mid infrared quasars. But uh, Dalang and Bonvan have suggested that maybe the two can be correlated in some nasty way and mimic our result. Actually, they do not say that in the that they solve our tension because they don't know the evolution bias for catwise. I say this because many people misquote them as having said this. They looked at a, a different catalog and uh, uh, they also made a toy model calculation which suggested the effect could be important. But for our catalog, we have done a data-driven study of whether this spectral index varies with direction and we find no change at all over the sky. So it is clear that their concern uh, does not affect us. What is the uh, cosmology community saying about a result? Well, I'll just quote you a recent review from uh, Jim Peebles, father of the standard cosmological model. And he says that um, this anomaly is as well established as the Hubble tension, yet the literature on this is much smaller than the hundreds of papers on the Hubble tension. I expect the difference is an inevitable consequence of the way we behave. Well, make of that what you will. Jeremy Darling did an analysis of radio catalogs, uh, which ended with the sentence that he finds consistency with the CMB uh, solar velocity and shows that galaxies are on average at rest with respect to the rest of the early universe. However, if you look at his actual measurement, it's 399 plus 264 minus 199. In other words, his result is consistent with our value as well. He cannot actually make that last. I mean, this is not an untrue statement. It's just a little economical with the truth. Okay, thank you. And we actually find that the two catalogs that he used, VLAS and RACS, which is a pathfinder for SKA, they're actually not consistent with each other. And in fact, it, certainly the RACS uh, is inconsistent with the kinematic expectation. Uh, so I have just two minutes. I'll uh, show you results from some other people, not just ours. This is one from Adi Nusair, uh, Tiwari, and collaborators. They measured the full power spectrum, which we didn't, because it's a cut sky. You have correlations between the multiples, and uh, they have taken precautions. What they show, interestingly, is that on small scales, the spectrum is perfectly consistent with what you expect from lambda CDM. In fact, they can even detect the epoch of nonlinearity as opposed to the dashed line, which is the linear spectrum. And from this, they can, in fact, read off uh, the bias, which is around 2, as you might expect for these quasars. However, the extrapolated power at the dipole is well below what we measure, okay? And they do highlight that. The excess dipole uh, is uh, anomalous. Finally, our same catwise catalog, we made it public. We believe in open science. People should be able to look at it and draw their own conclusions. Uh, this is an Australian group, Lawrence Darm, Jaren Lewis, uh, Brendan Brewer. They, in fact, find the same uh, anomalous dipole and they, in fact, claim an even higher statistical significance. They use the magic of Bayesian statistics. I'm a naive frequentist. And they do something interesting. They actually look at this effect that Dalang and Bonban suggested could be a showstopper, and they show that it can be at most 17% of the effect. Uh, just a very quick word that the CMB dipole uh, has been uh, measured, of course, precisely. And also the correlations induced between the higher multiples due to our motion. This was done by Planck, but the detection was marginal. It was less than three sigma. However, more recently, uh, Shuvadi, Tarun, and the collaborators, they have uh, looked at it more carefully, and they find that the kinematic expectation is uh, correct for the CMB at higher significance. This is why we might consider the possibility that the CMB dipole is indeed kinematic, 
but then you are left with no conclusion, other conclusion than that the quasars uh, are uh, not in the same frame uh, isotropic. Uh, okay. Finally, I just want to point out a speculative idea that we have been looking at which Jim Peebles actually asked us to look at. If you look at the reconstructed power spectrum of primordial fluctuations, this is a reconstruction that Paul Hunt and I did using Tikhonov regularization. It is well known to people who do this that there is a, uh, there are features, this is due to the uh, L of 20, there is a glitch and this fall off in power on large scales is well known. Now, this suggests that inflation may have only lasted long enough to create a Hubble patch as big as the one that we are now living in. And in that case, you could entertain the idea, it's very speculative, that there is a super horizon isocurvature perturbation which is affecting uh, the distribution of objects within the Hubble volume. We find the calculation by uh, Dominic and uh, 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 Subhut Patil who was here till yesterday, Roy Mohai and myself, that it does not affect the number count, but it can affect the CMB dipole. So, you might have a, a, you could consider whether there is a cancellation of one. I mean, this is one way to try and save the standard model, if you like. How, unfortunately, it is very fine tuned. We have done the exercise to establish just, so, you know, caveat emptor, take your pick. Uh, our work has actually triggered a lot of interest among radivists and people who are considering alternative cosmological models, as you can see here. I do not have time to discuss that. I will conclude. The standard model, as I mentioned, was established over a hundred years ago, at which time there was no data pertaining to its fundamental assumption. But now we have that data, we should test the model. The highlight is that the rest frame in which distant quasars and radio sources are isotropic is not the one in which the CMB is isotropic. So therefore, the current analysis that assume this need revisiting. And in particular for the supernova Hubble diagram from which you infer lambda, uh, this boosting to this presumed cosmic rest frame and making corrections for peculiar velocities, etc., uh, again uh, needs re-examination. Uh, actually, when we look at the measurement made in the heliocentric rest frame, we see a clear dipole in Q0 in the deceleration parameter. And that suggests that it certainly is not due to vacuum energy, which would be isotropic. It is very likely an artifact because we are moving in that direction uh, uh, due to the local bulk flow. So, we do need to construct a new standard model of cosmology, I believe. If our result stands up, we need independent confirmation. Something of this uh, importance, uh, you know, uh, you really have to have uh, others finding the same thing. And to that end, just my last slide here is that we have joined the uh, large scale survey of space and time project on Rubin in which many people here are also engaged. And we have a project on testing the isotropy of the universe, which has been joined by many people, including Tony Tyson, the chief scientist of uh, uh, Rubin, and uh, Eric Gawaiser is the analysis coordinator of DESC. And uh, we will do tomography in redshift with LSST data. We hope to do this in the next couple of years to trace how this dipole changes in redshift, because that would be the clue that we need to go further to establish how we need to tweak or modify or even throw away the current paradigm to. Uh, so please join us. Everybody is welcome to join this if you are in uh, desk. Thank you. Time for some questions. Thanks for the very nice talk, Subhi. Uh, in the second to, uh, or maybe one last slide before, you mentioned this uh, large scale mode should be an ISO which um, Yes. Why should that be? Uh, well, this is something that Jim Gunn pointed out uh, actually way back. A an adiabatic mode, well, adiabatic is what photons and baryon uh, no, matter, mm. they fall similarly. So, they can be no net separation between the two. You need an isocurvature mm. in order to create a separation if you have initial conditions of the kind that are set by inflation. And that would, uh, so what would the amplitude of that large scale mode? Would oh, that, that, that would be quite significant. It would be of order, of order 0.1, but on super horizon scales. On super, which is so not of course, the CMB yeah. scales, of That's course. That's right. Much when ISO curvature enters the horizon, it decays into adiabatic, and that has to be within the constraints set by Planck. We have checked all that. Okay, okay. Thanks. It's a possibility that is open, although somewhat contrived, as I said. Uh, first, uh, thank you for thoroughly waking up my mind this morning. It's fun to think about these things. Thank you. Um, 
A, a couple of questions. There's so many new cosmological probes coming on. What, what's out the, it, what else is going to be sensitive to this that you haven't used yet that isn't there now? Are fast radio bursts, their lensing, or something like that? It's gotta, that ha has to be relevant at, yeah. at cosmological scales. Okay, so the first, okay, so, uh, okay, do you want to ask your next question or should I answer it? Okay. First of all, as you know, uh, most uh, cosmological things have been small angled on the sky. The epoch of, you know, wi wide field cosmology is just beginning. Uh, so, even with LSST, we'll just have 40,000 square degrees. We want the whole 4 pi sky for the kind of measurements you are making. That has not been available. Uh, things like JWST, etc., of course, are uh, not very useful in this regard. DAISY uh, has uh, uh, several million redshifts already in the can, I understand, and we'll release them quite soon. I'm not in DAISY, so we have to wait for the public data release. Uh, that's still limited. What you would really like ideally is a, something like WISE, which scanned the whole sky many, many times over. Uh, but we would like it done at different wavelength, right? That would be perfect. And you need to do it at wavelengths where uh, there is no uh, extinction, obviously. With regard to the other things you mentioned, like lensing, I talk, talk to people who do gravitational lensing. So far, they have been done on rather small fields except for the most recent one from the Dark Energy Survey, which has covered a larger field. And interestingly, um, well, uh, my informant will be here quite soon for a workshop. Uh, or, uh, well, he told me that actually in some of the DES fields, they see an overall shear in the field, which they then set to zero by hand because the universe is meant to be isotropic, right? right. So, uh, after I asked him to reconsider whether this may not be so, they said they will go back and look at the data. The point is, of course, you need to stand somewhere firm if you're going to draw any conclusions from the data, and it's quite understandable that they have been doing this. Right? Yeah, I'm sure that assumption is baked into so many of our... Well, our the point is that there are so many systematic effects that can give you such a thing <laughs> that it is, you know, the, the safe assumption to say, look, you know, it, it better be zero and you kind of autocorrect. But it is regenerate with the possibility of a actual anisotropy on the sky. But but so your your probes are things we know are coming soon or and right. are established. Yeah, they are coming I, soon. I, I, I guess my question is about things that are more wild, like fast radio bursts, four pi of the sky. We have thousands of them coming on. Four pi in the sky would be and, interesting. And, and, and they're out to redshift one. Yeah. One percent of them should be uh, a lens at, at some some level. Sure, this is sure. all new probes that are coming. Indeed, is there I'm, a new probe that we So have? I have achieved my aim, which is to interest people like you in thinking about what you can do with that coming data on which you can get your hands on uh, and, and to try and shoot us down. I would love that. Right. And, and then the, the cure you presented was worse than the disease in the sense that, you know, it's so finely tuned and it seemed to handle the, the amplitude problem, but it's kind of remarkable that your direction is so well aligned. Indeed. You know, so, so whatever the cure is, it has to give the right direction. That's in, right. In, in, probe, in using the probes here, there's, there's got to be a bias in the selection. Is that properly taken into account? Sorry, uh, what, what bias? There, um, the, in, in the two directions, uh, with our flow and against our flow, yes. um, they, I, I'm guessing that this, our ability to see objects is... Uh, from well, the ground, yes. Yeah. From, from the ground, there there's is There's going to be a, a feedback there that has to be a No, there is a bias there. In fact, we looked at uh, the 150 plus 45 supernovae that were looked at in the original supernova cosmology project and the high super, uh, redshift uh, search team. They were mainly towards the direction of the hotspot. That's where the telescopes were pointing. Now, of course, we have a southern sky survey. There are supernovae in DES and so on, which are now filling in the sky. So. Once we have a full sky catalog of objects like that, and I must add a very important caveat here, which have not already been corrected, right. yes. then we can look to see what is actually on the sky. The problem uh, is now that all data is corrected, assuming the standard lambda CDM isotropic homogeneous model. So if you then look at that data and find nothing, nothing to see here, that ought not to surprise you triggered me to comment on this. I, I think um, I want to I wanna be careful about that word correction because I think many experiments project out the mode that is, you know, bigger than what they think they can control the systematics. And that's not necessarily the same as the correction or, a, you know, 
underlying assumption, right? Just, just they're making themselves, and I think, for example, the lensing analysis of the CMB is often the case, that you project at the mode that you don't think you're sensitive to. So, you know, I think the data itself, you know, is not ne may not necessarily be corrected. I think it's more of an interpretation of that. Um, so, so you know that that you know that what that means is that you know having four pi steradian of observation is obviously not enough. You know, the, to to have actually the systematic control that is not varying across the sky, and such that experimentalists or data analysts are you know confident enough that they don't actually project out the mode. That is, you know, pretty big. I, I agree. But uh, all I want to say is, surely the onus is upon us. If you're going to make a very powerful assumption to test it, which I agree there are lots of issues in doing that, but to not do so and to carry on with business as usual, if there is reason to believe that it might be uh, worth looking at, that I think is inexcusable. We ought to be doing this. No, this but I this can is, totally agree is, with you that yeah, this has become agree. practice yeah. for the practical reasons. You know. I mean, Weinberg says in his textbook, obviously we have no data, so you have to assume the cosmological principle. But when we have data, then we really ought to test it because its failure means either the cosmological principle is wrong or the principle of equivalence. Nothing could be more interesting. You know, and I really, uh, I must say I'm perplexed as to why this low-hanging fruit in cosmology has not been uh, looked at more. There are only few of us looking at. I, I mentioned Ashok Singhal, who is actually here, I believe. He started looking at this uh, some years ago. And now uh, the challenge is to get bigger data sets and get more of you guys ab aboard, because you know where all the stuff is buried, uh, to, to try and look at it and see if there is anything there. Yeah. Hey, Sashwin. Hey, nice talk. Uh, I'm listening it again. It's uh, good to see that a few more plots have added, which I asked you questions about. Yes, uh, yes. So that's great. Uh, the covariance matrix as mm -hmm. well. I have a technical comment, more like so. This is about again going back to the estimate of the flux for the quasars and their power law index. No, we are not. We are not taking into account the fluxes. No, the it's just, power. Uh, it's just the. It's just the overheating threshold. Right. We, so, we don't actually use the fluxes because. That would be an additional powerful test if we actually look at the flux distribution. But there, there are systematics which yeah. are not quite under control, so we don't do that. Okay. We just use number counts. That's as robust as it can be. If we have the catalog complete down to some limiting magnitude, mm -hmm. how do you know that? In a data-driven way. So my colleague Nathan, uh, he's at the Naval Observatory, he, uh, like any good observer, doesn't trust any theorist, right? He needs to see it in the data, anything that we are looking at. And I like that. So we spend a lot of time making sure that the thing is actually complete, as you say it is, to 99.99%. I see. So you're not concerned about the fluxes. OK. Besides which, they're measured in four bands. And the you know, of course, you have checked the Y's sensitivity, which varied over the mission period. You have to correct for all that. It's same thing, same issues as Planck. You have to allow for the change in sensitivity and so on over the mission. No, so my main point is, if you go back to your plot where mm -hmm. you are showing the S nu versus uh, uh, yes, yes, the flux you distribution. A, yes, right, exactly. Right. You have a alpha index. Right. What I was curious about, one can test. Possibly, you have already a machinery to do that, mm -hmm. or possibly have already done it. Yeah. Is that is that power law index having any ratio of dependence? Because you are doing a weighted sum of for estimate the velocity effect. So if you are Seeing objects which are further sure. out, having a slightly different slope than the one which you're seeing at the lower shift, that's actually going to give you a. Surely you have just given us the agenda for what you want to do with LSST, precisely. Oh, that. great. Okay. So th that is what I meant by doing tomography. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. exactly what you want to do. Oh. Unfortunately, in the catwise case, we don't have enough red shifts to, to allow this kind of slicing. That would not, the statistics would be too poor. We need, you know. To be in this business, if you want to measure a 0.5% effect at 5 sigma, you need a million objects, million plus. Okay, So this is a game for millionaires. OK, thank you. In fact, it's surprising how little data there actually is, because I've been hearing about the flood of cosmological data. And when you actually come to look for such data, you find there aren't actually that many catalogs which are suitable. The NVSS was only released at the turn of the millennium. And CatWise was only released about four years ago. So, you know, that data has come just in time. Yeah, there's one there. 
Thanks, Subir. It's a very naive question. So if yes. you've already answered it, maybe you can do it again. Um, so uh, I understand what you've been saying about the dipole and so on. But I think along the lines of what Matt was asking, uh, are there other fundamental measurements that have, we have been making or we will be making soon beyond looking in various directions like you've been pointing out yes. that we should be looking at more carefully or planning to measure um, uh, well, in see, addition yeah. to other things that we think we should be expecting. Right. Yeah. So all measurements made currently, DAO, uh, what, lensing, whatever, they have only looked at little patches on the sky and it is assumed that that patch is typical of the whole sky because the universe is isotropic, you know, God told us so. If that is not indeed the case, then it would see differences if you looked in different directions. Now that has already, I think, permeated through. People are going to do that in future programs. But for example, in LSST, uh, uh, Tony Tyson already had suggested that when they do the supernova Hubble diagram analysis, when they do it in different directions, they should then compare the equation of state they derive from different directions. Actually, that I, I have a problem with. I want to go back one level deeper because in order to do that, they are already making peculiar velocity corrections which are made on the basis of the lambda CDM model. So there is a certain circularity in the argument. I would like it to be as data-driven as possible, as free of assumptions concerning the underlying model. So what I showed you today is the most simple counting test on the sky, right? There's no model dependence there at all. As far as possible, it would be great if all these other analyses could be done as, well, I appreciate it cannot always be done like that because of the systematics, for example, you discussed in lensing, which have degenerated many other things. And, you know, you, you've got to make progress. You can't just sit there and say, I can't do anything. But as far as possible, please look for direction dependence. It's very simple. That's all it comes to. And therefore, you need fields from both the northern and the southern sky. You need to compare them without first correcting them according to some fiducial model, which essentially we throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, yeah, um, I think I'm just going to open up a can of worms that can continue to coffee break, which is... If this fundamentally shifts the foundations of cosmology as we understand it, what's out there in some of those reference papers you mentioned yes. about what, is, what, what, what could this be, for example? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wish I could be like Newton and say, hypothesis non fingo. I do not construct hypothesis. I want to be guided by the data. Let's get the data. I only want to provide enough motivation for such analysis and to get other people more expert than I am in uh, these kinds of data processing, lensing and so on, to do it. We'll see what the future holds. I mean, this is only two years old. The rest of it has been, Lambda CDM has been going on for 20 plus years, right? So uh, give us a few more years and we'll answer that question. Okay. We'll stop for the time being. Thank and you. if you have any further questions. So we will have our first speaker. Hamsa will be speaking on a multi-messenger view of the baryonic universe out to the epoch of Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here on this special occasion and hear so many exciting frontiers of cosmology. I'm going to be telling you something which touches upon both the things we heard about today as well as a bit yesterday on how we can actually use data, whatever data we have, and hope to have in the very near future, to look at the baryonic universe, which is the part of the universe which we do luckily understand. Uh, and it turns out that with several upcoming data sets, we can actually probe out to, if we believe the yesterday's uh, models, almost Redshift 7, which is like the mid stages or even end stages of reionization. This is work done in collaboration with several people, some of whom are in this room, and also the COMAP collaboration, whose uh, early science just came out last year. It's the CO Mapping Array Pathfinder, and which I'll highlight in this talk. Okay, so we, if we do a brief survey, like yesterday we saw a lot of this, the first billion years, we saw how hydrogen is distributed, what you can learn from it, how it clusters, and so on. So today I'll spend a lot of my time on the next 12 billion years, which is from there to today, which is like what is known as the post-reionization universe. 
So I'll talk about this post-reionization next 12 billion years, which is essentially probed the hydrogen in it. The most promising technique is what we saw today morning, the intensity mapping, which is a way by which as people have started more than a decade ago to plan, and even today as we speak, there are detections, looking at the sky in unresolved intensity in hydrogen. And this has been to date done in cross correlations with this very exciting new one in the auto. But intensity mapping actually goes back a long way and probably is going to go forward a long way as well. So if you look at this picture, this is the crux of what intensity mapping is all about. You don't want to do a deep pointed survey, probably taking a lot of time and it's expensive. It of course has its own advantages. But instead you ask what would be the advantage in looking at it in a CMB-like manner. So you have diffuse unresolved intensity. And people have been talking about this for a while. They've been theorizing on how to do this. And today it turns out we can do so not just for hydrogen, but also for several other interesting traces of cosmology and astrophysics, particularly carbon monoxide, ionized carbon, which are very good traces of star formation. And so to speak that people have been thinking about already ESA Voyage 2050, we've seen these graphs before, where we can actually hope to map a huge number of baryons, different phases, temperatures, and so on, using this technique and learn more about cosmology. So I probably don't need to so show this since uh, it has been mentioned uh, several times, but I just want to suffice to say that it has immense potential. It is, after all, a three-dimensional probe of all of the baryons we have, practically. The kind of surveys we have so far are great, but they're going to be showing us only snapshots of what is to come and what could be in this entire three-dimensional tomography. You can write down equations like this to tell you about the actual number of modes of information you'd get if you have a survey which goes out to, let's say, redshift 50. And the co-moving volume you'd be able to probe is immense. It's a huge amount of uh, material. And uh, this slide, this is about the low redshift H1 I have described in several talks to this audience. So I'll spend only a few minutes to say that in the low redshift universe, which is like the last 12 billion years, you actually close the contours with today's data because you have data from the damp Lyman alpha, which was mentioned by Shiv, and other Im important probes, intensity mapping. And you can build together a halo model framework, a way to populate dark matter halos at every redshift with neutral hydrogen. So you have MH1 of M as a function of Z. And you do an analogous thing as a dark matter also for the profile. So you also have a distribution. And what you find is that with the five parameter framework, you fit everything which you have today. And it worked surprisingly better than we ever expected. We have error bars and realistic predictions for how H1 is abandoned in halos and clusters out to redshift of five. The advantages of using the baryonic parameterization are manifold. Firstly, it's based completely on the data. So there is hardly any model dependence to it. And secondly, it allows us to do powerful cosmology because we have a way to impose the most realistic priors on our astrophysical parameters because they practically come from everything, all the data we have today. So what you do, how you would like to do cosmology with this kind of 21 centimeter survey is just to define like a CL the way you do for the CMB. And this CL will have these two components playing with each other and you can parameterize how each one of them affects the other. Not only standard cosmology, we also found that if you go to a non-standard, like if you go to a primordial non-Gaussianity, then you actually can quantify with the help of nested likelihoods and with statistics how the bias or how much the error in our understanding of astrophysics would bias our FNL measurement, for instance. And thankfully, it turns out that for all the errors in cosmology, the astrophysics we have today, the FNL measurements stay well within half a sigma. So it's very good news for the strongest science case for 21 centimeters. So you can do a lot of precision and accuracy cosmology with it. 
You can also do, for instance, nature of dark matter. So for, we, we heard about axions a lot in the previous day. So for instance, one of the students had worked on how we can look at axion dark matter, what kind of masses are constrainable and how they affect the 21 centimeter power spectrum. In that case, it's very important to take into account the astrophysics in a very um, realistic way to see what is the effect on the power spectrum and how much it's measurable. And it turns out to be measurable indeed with SK and other things. You can also do it with other tracers and uh, there are exotic effects in those cases. But as we all know, this is not easy to do autocorrelation, especially in the epoch of reionization. This is a slide from Steve Connington at Manchester. We saw how much sits on top of the signal in addition to systematics, and we also, of course, have our own galaxy and so on. So probably in the present day, it's worthwhile to ask, what can we learn from already existing other tracers of the same epoch? And can we use this knowledge to inform our understanding of the halos that host neutral hydrogen and possibly science cases for the future 21 centimeter? Prominent among these tracers are the carbon monoxide lines, like I said, and we've seen before, CO has this nice ladder of states. So an experiment like COMAP, which is led out of Caltech and has collaborators all across the world, we look at the CO in the one zero transition between redshift two to three, which is the peak of the star formation epoch. So COMAP has a Ka band, which is a 35 gigahertz channel. And interestingly, because of this ladder, this band also has within it the 2-1 transition from a higher redshift, so from 6 to 8. So if you have a different band, which is going to be uh, planned for the future of coma, to probe 15 gigahertz, then if you cross-correlate, you'll actually isolate the reionization signal. So it's a very important science case because CO is today being routinely detected in places where we do not have H1 at all. The another important tracer are the submillimeter tracers. This is the C plus, the ionized carbon, which emits at the 158 micron. Again, these uh, there is ALMA detections of luminosity functions of C plus all the way up to redshift seven. So we definitely have data on it. But this is an important complementary probe because it's also a tracer of star formation, so for intensity mapping. So in these works, I have looked at how we can, you know, extend that halo model framework, which was useful for the hydrogen to C plus and CO. You just have to make a few changes. You have to look at the luminosity rather than the mass, for instance, and you have to fit the data. But it turns out to work very well, and you can actually make predictions, forecast the power spectrum and the luminosity halo mass relation in a way which is consistent with simulations as well. People have used this also, it's important to note, in physical models. So this is nice because the minute, again, you have dominant parameters captured, you can go to the simulations and ask, what are the physics which is causing these parameters? So that's one of the things. In carbon monoxide, of course, we just released the early science last year of the CO mapping array pathfinder. And it's, uh, uh, it's nice to note that COMAP is actually the first purpose-built non-21 centimeter experiment to reach the milestone of early science. And these are the papers which are uh, there as a focus issue in AppJ, so I encourage anyone who's interested to have a look at those, describe various parts of the experiment. I'll just highlight one aspect, which is the first direct 3D measurement of the CO power spectrum of the large scales. It's an upper limit, but it's almost an order of magnitude lower than the previous one. And uh, the model which I showed you, like for the CO, in fact, it, can, it has parameters in it. And it's interesting that some of them are ruled out by the CO detection. And uh, for instance, a duty cycle of one, which is totally unreasonable, is thankfully ruled out, of course, and duty cycles of much lower are in, in, uh, definitely uh, consistent. This is the curve which shows you about what COMAP can do in five years, and definitely it looks like it can say something about the science and say something about many of the models to high signal to noise. There is excitement about doing CO map with another receiver, which is and also the EOR, which is more antennas. And this is a smaller frequency band. Like I said, it'll pick up a signal between redshift six to eight. So if you cross correlate that with this one, then definitely, then most of the models predict that you can detect the epoch of reionization signal to 
few to few 10 uh, sigma. So it's very exciting. The other tracers I wanted to highlight were those in the gigahertz regime. So we also already saw the submillimeter. The two salient ones I work with are the EXCLAIM, which is the experiment for cryogenic large aperture intensity mapping. It's a balloon which is going to fly for eight hours and in the northern hemisphere. And this is FEAST, and many of you would have heard of CCAT, which is a ground-based <laughs> experiment. And this one is going to look at C2, again around redshift 5 to 7. We found that at these epochs, if we look at a slightly upgraded versions of the base configuration, you can do more than several 10 sigma detection of this, uh, this tracer around redshift 5 to 7, which would be an excellent test bed to start off when we, before we do our 21 centimeter experiments. The main, ch uh, main thing, of course, the main power of these extra tracers is also to synergize. So we know, for instance, again, credit to Steve, that cross correlations are very important because not only they help you to just avoid the foreground to a large extent problem and systematics, in autocorrelation, you'll always have this noise term residually with you. But in cross-correlation, you kind of, you hope that most of the extra things are not correlated, so you are fine. It has been shown in the past that if you have photometric surveys, which again cover only a few square degrees and an optical, you don't really do well with cross-correlation. And it, um, it's, it's, it's most affected, uh, it's affected by foregrounds, etc. But now we have these tracers in submillimeter, which are in wide field. And so you can use intensity mapping with these to do a very efficient cross-correlation. Interestingly, when you want to forecast this, we find that um, we have to, of course, have a model for H1. And we've seen that there's a lot of astrophysics, there are bubbles, there are overlaps, and all of that. But in terms of total H1, so the total amount of H1 which is contributing to the power, it, found, it seems that current results actually predict something quite in line with what we would predict already with the H1 to halo mass relation. It's important to note here that k-dependence is, of course, unconstrained, but k-dependence is very variable. But the actual total power should be completely consistent and at least to the order of magnitude. With this, you can look at cross-correlations of an extended feast and the exclaim as well with MWA and SK. And this is what I do in this paper. You see that already at redshift 6 and redshift 7, these two curves show you the latest ALMA ALMA-derived luminosity functions from which you can get a CO and C2 to halo mass relation. And uh, the two curves actually bracket the possible ranges allowed by targeted and serendipitous. So it's kind of like the lower and upper limits on what the CO power looks like at redshift 7. We actually can do that now from ALMA. And when we do that, you find that the signal to noise in either way goes from definitely detection to maybe even few tens. So it's very exciting. So this actually, uh, so therefore, there's a lot of synergy between these two baryonic tracers as well. But this actually brings me to the final bits of my talk, which is that we shouldn't ignore when we're doing gas and galaxies, we shouldn't ignore their central black holes. Indeed, most of the quasar surveys have been in the C plus and they have been, you know, having these luminosity functions and at epochs like redshift six and redshift seven close to the EOR. We know that almost all, if not all galaxies have central supermassive black holes. And interestingly, when you consider their evolution, you find, um, you know, quite a few challenges. So essentially, the fueling and growth of black holes is not very well understood. Most of the models will tell you that you'll have something like an Eddington ratio, which is the uh, mass of the black hole to bolometric luminosity ratio and a radiative efficiency, which is telling you something about the characteristic time at which the black hole is accreting. So current observations tell you that most of the high redshift supermassive black holes are rapidly accreting. So you've got eta very close to one and short lifetimes. There's also this important question of intermediate mass black holes, again, at these same redshifts, around redshift of six, which go to like uh, about 10 to the six solar masses. And they're probably very important in the feeding of the black hole. So when you look at multi-messenger, the epoch of reionization, it's really important to take into account what we can do with these black holes. Empirically, again, 
looking at the problem in the same way as parameterization, what you find is that the black hole masses are evolving really, really fast as compared to stellar masses with the standard black hole to bulge mass relation. So you can write down a halo model framework for the black hole occupation driven by data. And you see that the stellar mass is not doing much where the black hole mass is doing a lot. This has fascinating consequences in and of itself. But what is very important for this purpose is that you can now parameterize. If you have an experiment like LISA, which is going out to look at intermediate mass black holes all the way, let's say, to redshift 6 or 7, then you know that there are some parts of the parameter space which are constrained by LISA simulations, which are mostly the cosmological bits. So we find that there's a Q, which is like the difference in the ratio of masses, the central mass black hole, and redshift. And also, you have another set which is kind of astrophysical in nature. So it's more like it is the, um, it, this is like an occupation of the black hole into the halo, which is on top of that black hole to halo mass relation. And there's two other parameters which are telling you about the halo model, the black hole to halo. It is very in interesting that when you use the merger rates, which are, um, which are simulated, for instance, for LISA or what we will hopefully detect in the future, then you can add in, fold in your knowledge of the known parameters, the existing constraints, in a Fisher matrix framework. So this is what the results show you. If you have LISA and you have gravitational wave uh, emission detectable by that, then you, what you can do is to use that original knowledge that people have done lots of simulations to tell you how delta Z by Z and how delta Q by Q might vary. And with that, you find actually quite good percent level constraints on the astrophysics of these systems. So that is, again, very important and in the future could be connected to other things we know about the galaxies hosting. The, you can also do better. You can also do complementary things. You can go all the way to the nanohertz regime. And today, we already have the complementary to LISA. We have the SKA PTA, for instance, in that regime. We already have also nanogram and other PTA measurements. Uh, what is interesting here is that these PTA measurements are primarily a lot of the dominant component of this curve comes from merging supermassive binary black holes. And uh, you, you see that in the SK curve is something like this, and it corresponds to a merger with milestones marked here in terms of time of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. You can use the standard picture to convert that sensitivity curve into a physical space curve. So a curve which does the Q versus A in that parameter space. And what you find is very interesting. It tells you that with this sensitivity, if you don't want to violate Q greater than 1, then you have to have masses which are primarily greater than 10 to the 9 solar mass, which is what you want anyway, because those are the ones which are contributing to the AGN and things like that. Separations are also something like milliparsec, and very gladly, the observed orbital times and decay times are in well within the regime of weeks to years, which is prompt electromagnetic follow-up will be quite satisfied here. So for the PTA, you can actually do, go and say that you can do quasars at the electromagnetic counterparts. So again, use that same quasar luminosity fun function, what you find is that for 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes, especially at 10 to the 10, the luminosity function drops off so much that we have seen in previous talks as well, that even within the SK error ellipse, which is large, you may uniquely localize the quasar counterpart. So that is really exciting. That is one thing which you can do. And uh, with SK PTA, it should be possible, probably even with other PTAs, but that, uh, that may be more challenging. Interestingly, you also have constraints on the two parameters I told you about, which are important for the fueling and growth. Just from the PTA detection, you can ask how many quasar counterparts you'll be expected to get. And from that number, you can constrain the Eddington ratio potentially. So that is, again, a way to look at the astrophysical properties of the first black holes. I will briefly summarize here by saying that the future probably lies in synergy, 
both in the low redshift universe, as we've seen, and also at the high redshift universe. We've got JWST going out and getting us all these galaxies at redshifts between 12, 15, and above. And LISA will come up, and so will all the different intensity mapping experiments. So cross-correlations hold tremendous promise, not just in fact that they mitigate practical matters, but also they help us to do very good science. And maybe even fundamental physics, we saw a little bit at the uh, yesterday, we can do, uh, as we speak, papers are being written about the variation of fundamental constants and several other things. And this is something which we wrote in 2017, and many people here also contributed. It was a SK review article, and we it's ambitiously titled Fundamental Physics from the Cosmic Dawn. And I also described some more multi-messenger prospects in this, uh, this new article, which has also some bit about the gravitational wave, etc. So that's it. Let me summarize by telling you that there is an astrophysical systematic in everything we do in intensity mapping, but this can be taken care of very efficiently by modeling in a halo model framework, which we've seen already with parameterization. It allows you to do a lot of things besides cosmology. It allows you to do precision and accuracy of forecasts and cross-correlate with other surveys, and especially extend to regimes where we still, we are just getting data in uh, other tracers, which are important probes of reionization. When we look at the whole picture in a multi-messenger framework, we find that we can actually do well with SK as well as LISA to constrain properties of their first black holes. And hopefully, these kind of synergies will help us place the best possible constraints on fundamental physics in the future. That's it. Thanks a lot. Stop here. Thank you. Uh, I have a very naive question. So can uh, neutrino observation help the multi-messenger uh, prospects? Yeah, they, they definitely can. I mean, it's going to be an extra prong on your CS. Like, you verify whether the CMB constraint or the neutrino constraint is matching with what you expect. Till now, I don't know if there are large-scale efforts, but yeah, neutrino is definitely another, another prospect. Right? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, uh, so I have a question. So, uh, as you mentioned that cross-correlations are very prospectus towards the, towards mitigating the systematics and yeah. foregrounds. So, if I ask the question in terms of cosmological perspective, so you measure the cross-correlations, so do you lack anything? Like, do you still need auto-correlation oh, measurements? Oh yeah, no, I'm not, so this is not a substitute. So, in which front uh, cross-correlation measurements sort of lacks uh, when you compare them with auto-correlation? Okay, so cross correlation is important, but it's not complete solution. So it's not sufficient. Cross correlation is real. Today we have wide field surveys which hope to go all the way up to redshift seven, and that would give us our first, you know, lamppost towards telling us what the properties of these systems are. And probably those would be the first few science cases which would enable auto correlation. So cross correlations are a step, but we never had that until very recently because all of the photometric surveys were either too sparsely sampled or too low resolution or too small. So this is definitely one of the things. It is not, so you have to always worry about overlap, right? Because for 21 centimeter auto, you have the whole sky, you have the whole sky. But here you have to, dif uh, you have to have the part of the sky between, let's say, a 100 square degree survey and SK, which is wasting a lot of them. So definitely it's not the full solution, but they have these aspects, which I think will drive us towards having them as the first few science cases before we you know, go to auto. Or if we already are lucky, we can just cross-correlate to make sure that our astrophysics is right or derive something else. Very nice. Uh, <clears throat> so you told that astrophysics is uncertain, but uh, my question is how do you uh, take into account the cosmology kite, for example, like the nonlinearity mm -hmm. or, or the peculiar velocities and all these things in your prediction, like the, yeah. also the light cone effect and all these things. Correct. So that you will do already at the dark matter level. So you'll have all of the cosmology. You can put in non-standard, like these guys put in dark matter. This somebody puts in FNL. You can put all of that. The thing which the halo model and these kind of frameworks do for you is to condense all that astrophysical 100 parameter uncertainty into some dominant parameters. Again, it's not a substitute. It's something which will play with both the sides. But it's very important for intensity mapping because in intensity mapping, you want to get your astrophysical systematic out of the way when you do cosmology. 
So cosmological peculiar velocities can be just put in straight into the framework, whereas, and for instance, other nonlinear effects will be taken care of by that profile function. Everything at the end of the day is constrained by data. So that is one of the chief things about it. Yeah. Hey, uh, so beautiful review, thank you. Um, so I had questions on uh, two things. So for the intensity mapping, uh, what should we, the experimentalists, think about for the spectral resolutions uh, versus the sky coverage? Like, you asked me this in Exclaim Land yesterday. I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything which I showed you here for the tw 21 centimeter cross correlated with C plus, et cetera, uses about a 400 to 200, 400 megahertz resolution with exclaim and feast, and comap uses about 30 megahertz. So I think it's still very good. So that's one of the things. The only extra thing which I have done in these plots, which is not in the base configuration, that's why it's plus plus and not the base, is that the area should at least be 100 square degrees. Okay, so you benefit from a large field you of view. You definitely benefit because you cross correlate, right? So, okay, cool. and yeah. Uh, the other question was particular to COMAP. So mm -hmm. uh, as you know, like I'm trying to increase the sensitivity with these quantum devices. And one thing that's not clear is where the model, you know, target is. So Dongwu claims there's a huge uncertainty on. There is. So, so what, what's the golden dream there? So if you see, the predictions are uncertain, and I would probably claim that this uncertainty is actually captured by this kind of thing, you know? You're something like a scatter, which is like how much your time of the day your halo is turned on, so to speak, in the, in the whole survey, is captured uh, by this range of different predictions and so on. So that in that sense, it's uncertain. But I think what would be very important, and that's what went into this new model which you've seen here, which is actually they improved upon this parameterization. They use the same framework. They put in all these aspects and new data is more data. I mean, the minute you use ALMA data to constrain some of these luminosity parameters, you already do a lot better in the models. So I would say that many of these models are actually probably inconsistent already with current luminosity functions. And in C plus, we are we are lucky because we have ALMA, and so we actually know how uncertain it is today. So, so would the last dashed or dotted blue line be the target in there? Would the last your name with the, yeah twenty eighteen? Oh well, <laughs> this is just a model. I mean, this is this is a mo this well this is model <laughs> driven by a data at that time at twenty eighteen, but with this parameter which was uncertain. So. Mm. You're right that if this is pro this, I would probably claim as yeah, this is the edge of our uh, nothing goes lower than Thank that. you. I know what to build. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's a wonderful, wonderful Thank talk. You. I mean, we, of course, we looked at cross correlations a long time ago, we got uh, all disappointed and 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 forgot about it. But I think I'm, I'm super excited I, again after your talk. So, my question is on, on COMAP. Because I, right, that's in the northern hemisphere, so maybe right mm -hmm. there is some some synergy yeah. with with LOFAR. So you did, of course, the calculation, or the calculation was done for 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 MWA. So what what sort of depth and area? I think the area was just mentioned, several hundred square degrees, but also what depths in terms of the H1 survey is needed to make a detection in a cross correlation with COMAP. COMAP is tricky, so I haven't actually shown you forecasts. This paper was all about C plus and O3. It's because COMAP is covering, at the moment, 12 square degrees. Mm -hmm. So COMAP, an expanded version of COMAP, they are planning that, would be uh, quite, uh, quite useful. Um, I think that, at the moment, people have done uh, forecasts. But again, this was a decade ago. This was not, I mean, we need to re reincarnate some of these things. And um, they did forecast for C map like surveys with standard um, with 21 survey centimeter surveys but they were not any experiment they were just uh, but I think things like low far specifications is quite enough there is nothing which uh, because we are considering because, doing a much wider survey yes. on the tile level with low far so mm -hmm. 25 times the area yes. to quite some depth. Would so be more than enough I mean the okay. 21 centimeters never the pro problem here okay. it's okay. usually yeah okay. thanks Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me for giving this talk. It's a great pleasure to be back at RRI uh, nearly after four or five years and uh, talking to you guys uh, in person. I've just spoken many times in online, but never in person for last since because of COVID. So my today's talk is going to be about 
how we can use some other resources apart from the one which we are discussing so far about electromagnetic probes to do cosmology or astrophysics or and astrophysics. For me with my astrophysics hat it is very difficult to distinguish between astrophysics and cosmology because I infer cosmology from astrophysical sources. So I for me both are very related. So what I will tell you is that how we can combine observations from both electromagnetic sector and from the gravitational wave sector to build up from go from low redshift measurements to high redshift measurements. And as you have seen in last couple of talks, uh, we have basically probed this part, right? We started this our day one, day two, we are here day three. And the reason is very simple. We have pro want to understand cosmic expansion history, cosmic evolution through different probes. What I am going to tell you about, how I am going to probe this with stellar graveyards. Binary black holes are going to be a new probe in the mom, uh, available to us already thanks to LIGO Fargo Kagara collaboration. We have close to 100 of them. And what can we learn about the low redshift universe using these sources? So, when I talk about multi messenger cosmology and astrophysics, most of the time people think it is only about transients. I see two signals at the same time at the same sky location ray, I have a multi messenger information. What I want to say multi messenger means a way to combine information from different probes available from different frequency bands which can be temporal dependent which is transients. It can be static like galaxies, star formation galaxies, emission line galaxies, emission, line intensity mapping, bring it up, whatever you want. Those all are additional informations about the cosmos in different ways. So when I talk about multi messenger observations, keep in mind I am not only talking about two signals you are measuring at the same time, but also in three dimensional cosmic universe. And thanks to several experiments which are present, which I have discussed intensively over here in the last two days, we have several experiments coming in the EM sector. Please forgive me if your favorite one is not mentioned over here. And similarly, we have a new window opened up by the observations of gravitational waves. Goes without saying, uh, it's again a multi band observation. We have observation from extremely high frequency gravitational wave signal which is detectable from ground based detectors to extremely low frequency gravitational wave which is particularly of cosmological origin which you can detect from cosmic microwave background. I am not going to talk today about these two sectors uh, because of just of time. I will primarily focus on these two with this band and partly talk about how it can be also useful for LISA. But to bring everyone on the same page what it means is that these are the sources of masses typically few so solar mass to few hundreds of solar mass which we can detect are now up to a redshift of 1 with LIGO Virgo Kagara collaboration. In future not yet funded though with cosmic explorer and Einstein telescope we will be able to reach way up to redshift of 80 to 100. So these are sources of very different kind which you can measure up to high redshift. And Similarly for LISA, this is the mass range is going to be quite different. We are now talking about millions of solar mass systems exploring way up to a redshift of 20. And so combining these two sectors you can start understanding that you have a very different species in down market like you have quasars, supernova, CMB, galaxies of all kinds. We have now black holes with which we can explore the cosmos. So when I say I want to explore uh, the cosmos with black holes, the obvious question to ask is why is it so special? What are you going to learn about it? So let's say this is my uh, gravitational source with the worst sky localization regions because they are very bad in localizing sources. Because of they are very good distance measurement, I can find cosmic e expansion history from these sources. If I zoom in and these black holes will be forming not uh, randomly but will be depending upon the very much the halo properties of the galaxies, the stellar properties of the galaxies. So the galactic scale physics will be important to understand these properties of the black hole. 
let me tell you this is going to be the main part of my talk which I'm going to talk about today on what you have learned from LIGO on that. These black holes which will be forming again are going to be very much dependent on the stellar properties of the parent stars, the stellar metallicity. And finally, you will be at a regime where you are basically seeing physics from extremely small scales because when two binaries are coalescing, if nothing else apart from gravity should control, decide their emission signal, then you can actually use that very physics effect to understand the properties near it or astrophysical properties or any uh, new physics you want to measure, like testing GR. So in simple way, I will tell you, gravitational wave sources brings uh, additional information in this four dimensional uh, spectrum space, where I can see sources up to very high redshift, whose signal is predictable by general theory of relativity. I can see sources of a large time, range of time scales starting from milliseconds to years whether you are seeing sources like binary neutron stars, binary black holes to supermassive black holes and so on. Sources are of very different kinds of the, from binary neutron stars to supermassive black holes, the spectrum. And don't forget, they will actually explore physics from multiple scales. Starting from kilometer scales where the black holes are coalescing to something like gigaparsec scale where you do cosmology. So I really call it like, like the LRST regime where black holes are very helpful. So now the question is, what can we learn from it so far, whatever you have detected using the LIGO Virgo Kagura collaboration observations? And why am I talking it as a real cosmological probe? So this is our current status in the collaboration. We have detected close to 90 black holes as confident sources and few more which are subspecial. This is the O1, O2, O3. We have an O3b, we have around 90 sources. And these sources have an, some statistical properties which you can measure from them. But to go into basic, the details, I'd like to tell you what are you going to basically measure from it. They are the sources from which you can measure their distances, and they are the sources from which you can measure their masses. Spin, other parameters are also good, well measured, but these are the two quantities which you can measure very nicely. The mass comes from the Chow's property of the gravitational wave signal. And the mass which you measure are typically the redshift of mass, like you measure every frequency as redshift of. And another quantity which you can measure very nicely is the merger rate of binaries as a function of redshift. So the question is now, what you can do by these two informations and the field of cosmology? If you ask a simple question about, well, empirically what are you are seeing in the data? So this is a poster which is made by one of my uh, students, Perl students, trying to understand empirical correlations in the gravitational wave data in the mass spectrum and distance. For time being, just focus on this panel. What you see, empirically LIGO has not seen sources of heavy mass nearby, which it should have seen. We have typically seen sources up to certain masses and heavier sources are typically seen at a higher distance. Well, that's some empirical correlations. And if you do sophisticated statistics and Bayesian analysis, you will find that our current understanding of the mass distribution, this is a paper from our collaboration, saying that the black hole's mass spectrum, now I'm talking about spectrum. We often talk about spectrum in atomic physics. Black holes also gives you a mass scale. So that's why I'm going, black holes are like spectrum. If you can characterize their spectrum, you can possibly use it for cosmology or astrophysics, exactly you can use atoms. Black holes mass spectrum have seen certain features. One of them is this power law with a Gaussian peak and the following up. The way to understand now is where these distributions are coming from. As I told you, Black holes are basically the traces of the last few billion years of the universe. Black holes which are forming, we are seeing today, has formed in galaxies. Those galaxies have evolved, for, and their corresponding stars, which are the parent stars, are the responsible for the formation of the black holes and giving the mass to those black holes. So the mass of the black hole you see has an inherent dependence on the stellar its parent stars. 
And depending upon when they are merging, it will depend on the formation channels of these black holes. It can be an astrophysical black hole or it's primordial black hole. Those all are going to be dependent on this part. So coming from here to my observation needs a lot of transfer from this side to this side and extract the physics from data. And what we now basically want to do is to understand how am I going to infer physics from gravitational wave observations. So what is, uh, what are the things going into the quantities that we usually measure very nicely. So I already told you what are those two. So let's focus on the merger rate at first. So let's say that from electromagnetic observations, thanks to several uh, observations, we have a understanding towards the star formation rate in the universe. This is a plot from the review article of Matthew Dickinson in 2014, which tells you that the stars typically form around a shift of two. And if the black holes are forming from the stars and there is a delay between those black holes to form and for them to merge, there's a finite amount of cosmic time which has evolved. Typically we see that this time scale is can be of a few hundreds of mega years to giga years, which implies the black holes which possibly are merging, let's say are a shift of 0.5, maybe are coming from stars which is formed at a higher redshift. So each black hole will have an imprint of its properties, stereo properties, at a, at a higher, at a, when the universe was younger. That means I can do a time travel using black hole and ask what are the properties of my stars back then when the universe was blah years old. Well, that's not the only story. Another important thing which will come up, which I have shown in my this paper, uh, which is now published in MNOS, showing that just because of this delay time, one inevitable effect will come up, and that's called the mixing of black holes. What does it mean? We know from observations that metallicity in the universe evolves as a function of redshift. Metallicity of the parent stars regulates the uh, black hole masses. So that means if I am forming stars at a, a higher redshift, the black holes are going to be quite a bit heavier in comparison to the black holes you are forming at a lower redshift. So the sources which are merging, suppose that redshift, take a name, so 0.5, those are not only coming from a single redshift, but coming from a distribution of redshifts. So you're going to see mixing of black holes from different origin of parent stars, which will contribute to your observed signal. So that now, what you can ask, well, if I see a black hole in certain region, I can travel back to understand how the galaxy property relates the black hole properties, how the parent star properties regulates this black hole properties and how the parent star properties depends on the galaxy properties. So it's the few step process which now brings us to you to the epoch when the first stars are forming. And you would like to understand how is this particular quantity or concept realized on the data. We have only 90 sources. So if I have a theoretical model or predictions, we can test it with observation. This is the of the plane I'm showing you from the observed gravitational wave masses in the detector frame as a function of its distance, combining all the observed posteriors. So this is a purely data vector. Uh, in uh, top, assuming co Planck cosmology, we have put the redshift, but these are the actual observations which you have made. So the question is, given this model, what can we understand about it? Remember, these places we don't see objects. I have already given you a hint of how we are going. So what we have done, we have done a uh, elaborate population and this, uh, analysis with one of my collaborators who's a PhD student, has just finished his thesis and defended a, a way to infer mixing of black holes and its imprint from gravitational wave data and to understand what can we learn about slightly not so low ratio the universe beyond 0.5 because there's always a delay time from these 90 black holes which you have seen. Well, this is a very complicated plot to tell you, but what is important is when you marginalize about this ma a huge range of 12 parameters, and I now want to show you some of the summary plots. Here you are seeing the plot on the black hole measure rate as a function of redshift and masses. This shows you that there is a hint that black holes at a higher redshift has slightly little higher mass scale at the bump 
than those at the lower threshold. And this is primarily coming from the very fact that your black hole's evolution depends on the stellar metallicity. We, we have not assumed a particular constraint on the metallicity. We have completely varied with the observation. And this is what we find from data. What, what's more, theory predicts us back from 1980s that supernovas of all kinds don't mass from black holes of all masses. Because the supernovas are extremely heavy. They are going to be pair instable with supernovas and they are going to disrupt the complete star ending up in no black holes. What's just mass? There are several theoretical predictions, but not yet a good observational evidence. LIGO Virgo Kagura brings up that opportunity for us to make the measurement of the mass spectrum of black holes, asking is there a, do we see something which should be looking like a PIS on mass scale? Still it's not a big claim, but we are seeing that around the predicted range between 40 to 50, 60 square mass, for different population models we have considered, we are seeing a peak in the black hole mass distribution, which is related to the PIS and mass. And the delay time, how much time universe uh, black hole spends in merging. So that's the time you can go back typically from the time you are seeing the sources. What we have found that most of the sources in LIGO around where we are combined here, they, they are right now a very broad posture support. We don't have a very uh, picky behavior in any of the masses, but typically it speaks around 1.5 to 2 giga years time scale. So that means if LIGO have seen more black holes around a shift of 0.5, most likely our sources, are, we are learning about the physics between a shift 1 and 2. Stay tuned, this number is going to change as soon we have more observations. Well, there are some more. There are few sources which you have detected in uh, LIGO Virgo Kagara collaboration, which was not theoretically hypothesized before its observation. And such sources are very massive black hole of mass around 80 solar mass and above. Why it was not hypothesized? Because PIS and mass scale is the wall. What is this to be understood that PIS and mass scale is a wall modulo the metallicity, modulo the evolution of the galaxy. When you consider this physics driven model and make it uh, project on the data, what you really see GW190521, the heavy mass event is no more so rare. It is very obvious if you really take into account the physics of galaxy formation and plug it in on the black holes. So, that's not the full story. That's only about the sources which you have detected. What about the sources which have not detected? The stochastic gravitational wave background from astrophysical origin. So this is a plot made by my student Mohit, who has shown that these black holes are going to show up an unique signature in the stochastic gravitational wave background spectrum through a non-Gaussian entity with a heavy tail, which will depend on the stellar properties of, its, uh, of the black holes which are contributing. And he has made simulations showing the map of this kind of signal, which will be detectable to LVK in the coming years. Okay, that's what I have talked about LIGO. So why are we heading towards so far? Yep. Now I'd like to tell you in a couple of last two minutes, and if I have minus one minute, I can add that GW and emission line synergies. I have told you these all gravitational resource masses and mass spectrum depends on stellar metallicity, star formation rate. So obvious thing to ask is, well, are those the only ways to see metallicity? The answer is no, of course not. Emission lines of galaxies, emission line of line intensity mapping are an obvious way to measure metals in the universe. What you have found is that emission, when you have galaxies, whether those are emitting bright signal as an emission line galaxies or line intensity mapping signal, this is going to be strongly correlated or going to uh, regulate the properties of the black holes which you are seeing in uh, the high frequency gravitation using high frequency gravitational detectors. So there exists a very interesting synergy between intensity mapping or emission line galaxies with the gravitational wave sources. Here I'm showing you a plot from, from a recent paper with myself and Azade Digja from Geneva, showing that the line intensity mapping, if you make a correlation plot, this is not cross correlation, this is like correlation, like you show M sigma correlation, it's like that. What we are saying 
that the strength of the emission line will in a cell in a line density mapping experiment or in a emission line galaxy ob observations from DAISY, there is going to be a correlation with the gravitational wave source properties, its masses and rest shift depending upon these its formation channels. And you can clearly see I have this is a very complicated plot with color in uh, red shift, marker size for large delay time and small delay time and for different lines H alpha O3 O2 you are going to have different kind of correlations with the black hole properties. And what are we going to learn from it? Soon the, there are several EM observations which will be available thanks to DAISY sphere X which are going to probe the low ratio of universe very accurately. Thanks to LIGO Virgo Kagura collaboration for spanning the gravitational window in the low ratio shift as well. So when we combine the observations of intensity mapping with the gravitational wave mass and the merger spectrum, we will be able to make a measurement of this delay time, which is a broad error bar in the beginning I showed you from current data to a few percent accuracy uh, by combining five years of observations in red five years in observation with DAISY in uh, yellow and the other two for two years. So with this what I will tell you is that the multi messenger observations add what you would like to add. Ask what is the most important constraining power in that observation. If you know how to combine that with another probe there is always you are going to gain a lot of aspects. In astrophysics, in cosmology and in fundamental physics. The window of multi messengers thanks to LVK collaboration for opening this up to us. There is a projected timeline which we are having or O4 runs are starting soon with thanks to Kagura which will be joining in this uh, preliminary stage and future missions are already also uh, uh, listed over here. Some of them are already funded and the synergy with the EM probes I hope can explain by this my latest plot that the, it's a huge span. We have Vera Rubin Observatory, Sphere X, Roman, LIGO, LIGO India, SKA, Kagura, Euclid, DCAM, DAISY, you would name it, it's possible here. If it's not there, please email me, I'd be happy to add it here. But the point is, we are going to learn quite a lot about astrophysics and uh, stepping on that about cosmology, because there's no way to learn cosmology without understanding astrophysics from EM observations and gravitational observations. With this, I will end my talk saying that let's walk back in time with binary black holes and see what we can learn from those in combining with other probes. These are my some of the summary lines saying that gravitational wave sources can tell us about the lower shift and higher shift universe. GWTC3, gravitational wave transient catalog 3, sheds light on the PIS and mass scale, delay time distribution, and the rest shift evolution of the binary black hole merger rate. Binary black hole mass distribution can tell us about its formation channels, as I showed you. And finally, the uh, synergy, the correlation between the property of galaxy, gravitational sources with the metal lines opens a new window, what I call as GW astrochemistry, which will be feasible in the coming years to actually use mass spectrum of black hole and emission line spectrum of atoms to understand the metal evolution, the chemical evolution of the universe. With this, I'll end my talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shubhadeep. Great talk. If I can ask a question which I'm sure is on many people's minds, your working assumption is that the mergers that you have seen, all those black holes resulted from stellar evolution. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say that prior to the LIGO events, uh, stellar models had not predicted black holes in this mass range. Yep. And so people have been speculating about if they might be of primordial origin. Yes, uh, now, you have drawn a, a link with the metallicity evolution, mm -hmm. which is, of course, would be a signature of stellar origin, which is a new thing that I'm seeing here. Can you actually say something definitive to rule out the possibility that these are of primordial origin? Thank you for asking this question, Shubhi. Yeah. Absolutely. The reason behind this is to understand you cannot form astrophysical black holes before forming their parent stars. Correct. And you cannot form astrophysical black holes in the mass range, which is completely not possible astrophysically. Uh, uh, astrophysically. That means that to answer your question, that is the exact reason why we started understanding how the chemical evolution, which controls stars and nothing to do with primordial objects, can control the black hole properties. So, what you are going to do when you apply some data, 
you are basically going to see a correlation between EM source for only those sources which are more correlated or have astrophysical origin. And if you really see any source which is not of astrophysical origin, they will not show correlations like this. A black hole at ratio, I'm detecting say in the ratio, at ratio 5, distribution of them using stochastic gravitational background, where the amount of stars which has formed is tiny. So you can now say, well, either give me a better star model or my all observations of EM are wrong, else it is by PBHS. I understand. So we have to wait to see if that could Yeah, so but wait is not in years. We have already started applying it on the current SGSS data and LIGO. So, yeah. Uh, great prospect. Uh, my question is uh, uh, what are the challenges you, you, you are expected to face uh, observing higher and higher rate shift? Oh, tell me about it. This life is all about challenges. No, uh, uh, we, are to have uh, we are going to have problems in measuring distances. Uh, error in distances scales with the, uh, how far the source is. We are going to have challenges in EM surveys in correctly identifying their ratios. So those who are all uh, funding towards spectroscopic surveys, please add my name. I'm very much on it. We need spectroscopic surveys to go up to higher shift. Systematics about black hole population, to get back to Subir's point, how well do I know this mapping? How well can I map from astrophysical stars to black holes? That needs a lot of physics. That's the frontier where theoretically people who are interested to needs to do a lot of simulations to basically make a prediction which you can test. And if there are uncertainties that we can marginalize over to basically go towards that. So these are the main three bottlenecks we have right now. One more is sky localization error, but with future detectors coming up, we will be heading towards that region slightly better than now. The, like, with LIGO India and so on. Uh, Shubhadeep, uh, so one question, uh, maybe this is what you were referring to. So you're making the line intensity measurements at rate of 0.5, let's say. Uh, or 0.8, depending on which depending line. Depending on, uh, okay, so that's telling you the state of the galaxy, the at star rate. formation rate at rate of 0.8. Yes. How do you account for the evolution the you chemical evolution measure, right? between, say, redshift 2 and redshift 0. 0.8 is, what is your model for that? No, so the idea is, great question, it's about the tomographic measurement. No information can come from a single value of the redshift. If I take any particular estimate, if you can draw a line, there is a complete degeneracy between this point and this point at high redshift and low redshift. So what you need to do is a tomographic estimation of different lines as a function of redshift. So you're going to... You're and you are basically going to ask which trajectory is it following? Is it a... Uh, in, if you see from the, this side, something is anticlockwise, something is clockwise. So you're looking for the mean trajectory of a, of a galaxy that is emitting in a certain fashion at redshift 0 0.8? 0 0.9 and 0 0.5 and asking how the black holes, which I have seen at those distances, correlates its properties. That's the evolution. Is, is that what is actually going behind is use metallicity evolution of the galaxies, star formation rate of the galaxies, and ask what inform information can you give it to the black holes, and then do this whole inference. What is interesting that they segregate very nicely in this plane for different line. Give a physics, all different lines will show you Similar signatures for the physics, but have different independent trajectories. You can add them. So think about it like you do cross correlation between different probes. Think about this line, emission line, GW correlations for all possible lines you can come up with. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had a few questions. Mm -hmm. So when you say intensity mapping, it is actually the global signal that you mean. No, fluctuations. No, fluctuations? Yes. Clustering and Poisson. So how do you distinguish between the normalization? I mean, that will be your uh, line intensity, right? You and the, uh, the power spectrum of the fluctuations. So normalization and uncertainty is basically your sigma 8 measurements. Or no, no, no. I mean, you want to uh, look at the evolution of the metallicity, right? Yes. Now, uh, the, the strength of the line intensity, intensity signal will depend on the metallicity as well as the fluctuation, which you don't, neither of which you know a priori. No, you do not know the amount of fluctuations which you have. 
So you're going so, to assume it traces the dark matter. Or exactly. So you so basically you model it, right? Yeah. You know, no, you model it. That okay. is a place where so you take a dark matter distribution. Okay. So, so it's going to be heavily the, model dependent. No, it's not. That is, I think that's the thing which needs to go in here. We do not know what model goes in emitting a line from a in a dark matter halo, but universe knows it. What I'm saying is there are two different tracers, which is the underlying <coughs> physics is the same. The physics I'm inferring because two different tracers brings additional and different information. No, so like in H1, you measure the omega H1 into the bias. Correct. Right. So here the also, bias you, is normalized, uh, completely so here also you will have something like that. You will yes, not have yes, just totally, the, totally. you just have, you won't just have the metallicity, you will have that into the bias. Yes, yes. So these all quantities, so in this plot, Exactly the quantity which you mentioned, we, have, we basically marginalize for the bias and we add all the Fourier modes available for these particular surveys, taking into account their uh, uh, frequency resolution, their instrument specifications. So I had another question, so yeah. let, let me quickly ask that. So what fraction of the black holes are in binaries, what are uh, single and uh, I mean you are talking about the mass spectrum. Yeah. So you will be measuring the mass spectrum of the binaries, yes. but not of the total population, right? Right, never. <laughs> So this is all about the mass spectrum of the binary system. That's why the delay time is important. Gravitational waves don't see individual black holes. They see only the binaries. So we are going to talk about the population and binaries and how the population of binary relates with the astro metal lines, stellar properties, you name it. How is that? But, but I cannot make it a You didn't answer my it. first question. I mean, just, just for my curiosity, what's yeah. the, what fraction of the black holes are in binaries? Uh, do so, you if idea? you believe your stellar system, has 50 percent of them are in binaries. Okay. But, then, no, but that is of stars, right? Yes. But black holes. Uh, so, uh, depending upon your formation channels, if yes. whether they are in binary system and they are merging, or they are merging in higher level mergers, like the dynamical channels, those will matter. That's the exact physics which you'd like to learn from here. If you ask a person who is doing stellar population, they put these parameters right now exactly like we used to do in 1960s or 70s of any omega B value, omega matter value. Those are quantities we do not know. And these measurements will be the only way to tell you how binaries are forming in what typical time scale in the universe. Basically by comparing it with the stellar properties and speaking the stellar properties at, the, at a shift two. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I'm extremely grateful uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, work conference and for the celebration of the 75th uh, anniversary of the Raman in Research Institute. Uh, I did my PhD here and uh, uh, I much, much of I learned I learned how to do research here. So I'm very happy and grateful to be here to uh, for this occasion. Uh, currently I am at the uh, I have been there for nearly quarter of a century, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and I was there before I came here also. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the building where I sit uh, in one corner of this building. This is a very historical building, incidentally. Uh, this used to be a detention center where political prisoners were uh, kept during the British period. And after independence, uh, the whole uh, IIT system started here. And this is our uh, uh, new uh, institute building. This is the logo of our institute. And it's a pretty large institute, around 15,000 students. And uh, <coughs> so the work that I'm going to present uh, has mainly been done by my uh, st students, present and past. So just to put it in the reverse, uh, this is the Shumit Choudhury, who is now a faculty at IIT Madras, who is here in the audience. Srijita Pal, uh, she was also my PhD student. She has submitted her thesis. I don't know. She may or may not be here. Uh, Asif Elahi is here in the audience. He is currently a PhD student with me. There are other people who have also collaborated. They were uh, earlier my students. And there are a whole set of <coughs> other people who are uh, co-authors of the paper which, we, uh, which I'm going to talk about, many of uh, them. There may be other people also who have participated in this. I might have missed out. Okay. So uh, let me first define the aim. Uh, this has been uh, spoken about in this conference, but just to make sure that uh, we all understand what we are talking about, let me uh, define the aim of my talk. 
So, uh, we have been uh, focusing on the GMRT, but what I am going to speak about is uh, in general true for any interferometric array. Uh, and uh, so, if we consider any pair of antennas like this say of the GMRT, what we measure is a uh, visibility and uh, the visibility is essentially the distance between the antennas divided by the wavelength. So, uh, the same pair of antennas the visibility uh, the baseline that is the baseline uh, that, that changes as the frequency changes anyway. So, the quantity measured is a visibility and the visibility has a lot of uh, radio signal. We are interested in this particular signal which is uh, coming from the neutral hydrogen and what we are interested in is measuring the, the, the fluctuations in the brightness temperature uh, from this uh, to in the 21 centimeter redshift at 21 centimeter emitted by this hydrogen. And uh, what we would like to measure is the power spectrum and uh, what we have are observations of the visibility. So, the problem is that how to measure the power spectrum from the visibilities and the power spectrum is written as a function of k parallel and k perpendicular. These are Fourier modes in the plane of the sky and along the line of sight direction respectively. They, I am denoting them separately because of two reasons they are measured in different ways. Uh, the line of sight direction basically corresponds to different frequencies and the co-moving separation delta r I am writing as r prime which she also referred to into delta nu the channel the frequency separation. And this blob of this whole box of h 1 from where the radiation is coming I am assuming is at a distance r. So, I have this r r prime and I have these Fourier modes and I would like to measure the brightness temperature power spectrum of this whole h 1 from where I am receiving the radiation. <coughs> So, my and our analysis is essentially based on this one formula uh, which uh, Shiv and I uh, presented in a paper in 2001 uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, so, what does this formula what are the various ingredients let me just go over it. So, we are looking at the correlation of a visibility at the same baseline, but at different frequencies at a separation of frequency separation of delta nu and this is related to the Fourier transform of the power spectrum of the brightness temperature fluctuations and the Fourier transform is along k parallel and uh, there are these factors here which I have. Uh, so, and the k perpendicular in this is basically the baseline in multiplied by 2 pi by r and uh, there is a factor here which uh, uh, depends on the is a conversion factor and uh, there is the primary beam full width half maxima which comes in through this theta naught. So, this is essentially the, uh, the thing that we are going to use to estimate the power spectrum we are going to correlate the visibilities, uh, but we are doing it uh, in two steps. So, let me also introduce this, this has advantages let me also I will tell you what those are. So, we first correlate the visibilities and estimate something called the multi, multi frequency angular power spectrum which is a function of the uh, angular multipole L which is again related to the baseline and the frequency separation that occurs over here and there are all these factors here. Once we have the multi frequency angular power spectrum maps you can get the 3D power spectrum by a Fourier transform. I should also mention since there were questions about resolution for other line intensity mapping etcetera etcetera these things also hold for other uh, other lines other line intensity mapping. If you are doing a single dish uh, kind of uh, thing uh, if you are doing interferometry then you have this if you are not doing interferometry you do not have to bother about visibilities, but this goes through even if you are doing say carbon monoxide or any other uh, any other spectral line intensity mapping. Uh, this will tell you the frequency resolution you need etcetera etcetera ok. <coughs> right. And I have introduced this quantity multi frequency angular power spectrum let me just tell you what it is. So, this maps is so you have this box the brightness temperature fluctuation you decompose it into spherical harmonics. Well, if it is a box you use Fourier modes, but if you have the whole sky you decompose it into spherical harmonics and then you correlate them at two different frequencies and this gives you the maps multi frequency angular power spectrum. And the signal that we have we are, we are interested in the delta nu dependence. So, we collapse it assuming that it depends only on the frequency separation and not on the frequencies themselves ok. So, this is the basic idea and, uh, and we have been using something called the tapered gridded estimator TGE 
to uh, to estimate this maps. So, let me explain uh, the thing what we the, the tapered gridded estimator why bother about tapering ok. So, here you see when you have uh, two dishes or a single dish antenna or any other antenna this is the typical beam pattern that it will produce. So, you have a this is a I mean this is a kind of this amplitude of this is much larger than the amplitude of the side lobes. I have plotted it like this on a log scale so that you can see the side lobes otherwise the side lobes are actually very small if I really plotted them ok. So, you have a primary beam the primary lobe where you are sensitive to the signal this can be it was discussed in a talk uh, MWA talk also it can be well approximated by a Gaussian only the central part. But then there are these side lobes through which signal also comes in it is attenuated but signal does come in ok. And uh, the signal by, by signal I mean foregrounds the signal you want to measure it really does not come in much through this it is highly attenuated it is weak already right. But the foregrounds come in through this. Now, if you plot the foregrounds on this k parallel k perpendicular plane this angle theta. So, if I have a foreground source at an angle theta it will appear at like a straight line on this k parallel k perpendicular plane. And uh, so, the furthest obviously is the horizon well you can go below the horizon also, but the horizon is what we consider. So, this would be <coughs> this region unless you remove the foregrounds completely would definitely be foreground dominated and uh, there could be leakage because of other spectral structures chromatic response. So, the point is that it would be definitely advantageous if we could somehow reduce the side lobe response. And uh, what we have been doing trying to do is that we have been trying to reduce the side lobe response. So, you can see the green curve here that has got a lower side lobe response by multiplying the sky effect you can think of it that we are multiplying the sky with the window function which falls off faster than this typically ok. So, if you could multiply the sky with the window function that falls off faster than this you would have a side lobe pattern uh, which is uh, much response which is much attenuated and maybe you could cut down the foregrounds to some extent this is the basic idea at least right. So, mitigate the foregrounds to some extent. Now, the question is how do we implement it. So, what we do is that we have these visibilities we convolve the visibilities with the Fourier transform of this window function and then we grid them right. So, at the step of gridding we convolve the visibilities with the Fourier transform of this window function and then we have the gridded convolved visibilities. These hopefully have a smaller side lobe response compared to the original visibilities themselves. So, this is the basic idea and uh, this is the formula for the tapered gridded estimator uh, it is a little technical, but let me quickly just go through it few, min few minutes right. So, this is basically the correlation of the visibilities at two different frequencies the gridded visibilities. Now, if you correlate visibilities the a visibility will have some noise and uh, the self correlation will have a noise bias. So, we here we internally estimate the noise bias and sub the self correlation then subtract it out. So, this is unbiased basically it has no noise bias and there is a normalization factor here. Uh, how do we estimate this normalization factor? So, what we do is we generate Gaussian random fields where the multi frequency angular power spectrum is 1 and we simulate the visibilities if I had this what would be the visibilities I would get and I put it through the same thing and then I can use that to normalize this whole thing. I do not have to really calculate anything uh, whatever I do here I do here also with these simulated visibilities and that effectively normalizes the estimator. This gives me an estimate of the angular power spectrum maps at one grid point and I have all these grid points. So, I have estimates at those all those grid points. So, the expectation value of this is the angular power multi frequency angular power spectrum at a particular grid point on that grid which I had showed you right. And then we uh, bin the greens gr the, the grids in an annular fashion because we know the signal is isotropic on the plane of the sky and then we take a Fourier transform. So, this is related uh, to the 3 D power spectrum through a Fourier transform and we have used a maximum maximum likelihood estimator with the noise covariance matrix which we have computed using simulations with just noise in the visibilities. So, this gives us the 3 D power spectrum. 
right. <coughs> right. So, we have uh, so this is the basic formalism of the tapered gridded estimator and uh, we started off. So, the uh, thing was to demonstrate it somewhere if we did not have much data. So, where to we demonstrate it? So, we uh, had this 150 megahertz uh, GMRT observation, the observations are pretty old, they were carried out in 2008 and uh, the details of this observation are given here. Uh, it is a very small observation, few hours only and uh, then we, uh, we imaged this observation, we subtracted out point sources and this is a low resolution map after subtracting out the point sources. Just to give you a feel for the field that we are looking at, you can see the diffuse structure here. This is the galactic synchrotron radiation whose angular spectrum we measured for this field and it is published uh, in this paper and the red things that you see here, they are the residuals from point source subtraction, possibly uh, ionospheric fluctuations and various other things corrupted the gains and we have these residuals which you can see here, right. So, we took this data and we wanted to apply our estimator to this to demonstrate that it can actually produce something, right. Now, this GMRT data has this very nice feature, you see nice for us at least, I mean not really nice, it has got severe flagging. Looking at this, you would think that the gray regions are flagged and the white regions are available, it is actually the other way around, <coughs> okay. So, the white regions are all flagged and the, so this is an extreme case, this particular data is more than 90 percent flagged. On the average, it is around 40 percent flagged, but we took this data and we want to see whether we can get a power spectrum out of this. So, first thing that you do is we want to validate that you take a hypothetical signal, put it through your system and see whether you can reconstruct, re, re, I mean uh, recover the power spectrum which you had put in. So, we put in a power law power spectrum, simulated the sky with this power law power spectrum and we uh, computed, simulated the visibilities. We put it through the, uh, through the GM, I mean, GMRT beam pattern, etc., calculated all the visibilities. And uh, these are the, this is the ang multi frequency angular power spectrum which we recovered. And this is the 3D power spectrum. So, we see that there is quite a good match. We can recover the uh, input power spectrum to within 10 percent accuracy even with all this flagging, okay. So, see basically uh, what happens. So, this is it, right. Another feature which I would like to draw your attention to is that which was also mentioned by Shiv that you see the signal decorrelates very rapidly and within a megahertz or so there is no signal beyond that. So, the signal is localized with us within a small delta phi nu range and there is no signal beyond that. The foregrounds we expect to be continuous, uh, it will extend much beyond, okay. This is the, so this is what we got from our simulations and we validated the estimator and this is the data for the GMRT. So, let me uh, uh, explain to you what this is. So, uh, so you see this is uh, the, the maps, the multi frequency angular power spectrum for a few L as a function of delta nu before point source subtraction and this is after point source subtraction. Re remember that we have another parameter f which decides how much tapering we have done. Small f means we have applied considerable tapering, the response has been suppressed. Large f means we have not applied much tapering, okay. So, these you can see that for large f there are these oscillations in the maps. These oscillations are the point sources which are remaining somewhere in the side lobe or in the wide field, okay. As we reduce f, you can see that these oscillations go down. So, this basically tells us that uh, by tapering we are able to reduce the, 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 the foregrounds coming in through the side lobes, okay. And uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the 3D power spectrum, the cylindrical power spectrum that we get for different values of f. Uh, you can see that there is this wave, not very nice to look at, but anyway, we have the foreground uh, features here. They spill over, this is the foreground wedge. Uh, this is, they spill over beyond the wedge also. Uh, the, the, the spillage and the foregrounds, for, please ignore this lower part. The, the, the foregrounds, the spilling, spillage goes down as we reduce the value of f and uh, finally, looking at these things very carefully, uh, we uh, kind of identified that there is this small region here which uh, 
where there seems to be very little foreground and uh, we can go ahead and uh, do kind of some kind of signal estimation with this. Remember that GMRT is not designed for EOR or anything, it is a general purpose telescope. Okay. So, this region is pretty small and uh, right. So, uh, to look to really go ahead, one has to look at the statistics of the power spectrum in that region. Is it noise or is it systematics? Is it foregrounds? So, we need to look at the statistics of the power spectrum over there to convince ourselves that that it is okay, it is symmetric, there are not very large negative values, right. But you see the statistics, the, the sample, the, the baseline distribution and the frequency coverage varies considerably. So, we do not have uniform statistics across that region itself. So, to, to get something that we could compare, what we did was we carried out noise simulations which will tell us the noise properties if it were ideal. And we looked at the ratio of the power spectrum that we estimated to the standard deviation from these simulations. If it were ideal, this thing would be something some which had a mean 1 and a variance, some variance, it would be a Gaussian or something like that. Well, this is the value how the x values are distributed we see that they are reasonably well fit by a Gaussian. There is a slight excess which seems to tell us that there is some foreground still in that region. The variance is excess like it was mentioned earlier in the other talks. So, there is an excess, excess variance. So, we have uh, possibly due to the variety of reasons that could contribute and we have scaled up our error bars calculated from the simulation with this factor which is the excess variance. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, then we have some uh, limits on the power spectrum and the brightness temperature. The limits are not anything significant, but we have demonstrated that this uh, TGE works, okay, even in the presence of heavy flagging. Now, uh, we then uh, moved on to uh, some low redshift observations where uh, things are more promising. So, uh, we then had this uh, longer observation uh, around 27 hours, I think, uh, or Right, which was analyzed in this paper, Chakraborty et al., uh, who did a. So we, I was a part of that paper also. Arnab, uh, Arnab, uh, Arnab Chakraborty, a group student, was the lead author, and uh, we uh, we uh, analyzed this field and we could look at we quantified the foregrounds quite precisely in this field using a TGE, a different version of the TGE, and finally we had a point source subtracted uh, 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 line, this uh, 3D cube where all the point sources above this were, uh, were taken out and we analyzed one particular uh, small band from this uh, 24 megahertz band and uh, there we have uh, three, uh, two, this corresponds to a neutral hydrogen from this particular redshift around 2.3. There are uh, two papers, uh, so I am going to compare various results. So, the first one is this, this is the total TGE. So, what we have done in this paper, we have taken both the polarizations, we have added them up and squared them. This is the TGE which I talked about and then we also looked at something different which is the cross TGE where instead of taking both the polarizations, we cross correlated two polarizations and we refer to this as the cross TGE. We did a something even further. Uh, we uh, took this cross TG and removed the foregrounds after that. Uh, this we have just submitted yesterday. <laughs> and there is a paper which was written earlier by uh, Chakra, Andhap Chakravarti, where he analyzed uh, the same data, many subbands of the same data uh, using a standard delay spectrum and a clean algorithm, right. So, let me uh, uh, go ahead. So, this is the maps, the multi-frequency angular power spectrum for this uh, particular field which I was referring to. The point here <coughs> is that uh, the blue line, if you see, it shows you the total maps and the red line shows you what you get when you cross correlate the two polarizations. The overall DC value is not important. What is important is the are the fluctuations. And uh, it is quite clear that the fluctuations, uh, they go down if you cross correlate the two polarizations as compared to when you look at the total, okay. So, this is uh, what we found and uh, uh, this is the uh, cylindrical uh, power spectrum which we uh, obtained from this. 
So, this is the total uh, uh, and this is the cross power spectrum. You can see that uh, this performs much better than the 150 megahertz data. The resolution uh, is also much better and we have a longer integration time also. This is the foreground wedge. Uh, there is some leakage. So, we uh, restricted the uh, subsequent analysis to the region above this dashed line for the total and for the cross this is the foreground wedge. We identified this region above this dashed line as the clean region and uh, if you look at the statistics of that same quantity x, yeah. So, now you see again you have a uh, you have a distribution which is roughly symmetric but there is a positive excess, some foreground still remain. Interestingly, this is not well fit by a Gaussian, but it has a T distribution. And uh, when we look at the cross, uh, it is actually a Lorenzian distribution. It has these long tails, but here it is quite nearly symmetric. The foreground uh, have the foreground or whatever systematics we had here has got down. And uh, <coughs> then after that, what we did we took the maps corresponding to this cross and uh, we removed the foregrounds. The details of this are there in this poster by Asif Elahi. Uh, paper as I mentioned has just been submitted. So, we took the maps and from the maps we subtracted the foregrounds because as I told you the signal is all just in a very small delta nu range. So, we can use the other range to estimate the foregrounds. And this was the, uh, the power spectrum uh, before foreground removal and after foreground removal, uh, we have a, the entire k parallel k perpendicular range is uh, free of foregrounds. But the range that we have now has reduced because uh, of such certain reasons. But we now have a clear uh, region where there is very little foreground. This is the, uh, the statistics x which I showed you. You can see it is quite uh, symmetric and very well fitted by a Lorenzian profile. And uh, <coughs> so, let me compare uh, the, the, the 3D spherical power spectra that we have. So, uh, <coughs> this blue curve is the total uh, which we obtained and uh, the orange here is the cross. The black line over there is uh, Arnab Chakravarti's uh, 3D power spectrum and this is what we get after uh, uh, foreground uh, removal. Uh, rough, these are all okay. And uh, so, these are the limits. Uh, so, Arnab Chakravarti has limits at various redshifts. Uh, using TGE, we now have limits at, uh, we just focused on one particular uh, redshift. So, we have these limits. And uh, with foreground removal, uh, we have these limits. So, it is, uh, I mean, one likes to uh, quote these in terms of omega H1b. So, the value of omega H1b, the 2 sigma upper limit is 0.022. Uh, here we do not use the power spectrum actually, we directly constrain this from the maps without having the need to make a power spectrum. And uh, <coughs> these are roughly consistent with noise, uh, these are all, uh, these, this and this are consistent with noise. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that is it. Yeah, uh, let me then come to the summary. So, I, uh, I uh, hope I have convinced you that we have this uh, estimator called the tapered gridded estimator. It works in two steps. We first uh, estimate the maps and then the 3D power spectrum. The advantage is that it can taper the wide field and the side lobes, wide field response and the side lobes. It can also, uh, missing channels is not a problem for this. So, it can, it can handle quite severely flagged data also. Uh, we have applied it to 150 megahertz data, GMRT data to uh, 420 uh, megahertz UGMRT data. We have uh, applied foreground removal also and in future we plan to generalize this. Uh, so, right now we do not have baseline migration, we do not take into account the variation of the primary beam pattern. So, we plan to put in these also, these can be put in and uh, we can go for a wide band analysis of the entire field, maybe 100 or even more. Okay, thank you. Thanks uh, for a very nice uh, talk. So, so one thing, and I've, I've been in discussion on, on these issues before, is that 
course, in standard imaging, right, when you have your visibilities, you go to images, there, there is already a gridding happening there. It's standard built in. All uh, images have gridders. But they use a different kernel. They use uh, write kernels that really drop off by 100, 120 dB and cut off very hard. And of course, you can set that kernel. Um, and that really cuts off all the power beyond that uh, cutoff line, effectively. Um, so, so why did you choose a, a Gaussian, which is still right, sort of very gently running off? Well, why not uh, use a, yeah. a, a much yeah. sharper window function? Well, a sharper window function would have ripples, right? Uh, well, we have to choose something. Well, there are two reasons primarily. One is that a Gaussian, uh, see, we are, we, we are convolving with the Fourier transform of a window function which we know in the image plane, mm -hmm. right? So, a Gaussian has a well-defined analytic Fourier transform. That is one advantage. And the second is that if you have a very sharp cutoff, it may have a uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't mean to shut cut, cut off, but for example, these. Uh, with, I understand. Bessel, Kaiser, Bessel, all of these. They're, so this they're very is uh, Gaussian is simple to implement. Yeah, yeah. Simply simple to implement. See, the, if I had something like that in the sky plane, its extent in Fourier domain would be very large, and the uh, the convolution time would go up. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, people have written <laughs> for yeah. 40 years so, software. No, I agree. This, uh, but sorry. then this noise, so, yeah. so you see the noise bias calculator, the yeah. subtraction, yeah. all these things become very complicated. It's yeah. not only the, if it were just the first step, it would be easy, right? But calculating the noise bias and subtracting out, mm. these are difficult if I put in that. Maybe the second point, if, if I may, is the, so, so I, mean, I agree, it, it really suppresses, of course, the uh, everything coming in from the side, uh, from, from the, the, the beam side lobes. It doesn't suppress the PSF side lobes. Those are still leaking in. Right, right. Because even if you, you apply this, um, um, you will still see power beyond that right sort of new horizon line that the, where, where, where the Gaussian cuts it off. And there's still a lot of power, and that, that all must come in via the, the side lobes, right? Because it, it's really you're tapering the, the, the dirty image, not the, the, the real image, and then convolving it. You're first convolving and then tapering. So the side lobes are still leaking in, and, and that's uh, another what, huge problem. Yeah, what you say is correct. Yes. And uh, uh, the only way to mitigate that is that if you have a dense baseline yes. coverage. A good, right? So good, it doesn't work very function. well for GMRT. Indeed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if I had an array, I mean, where we had a very dense and uniform baseline coverage, yeah. it, would, it works. We have shown it with simulations also. Yeah. It works much better. Then you also can taper, of course, the visibilities themselves in some sense, right. weigh, weigh them properly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No, uh, our uh, our L range is uh, our L range is much larger. Yes. Uh, I think the lowest possibly is uh, seven. A few. I mean, five, maybe thousand would be so uh, seven. Small only small uh, small angular scales. It's right. restricted by the GMRT field of view. I, I understand. That yeah. That. It would be interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, okay, I can think about yeah. There are, right, right. It's not only this one. I mean, there are uh, CL, uh, lot, there are, we have done a lot of CL actually. So, there were questions about CL and Gaussian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, summarize this? We have used a standard, uh, I mean, okay, uh, I really am not an expert in that, but 150 megahertz, uh, we use the standard self calibration, uh, self calibration uh, with some time intervals, uh, uh, at some time interval, few minutes, I think, or something, uh, we did self calibration. That too, I think, uh, intensity uh, only phase, I think it was phase self calibration. I do not recollect all the details, it was in 2008, but we did very standard uh, self calibration. I uh, maybe uh, Nirupam or Obirup can tell about the band 3 data, they are the people who did the calibration for that. Thank you. I think it was standard self calibration. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, uh, and yeah, I hope everyone is not too sleepy after lunch. Uh, firstly, thanks to the organizers for inviting me for this talk. Um, and congratulations to the RRI on its 75th uh, centennial. Um, you know, uh, uh, very exciting. And uh, I want to give my apologies. I know this meeting was intended to be in person, but I, uh, I sincerely couldn't get out of my obligations here, in particular teaching. And I, I do apologize for not being there in person and interacting with people. But I've been following the talks uh, on the YouTube channel, and uh, it's uh, you know there's some exciting work uh, being discussed there. Uh, so this uh, I guess afternoon there, um, I'll be talking about 21 centimeter cosmology with Hilux, and shown in the background here is a cartoon of what you know we eventually uh, expect Hilux to look like. Um, this is in the uh, South African Kuru Desert, where the SKA, uh, where currently Meerkat is, and where the SKA will be based. And uh, Hera is uh, also located. So I'm based at the Astrophysics Research Center at UKZN. Um, um, let's see, let me click on that. So, uh, yeah, so I know there was a discussion about uh, the challenges of BAOs. You know, Shiv spoke about that this morning. But uh, this project is motivated, uh, you know, largely by. Um, you know, designing an instrument that will measure the baryon acoustic oscillations and in turn measure dark energy. Uh, so for those who are unfamiliar with the BAOs, basically uh, these are remnants uh, from the early universe of acoustic uh, kind of oscillations uh, coupling between the CMB and baryons. Uh, as the, when the CMB decouples, uh, you know, they're moving out of the baryons. When they decouple, they leave the baryons in, this, in their wake. And uh, what you get is a characteristic uh, 150 megaparsec scale, which corresponds to the sound horizon at decoupling. Um, that scale gets imprinted into the distribution of galaxies, and it's been measured already. So shown here is, uh, you know, uh, some from some time now, uh, measurements of the uh, BAO feature at low redshift in three redshift bins, uh, showing this in configuration space where you see the peak coming out. And then seeing this in power spectrum space on the left, where you see oscillations. Uh, just to check, uh, can you see my pointer? Um, so yeah, so these, these are measure and then we've had more recent measurements uh, from the. So just to minimize this, uh, yeah. So we've had measurements at the few percent level from recent uh, EBOS results. Uh, these are different traces at different ridges. You know, we'll be talking about twenty-one centimeter intensity mapping, where we have a single tracer across this, you know, uh, most of this redshift range, uh, in particular, you know, for Hyrax. Um, so uh, the idea, and this has been discussed earlier, so I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Um, instead of individu uh, resolving individual galaxies, uh, so spending a lot of time, for example, like with an SKA survey where you're detecting individual galaxies, the, which are on the megaparsec scale, the feature we're looking for is, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, much larger, 150 megaparsecs. So rather than uh, resolve these individual galaxies, we can trade off uh, a resolution for sky coverage, basically. So we design a low resolution uh, experiment, so a, a, a telescope, an interferometer that isn't really accessing very small scales, and we throw away this uh, spatial resolution, but uh, this allows us to now uh, map out much larger volumes. And uh, in doing so, we get many realizations of the a BAO peak, uh, so you know the Hyrax volume with a thousand dishes over four years is uh, something like fifty gigaparsec cube, um, and you get you know you can bring down the kind of cosmic variance in the measurement of the BAO, and then in turn we'll use the BAO peak across the redshift range. Uh, we are probing you know four hundred to eight hundred megahertz, which corresponds to about zero point seven five uh, to uh, zero point eight to two point five uh, you know redshift range. 
Um, so we'll be able to measure a large volume. Um, so how do we design such a you know, telescope? Uh, we want to maximize the sensitivity on the scales of interest. So I mentioned these are large scales, you know, degree and larger. So we use a compact array geometry. Uh, the redshift range uh, we want to probe is the redshift range when dark energy comes to dominate. Uh, so this is between, so we're probing from 0.8 to 2.5, and that gives us you know the frequency, the bandwidth of 400 to 800 megahertz. We also need that redshift range to cover sufficient volume, um, and of course we need a large area on the sky. So we're targeting 15,000 square degrees. Uh, the angular scale of the BAO, uh, this 150 megaparsec, if you convert it into an angular scale, corresponds to something to uh, between 3 and 1.3 degrees at these redshifts. So that uh, gives you baseline lengths, which are between 15 and 60 meters. So very compact in terms of a uh, you know, radio interferometer. Uh, and then along the line of sight, we also would like to measure the BAOs. That corresponds to between 20 and 12 megahertz at these redshifts. And therefore, we need uh, about 100 channels across the you know, four, uh, 400 megahertz bandwidth. But uh, ideally, we want more channels than that uh, to be able to remove the foregrounds and also measure higher order peaks in the BAO. And then, as mentioned you know, this morning, the BAO signal level is very low. It's at the millikelvin or fraction of a millikelvin level, 0.1 millikelvin. So what that means is you need a very sensitive instrument, so something with a low system temperature and then a lot of collecting areas, so lots of elements. So this uh, drives us to the design of Pyrax. Uh, so some of the specifications are given in the table there. Um, I should note that, uh, you know, I guess Matt is speaking next about cord, and we kind of sharing, uh, you know, in terms of the re reflector or the dish, we are sharing technology on that. So that's quite an exciting collaboration. And we've done uh, simulations, you know, to motivate moving from our original uh, specification of uh, focal ratio of 0.25 uh, to something which is you know much deeper, so 0.21, and that's largely also informed by you know what other experiments that are trying to measure the intensity mapping signal are finding. There's a lot of cross coupling between dishes, uh, so we're moving to a system where we essentially using the the dish almost like a ground screen uh, and preventing to prevent this cross coupling or to limit it at least. Uh, so the rest of the specifications are given there. Um, uh, essentially, uh, we're aiming to eventually build a thousand dishes, uh, six meter dishes. Uh, currently, we have funding to build up to 256. We are uh, adopting a sc uh, staged approach. Uh, so we're scaling up, essentially because we want to uh, retire key risks at each stage. Um, and uh, you know, we're hoping that with the uh, with these pathfinder arrays, so up to the 256. We'll be able to make detections of this uh, BA, uh, of the 21 centimeter signal, and then the BAOs, and then you know secure more funding to expand out to a thousand dishes and operate for uh, four years. Uh, the I should say to keep the costs down, um, the dishes are stationary, but we can tilt them for uh, you know to get more sky area, and they're being fabricated in South Africa, and of course the design is in uh, kind of as I mentioned in parallel with cord uh, is being. Uh, provided by the NRC in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, on the back end, there's a lot of overlap with Chime. We're channelizing with the FPGA iSports that, that come from McGill, so Matt Dobbs and John Sievers uh, leading that effort. And then we're correlating with GPUs, which uh, an effort which is being led uh, by uh, our Swiss partners, but uh, in strong collaboration with the University of Keith uh, van der Linde's group at the University of Toronto. Uh, so that's uh, that, that's basically a kind of uh, overview of the of the project. Uh, the science goals, as I mentioned, we want to measure BAOs with twenty one centimeter intensity mapping. We want to cross correlate with other cosmological surveys. So in this first part of the talk, I'm talking about the project. I'll talk about measuring BAOs and dark energy in the second part and the challenges from you know removing foregrounds. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll talk about cross correlation, some work we've been doing on cross-correlating 21-centimeter uh, intensity mapping with CMB and large-scale structure surveys. Uh, there's other science that we can do with uh, IREX, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, CHIME is now really well known for detecting lots of fast radio bursts. Uh, IREX and CORD will also be, uh, you know, have a large collecting area and be quite sensitive uh, and also, you know, map out large areas of the sky. So we'll be able to detect radio transients, in particular, you know, fast radio bursts, but also slow radio transients. We'll be able to uh, carry out pulsar searches. Uh, you know, we're planning something like 20 or more beams. 
uh, we, we see a lot of the galaxy in the south, so that's an advantage. And then, of course, we're working with uh, Niraj Gupta at uh, Ayuka on uh, you know, detecting neutral hydrogen absorbers in our data, so blind and targeted detection. And then finally, of course, we'll learn a lot about the you know, diffuse galactic polarization uh, at these frequencies. Uh, in terms of the collaboration, it's a large international collaboration. I haven't included yet some recent partners, including the NRC and the Simons Foundation. Uh, but, um, you know, we are about 25 to 27 institutions, uh, you know, internationally, a large number of institutions in South Africa. A lot of the funding is coming uh, from South Africa, so the National Research Foundation uh, have funded, uh, you know, the infrastructure and the Pathfinder Array. Uh, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is uh, also, you know, the kind of entity liaising with the SKA, uh, you know, around the first uh, first stage SKA uh, dishes, uh, has provided the site, you know, power and data. So, so that's very fortunate because this is really remote, uh, in a remote part of the country where there's not much RFI, as I'll show, you know, I think, on the next slide. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the Swiss are developing and the GPU correlator, and they've also secured funding for the uh, back-end science data processing units, so to the Pulsar search engine, the uh, FRB and hydrogen absorber search engine, the cosmology processing units. And then McGill is also providing uh, funding for the ice sports, as mentioned. Uh, and we've uh, yeah, secured funding from the National Research Foundation and most more recently also from the Simons Foundation. So we're quite excited with you know, the various collaboration partners and the momentum we've now, you know, now achieved. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got sufficient budget to build up to 256 dishes, but that will be in a staged approach. Uh, location, that's very important. Uh, so we're going to be uh, near the uh, SKA, uh, so in the uh, South African Kuru site. Uh, we've got an agreement in place to have, you know, to lease the site until 2030, so we have enough time to carry out our surveys. There's existing infrastructure, so, you know, the picture shows in the middle, for example, shows the road, roads that uh, kind of uh, lead to Hyrax uh, from the near town, the uh, nearest town, which is Carnarvon. Uh, uh, there's a you know there's a, uh, 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 a, dear, a really uh, good data link, a power provision, and you know roads going to the site. It's actually en route for those who've been to the uh, Meerkat site or the SK site in South Africa. It's actually en route to Meerkat. So before um, you reach the Meerkat site, uh, so uh, the other important thing is now banned. Uh, uh, the site is uh, you know has exceptionally low RFI. So that's shown in the middle figure on the bottom. Uh, this is just a very, you know, it's not a very sensitive uh, survey of the RFI, but it shows that there's, you know, uh, hardly anything going on. Outside the band, there are strong lines from satellites, etc. But, you know, within this bandwidth, uh, this, the, you know, the, the band is very clean. Um, and that uh, is not just a coincidence. Uh, there's, uh, you know, government legislation in South Africa to protect this area from RFI. Uh, and then finally, uh, because we're in the south, uh, you know, we have access to the southern skies. And as I mentioned, in, uh, with the cross correlations, we have overlap with uh, you know lots of sensitive CMB and galaxy uh, surveys. Um, in terms of the design plan, I've spoken a bit about this, but uh, essentially we're going to have these uh, six meter reflectors, uh, focal ratio of 0.21. Um, we're then going to uh, there's a clover leaf, uh, uh, clover leaf dual polarized feed that then uh, you know the signal that gets converted to uh, to be transported over optical fiber. Um, we uh, then transfer the signal from the dishes about just under a kilometer to the back end where the containers are. And uh, the, the signal is then converted back to an RF signal, then fed into the F engine, which is the digitizer and channelizer. And that does the you know, data, data shuffle, basically, uh, so the corner turn. And then that's sent to the GPU engine, which is in a separate uh, container, actually. And all of this is... Uh, you know, all our hardware actually has to be RFI certified, so uh, we have to, you know, take a lot of measures to protect both the SKA and, and Meerkat, but ourselves from, uh, you know, RFI. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, just showing some pictures of, you know, various uh, components. So the X engineer in particular is the one you know, that will be deployed from Switzerland, and uh, this is actually an image of uh, the F engine for Chime, but uh, you know, our, as we build up to the 1024, uh, we'll grow the F engine. And these are based on these ice folds that, you know, uh, Matt Dobbs group has developed. 
and then there's a RFO fiber transmitter and receiver system. And then these are just two pictures of some prototyping dishes that we built. We've now decided to go with composite dishes, uh, but with a focal ratio of 0.21. And here's a picture of the uh, clover leaf uh, feed, which is uh, you know basically uh, inherited and developed further from the chime design. Uh, and so, just talking about chime, there's complementarity with chime, and uh, this also applies to cord as well. Uh, the chime has cylinders, whereas Hydex will have dishes. There's different systematics. In particular, we, you know, as I mentioned, we're pushing to protect uh, or shield the feeds from each other, so we don't have this cross coupling. Um, we uh, will well, eventually with the 1024. Actually, with the 256, we'll have similar collecting area to chime, and then when we expand to 512 or 1024, it will be larger. Uh, the RFI is exquisite at the uh, site, it wouldn't expand. Uh, chime sees the whole sky uh, each day, whereas Hydex will be able to integrate deep, uh, you know, on narrow strips. The advantage of seeing the sky is that, you know, you can, uh, the fact that they have a large field of view means they can pick up uh, calibration sources. So, you know, calibration is then going to be a challenge. You know, for Hydex. Uh, we observe the southern skies uh, where there are more pulsars and uh, the optical and CMB surveys. So, uh, you know, cross correlation, uh, cross correlation science is, uh, is something we can do. Um, in terms of the schedule for the project, we're developing the test bed site. So, we're doing the project in stages as I described below, uh, but essentially, we want to develop the test bed site within the actually. I think the uh, the RFQ is going out has gone out already, and we expect the site to be developed in the next few months, and the main site by the end of the year. So on the test bed site, we will deploy two uh, of our the first qualification dishes, and the idea here is that uh, we will be able to verify the dish uh, precision. You know, is the surface accurate enough? Is it repeatable? Um, and then also measure the beams. So we uh, will be able to fly a drone with a source, a noise source, over these dishes because the Clairefontaine site is less uh, you know, stringent in terms of its RFI requirements. So we'll be able to map out our telescope beams and we'll be able to tell if we're meeting the specification required you know, for the remaining dishes. Once we've done that, we'll um, proceed to uh, construct the eight element prototype um, and that we'll do by the end of, the, of this year. And we'll observe uh, uh, for you know, an extended period to verify the RF performance and stability of the system. So we, you know, we have, we know that we've got our kind of analog chains in order. And uh, then once we know that, we'll move to uh, the, uh, commissioning the 128 element Pathfinder array. And at that stage, uh, that that array is large enough that uh, we, you know, can test out a redundant calibration approach. Uh, but it's not too large that we can't, uh, you know, we, the, we'll be able to store the data for about a month, the photo data, uncompressed data, uh, well, uncompressed in terms of uh, redundancy, uh, and then we will be able to compare redundant uh, uh, calibration approaches to that. That's very important if we're going to proceed, uh, you know, to proceed beyond this, we won't be able to handle the data rate if uh, we can't uh, redundantly calibrate. So just to give uh, some more insight into that, the idea is that uh, you know base uh, baselines that have the same length and orientation, of which there are many, uh, you know, of, uh, for a given separation, um, we should see the same signal on the sky. And we're working very hard to uh, try to ensure that the baselines are as redundant as possible. I'll talk about simulations we've done uh, to you know model this um, uh, so that it doesn't affect our cosmology. So. Uh, under the assumption that these baselines, and you know, this will be verified by the data, that these baselines are redundant, we can then compress. So uh, just using the 1,000 uh, element array as an example, the data rate there is about 6.5 terabits a second. Um, if you average over 10 second intervals, you're looking at about 300 terabytes a day. Uh, that's uh, you know um, two orders of magnitude too much for us. Uh, we can pull data off the site at about one terabyte a day. So that compression factor of about a few hundred comes from averaging uh, baselines, you know, that uh, that are redundant, that are the same. And but we need to verify that approach. So this one twenty eight element pathfinder array is going to be key to doing that. Uh, so I'll move on now uh, to uh, dark energy, uh, the dark energy cosmology we hope to do with Hyrax. So shown here is a figure from Bull et al. Uh, showing the range of scales that interferometers access 
first single dish, uh, first single dishes. So they are going to be uh, single dish, um, uh, you know, experiments. For example, uh, meerkat or bingo, uh, you know, will, uh, meerkat will observe in single dish mode as well. Uh, so there's a you know a project led by Mario Santos on meerkat to do this called Mere Class. But uh, in terms of interferometers, uh, uh, you know, to access the BAO scales, uh, you need a compact array like Hilux with the right uh, baseline lens. Uh, Meerkat, for example, in interferometer mode, uh, can't quite access the BAO scales. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, so I've given some specifications here in terms of our survey area, redshift coverage. Uh, so we plan to map out, as I mentioned, 15,000 square degrees. Uh, shown here are these uh, angular uh, scales, uh, angular modes, and then frequency modes, so line of sight modes and transverse modes uh, that we'll be able to access. Um, with the, by measuring Can the BAO. Uh, so, yeah, so we'll make a precise measurement of this matter power spectrum uh, in the BAO regime. So, shown here uh, are the measurements uh, you know, uh, compared to recent measurements from EBOS. Uh, and we basically aim to measure the so shown here is the forecast for the 256 array and the 1024. So we aim to measure the uh, you know uh, matter power spectrum or the 21 centimeter power spectrum out to uh, high redshift across a number of bins at the percent level. This then translates into competitive constraints on the uh, dark energy parameters. So uh, shown here uh, the numbers you know including Planck priors and compared to the current state of the art. Just to take a takeaway number is that Hyrax uh, 1024, four years, will give us a, a figure of merit for those who are familiar with that of about 300. Um, the foregrounds are a challenge. Uh, you know, they remove, uh, filtering using the spectral smoothness of the foregrounds and filtering removes these low K parallel modes. So this is from Shaw et al. Um, and what's, what's important, and maybe I'll end on this, unfortunately I haven't been able to get to the cross correlation stuff, is that um, if you know you need both precise, uh, precise knowledge of your instrument, but also of the sky, to uh, actually uh, you know detect the signal. Um, the signal we're interested in is this B B twenty B A twenty one. So this is in this uh, Shaw kind of formalism. Uh, the visibilities are just uh, a beam transfer function times the sky modes. And uh, the dominant, uh, the smooth, the kind of uh, model that you have without any uncertainties, you can filter out. But there are these leakage terms both in the sky and in the instrument. And so we spent a lot of time trying to uh, model uh, using simulations the instrument in terms of you know, beams and uh, pointing, uh, delays, gains, etc. And uh, uh, you know, we've got an end to end simulation uh, kind of uh, uh, tool that Devin Crichton has largely developed. Um, and that's allowed us to put specifications on. So here are some kind of uh, results in terms of the kind of signal to noise we expect, but it also allows us to set constraints on kind of deviations from, uh, you know, the nominal instruments. So, for example, a focus placement in the Z direction, you know, we expect that we have to be well, uh, you know, within 10 millimeters in the Z direction, and many of our constraints, you know, are at the millimeter level. So that's, uh, you know, that's the specifications we've set uh, for the instrument to be both, both in terms of the dishes, but also the foundations, etc. Um, I should, uh, yeah, I had some slides on cross correlations and I had some interesting results there. But I, given the you know, uh, lack of time, I think maybe I can stop there. So, thank you. So, we have time for some questions. Uh, hi, Kavi. Great talk. Saurabh here. Um, so, in addition to uh, checking for the redundant calibration for the 128 prototype, uh, uh, what are the potential uh, science goals that's possible with that, the Pathfinder experiment? Yeah, so we um, we expect we can make uh, uh, many sigma, probably 10 to 20 sigma measurement of the 21 centimeter power spectrum uh, with uh, something like six, six months of uh, data. So I think the immediate goals would be to target an area where we can cross-correlate with a spectroscopic survey, so probably DESI or uh, something similar, uh, try to make a cross-correlation measurement, and then um, uh, uh, basically try to use that maybe to calibrate our transfer function, uh, try to understand our calibration, but uh, also then try to make an uh, you know, auto-spectrum uh, detection. So we are, we are aiming you know, to make a, a detection. Uh, in addition, obviously, to doing uh, testing out our calibration techniques. 
uh, yeah, and then there's obviously a lot of potential for other cross correlation science, you know, like uh, cross correlation with other surveys. Sorry, your follow up questions uh, on the um, coupling, uh, given, given the dishes are going to be very closely spaced and the feeds probably high up. So, is there a simulation of the kind of mutual coupling that you'd expect, and if that uh, that had would have any impact in some of the K modes? Yes. Uh, so, in fact, the, the feeds are not high up, uh, relatively speaking. They're actually buried in the dish. So, our focal ratio is you know point two five means they level with the uh, dish, but it's actually point two one. So, they're actually going to be somewhat. You know, these are somewhat deep dishes. Okay. Of course, they they will be still coupling. Uh, but uh, we have been doing simulations. So actually, we've been working on this with uh, uh, the group at Cambridge, uh, who've done the similar simulations for Hera. So they've uh, adapted their simulations to do this for Hyrax. And we've also started a collaboration with people at the Simons Foundation. Uh, so Leslie Greengard, who's you know well known for these electromagnetic, uh, uh, this fast multiple method. So he and his group they're also looking at this problem. So we're kind of working together to try to understand both from a design perspective, but also from a calibration perspective, you know, how, how relevant, how important uh, the uh, cross-coupling is. From first uh, glance, it looks like, you know, uh, uh, this design actually, you know, may be sufficient to allow us to suppress that cross-coupling, but uh, we need to quantify that in more detail. Great. Thanks. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Kavalin for a nice talk. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Dobbs. I build cutting edge telescopes, and uh, it's the interfaces that are the problems. It's always the interfaces. Um, it's, it's, I feel right at home being here at, at the Raven Institute. Um, I feel like I know the place really, really well, because the fingerprint of any institute is the people that, that do the science here, and even more importantly, the people that are produced by the scientists here and go out around the world. And I've had the great pleasure of hosting and learning from uh, uh, many, uh, several postdocs and graduate students that have come through here and, and, and come through other institutes here in India. So showing up here, seeing the place, eating the food, meeting the other people has felt uh, uh, very warm. And uh, there's been nothing unexpected knowing the high caliber of, of the others I've, I've met. So uh, thank you. Um, in the first talk, um, Akito's day one discussion had a lot of us talking about the killer app for cosmology, and some of us wanted to be able to do it for less than a billion dollars. And so one of the things I'm going to try to convince you is that there's some probability space where these experiments that I'm going to describe today, Chime and Cord, are part of that killer future app, or at least part of the stepping stone to get there along the way. We've talked so much about 21 centimeter cosmology about intensity mapping. And I just want to remind us all that here today, we're sitting down here at the present universe. As cosmologists, this is like right here, right now. And we're talking about a, a imaging a universe in 21 centimeter, looking for the neutral hydrogen in a, in a universe that's largely ionized. So it seems like the signal should be small. The signal should be 100 times smaller because that's all the neutral hydrogen that there is in the universe. But we've moved out to higher frequency and the foregrounds, which are largely produced by synchrotron, are smaller as well. And so the ratio of the signal that I'm trying to measure on the sky and the ratio of those horrible foregrounds that are plaguing us all is about the same here in the universe as it is at the reionization era. So our challenges aren't, aren't less. Our challenges are, are similar. Now, trying to image the matter power spectrum, see the BAO, we actually have a great, great advantage at this red, redshift compared to the higher redshifts because we really know what the signal looks like. The angular power scale of the matter spectrum on the sky is something where we know where roughly the first peak should be, the second peak, and the third peak. So when I go out and design my experiment, I know what I'm trying to look for as a Fourier transform on the sky. So in some ways, when I try to evolve the field of 21 centimeter intensity mapping, he, us with CHIME and these low redshift experiments, we're grabbing the low hanging fruit. Because while the signals to foregrounds are just as challenging, the, the scales, the physical scales on the sky are relatively well known. So I like to think as well that as we make some progress here, that progress helps the high redshift case as well. Fortunately, I can make up a little bit of time because uh, the, the, the introduction of what intensity mapping is and, uh, and how it's just OK to smear out the sky with a large beam has already been covered. I do, do just want to emphasize the scales here. So in, in terms of uh, the size of the first peak of the baryon acoustic oscillations on the sky, at high redshift, it's about one degree. And at low redshift, 
closer to me, it's about three degrees. So we're going from redshift 0.8 to 2.5, just like in, in, in Cavi's talk. And looking along the, si the line of sight, of course those wiggles are there as well, and they span about 12 megahertz at our highest redshift, and about 20 megahertz at the lowest. Check it out, nature is not kind. When I build a telescope of a fixed size, I have the best angular resolution at high frequency, and the worst angular resolution at low frequency. And so, you know, my challenge is really to build a telescope that's big enough to catch the angular scales of the, the high redshift that I choose, choose to go after. Now, of course, the, the telescope I'm going to focus on for the first half of this talk is the CHIME telescope. And it looks a little different from so many telescopes that we've all looked through. We've chosen to build cylinders. And really, a cylinder is just a one-dimensional version of the field of antennas that make up the LWA, or an experiment that we would have if I had enough money to, instead of just populating a field, uh, feed line with antennas, but actually populating a whole, whole field. Okay? So this is what, what CHIME looks like. And we're in this, this beautiful uh, region of, of Canada in the west, near, uh, at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. And this part exists today, the CHIME telescope. And the CORD telescope is what we're building now right beside it. In addition to CHIME, the core element, we're also building two outrigger sites, stations to give us very long baseline interferometry, which is going to be really exciting for fast radioverse cosmology and completely irrelevant for 21 centimeter cosmology. We have a relatively small and, and uh, uh, agile team uh, consisting of, of the universities and institutes in Canada that, that got the first funding for it, but we've grown and blossomed as, as our, our students and postdocs have gone out and populated little bits of the world. We're, we're very uh, lucky to have Sorab, uh, Sorab and Triharsh as well as, 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 as we, we bring on uh, expertise from, from this continent and the great experience here. So let's just take a moment and see how this cylindrical telescope looks at the sky. I'm going to paint one dish. This is 20 meters in diameter and about 100 meters long, and I'll put just one antenna on it. So I've oriented my dish north-south, so my antenna then is looking down at a flat mirror in the north-south direction, and it sees the whole overhead sky in that direction. In the east-west direction, I have a dish that focuses the light up on a narrow strip in the sky. So once I look up at the sky, I see something like this through each and every feed separately. And since we're at about 49 degrees latitude, the north celestial pole there sits towards the top of our beam. We have a different observing depth at each elevation. When I look at the North Celestial Pole, I see it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when I look down here at the bottom of my beam, it sweeps through in about 20 minutes. So let's take that with my just one feed and one single uh, cylinder, and I'm going to put, as an example, 16 feeds down. That gives me enough degrees of freedom, enough information to take my beam and divide it up into 16 uh, 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 unique elements. And I can build four cylinders across and divide it up in the other direction as well. Now, for our fast radio burst science, that's exactly what we do. We form beams. For our cosmology, we need to do our, our calibration with as much precision as we can. So we actually do full N squared uh, a correlation and calibration as well. Behind this telescope, we have three different back ends, three different experiments running. The first one is what we call the cosmology back end, and it's doing the full N squared correlation. There's about 210 terabytes a day flowing through it. We do apply a calibration in real time, which is to take every baseline that is the same, calibrate them with respect to each other, then add them together before we write them to the S. If we get that wrong, we can never undo it. We keep all of the unique baselines, though, on disk, and we can recalibrate and, and, and take those apart separately. We also have a pulsar timing backend. So these, this is a beam that we program. We sync up in different directions, and we follow sources across the sky to measure pulsars, to follow repeating fast radio bursts, and so forth. And then, then finally, probably the most pro, uh, prolific in, in terms of science papers of our back ends is the fast radio burst back end that is basically watching a movie of the sky at very fast time resolution. And every time there's a ping, a pop, or a bang, we trigger on it. We realize that 99% of the time it's RFI or other garbage. We know where all the airplanes are and the satellites. We throw that away. And if there's a big dispersion measure, we write that to disk. Seems like I'm just talking about hardware and technology. But everything here is just the people behind it, and everyone that designed and built Chime is, is on, on the academic train, and almost everyone that's done all the work is a trainee, a postdoc, a graduate student, and so forth. This is the sky according to Chime. So early in the morning, uh, well, early in the morning, the, the uh, uh, well, in the middle of the night here at, at, 12, at 12 midnight, we see that stripe overhead, and one of the ways we like to look at our, our data is in, in this form, a ring map. 
So the North Celestial Pole is, is about here and it's constant. It's there all day. Down here looking way to the south is the sun. It rises. It's directly overhead at noon and oh, it has a lot of side lobe response. This is just a dirty map and we're going to have to deal with that by knowing our, our beam. At this particular wavelength, when we look down towards the sun, our feeds are far enough apart that we don't Nyquist sample the, the wave. And so there's an alias version of the sun that pops up here. We also see other bright sources like Sige and Casse. We like those sources because that's our only way to calibrate. But their response function can be quite challenging as well to, to remove. Um, the, uh, the results I'm, I'm about to show you are, are cross-correlation uh, galaxy uh, of results. We've, we've, looked up, we've looked up the location of quasars, ELGs, and, and LRGs that, that span the full uh, a redshift range of, of, of Chime and actually span a great deal of our maps. So the background is the sky according to, to Chime and these shaded regions are the locations of these, these uh, uh, galaxy sources. Hamza said the future lies in synergy. The future here is in one of our simpler synergies because the reality is we don't understand our beam well enough yet to make the measurement I'm about to show you in autocorrelation with our data alone. We have to rely on others to give us a hint as, as to where the hydrogen is. What we do is we take each object in, in that catalog, we pick the pixel on the night sky where that object should be in Chime, and then we look up the redshift and we go to the frequency that corresponds to the redshift of that, that quasar. We then, then shift it exactly as, as, as was explained earlier, to a zero uh, frequency, and then we add up all 30 or so, so thousand of those. When we do that, we see a great big booming uh, a signal, and I don't need to go into much detail because, uh, uh, unfortunately, Sheev showed uh, much of this earlier. And I must say, you were so kind when the first detection of this was made uh, several years ago, seeing stacked 21 uh, uh, centimeter galaxies, and us, us coming a couple years later to see essentially the same thing. Uh, it was uh, a, a kind to give it such, such attention. Um, so an, an open, open invitation. The cross correlations that are available to us are enormous. Our data is complicated and hard and you have to be a ninja to manipulate that data. But there's a lot of prospects for us to work together to pull out other objects on the sky. We're about to release a new paper which is the cross correlation of our 21 uh, centimeter signal with uh, Lyman alpha. So that should be a negative correlation and, and we have a booming signal there. Now the way that we clean out our data so that the only thing we see is not just our galaxy in the synchrotron, right now is we apply a fairly simple delay spectrum cut. We basically take our, our data through any visibility, we cross-correlate it with itself with a time shift, and we require that the signal has enough fluctuations in it that there's still power when that delay is quite far away. And if, if you plot the delay spectrum map, uh, um, it, it looks something like this. Oh. You can see all four of our cylinders. There's light that comes in and bounces off one cylinder or one feed, crosses the experiment, and is absorbed by, by uh, the other feed. You can see our side lobe structure. And actually, in this version of our data analysis, we're not taking into account the side lobe structure or all the information we have at our beam yet. That's a work in progress, and we're going to have to do that to, to really pull out the 21 uh, centimeter signal where, where we'd like to see it. Now, the spatial scales that we're probing here, this is k perpendicular, this is a, 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 a k parallel. The spatial scales that are left looks like it's a great big portion of this map. I can plot it in any direction up, up and down. But the baryon acoustic oscillations are down here. Here's the first peak, the second peak, and, and the third peak. So um, as Leon said the first day about Nicole's power spectrum, maybe very nice, but here we're not there yet. We, we aren't even, we've turned off all the data that probes, probes the BAO. And the reality is we can't get there until we understand our beam perfectly. And this is some of the differences in what we focus on. 99% of all of our effort and time, all of our lost sleep, and everything else we, we, we do it is, is trying to understand how our telescope sees the sky. One of the ways we, we do that is we have to, we'd like to trace lines across our, our beam. We would like to trace lines in both directions. And unfortunately, there's only one astrophysical object that rises and sets through our beam, and that's the sun. And that's one of the main ways that we pick out the large scale structure in our beam. This is our beam uh, by looking at the sun across a full year, in, in uh, winter all the way up to summer as it, it, it traverses our beam. We take that in the south half. We assume that our beam is symmetric to the north half, 
and apply that as well. This, uh, this sort of fidelity of our beam measurement is not in the results that I just showed you. Uh, uh, Sorb's done a beautiful analysis together with, with Gary Hinshaw and others to understand and measure our beam as a function of frequency and as, as a function of north-south. This movie is running through the different uh, uh, frequencies. There is a lot of structure in our beam. What we see, the chromaticity of our beam, is quite large. And you expect that for any telescope that has a feed, every telescope, because light comes in and it does what it should. It bounces off the dish, it comes to the feed, but a precious little bit of it is reflected off the feed and hits the cylinder again and bounces up, and that happens multiple times. So that can be a very challenging thing and adds a lot of chromaticity to our beam. This sort of effect, the differences north to south and a, a difference with frequency, I claim is no problem at all if you know it perfectly. Of course, when it has such character and personality, it's hard to know it perfectly. So we would like to have a very clean beam, not because we need it clean. If we fully model our beam, it doesn't matter. We need a clean beam because it's going to be a lot easier to measure. Um, so uh, when, when, when we add up all of the, those, uh, when we add up the 21 uh, centimeter signal in uh, uh, where, where all of the quasars here, you end up with a, a map like this, the best foot model and, and the residual. Uh, Shiv uh, said when he was talking about the Meerkat autocorrelation, again, you are in the territory where you didn't want to be. This is an exciting result for us because it proves that we can do intensity mapping. It proves that we can see hydrogen on the sky. It is a stepping stone to where we want to be because we aren't at the angular scales yet where the cosmology is of most interest. There is more coming, on, on, uh, there's more coming out on this soon, certainly with the Lyman alpha uh, uh, cross correlation, and we're making rapid progress on our, our autocorrelation using the best knowledge we have now of our beam. Let's transition quickly uh, to, to another topic I, I, I want to emphasize, perhaps a future killer app. Of course, there are fast radio bursts, transients that are going off in the night sky, 10,000 of them per night. And Chime, with its huge beam on the night sky, 200 square degrees, collects a few of them per day. And those are exciting. They're astrophysically exciting. They're exciting because they're probes of the, uh, of, of the structure of the universe between us and them. The world really changed in fast radio burst science when, when Chime turned on. Uh, the state of, of FRB knowledge there was a few events, the colored sources here. And then once we, we released our first catalog uh, a few years ago, embarrassingly now, there were more than 500 sources known. And today we have many thousands that we're preparing and trying to understand. When we were talking about our killer apps, Whaley volunteered that FRB cosmology might be that low cost app. Uh, the bonus here is that it's completely free with respect, of what, uh, uh, with respect to the other things we're doing. I didn't ask him to say that. Let me show you just one thing, the thing that I'm perhaps most excited about in terms of FRB cosmology. We can build a bigger telescope by putting a lens far away, a gravitational lens, and what happens is a fast radio burst goes off. First of all, as an astronomer, I love it because the radio sky is complicated, but I have a signal that turns on for a millisecond or a few and goes away. So it's really easy for me to, do, to isolate that signal from everything else. And it has a fingerprint that's really precise. When there's an object that sits in between, of course, the light can bend around it through, through multiple paths, usually just exactly two of them. All of the gravitational lensing that you've seen in your life is intensity, light over here and light over here, that someone measures how bright it is. And there's a delay between it. Or there's a spatial separation on the sky. OK, take that away, because this is entirely different. We are not going to look for things that are separate on the sky because we're sensitive to gravitational lenses that are tiny, 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 a solar mass. And so the time delays that are impart imparted are really, really small. So imagine I have a radio signal, a voltage that's oscillating up and down, and I do that same time correlation. I take my data and I multiply it with itself with a time lag. As I sweep that across my data, I get a huge autocorrelation. And then here, once it comes across the next signal, I get a huge correlation as well. Note that what I'm doing is I'm measuring whether this radio signal is exactly the same waveform as that one. I'm not comparing whether the same intensity. I have all sorts of repeating fast radio bursts that go bloop, bloop. And some people say, well, bloop, bloop, that could be a gravitational lens. I don't believe them. I don't know. But if I cross-correlate this and I see that it is the same waveform, the music that's on is the same, you're going to believe me you're going to know that that is one coherent signal taking two paths through space. So in strong lensing, you look up at the sky, you see beautiful Einstein rings, you teach GR to your students, and it's wonderful. And you're looking at time delays of months to years. 
In microlensing, which has really come of age, you're looking at time scales that is days to months. With fast radio transients, I cross-correlate this thing, I sample at a nanosecond, and I could see differences that are nanosecond in delay. For us on our telescope, because light can bounce through it, I restrict myself to more than 100 nanoseconds. And I can go out to millisecond type scale and still have the coherence. So I'm probing very different scales on the night sky. I'm looking for masses that are a solar mass, a rogue planet, a rogue star, a primordial black hole. I'm not looking for galaxies or galaxy clusters. And that's exciting. The framework to search for this was way harder than we thought. I described it, described it just like that to a graduate student, thought, oh, in a week we'll, we'll figure this out. There were a lot more details, but, but we, we've, 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 written a, a, we've written a paper on it. We processed about 100 events so far, and we found one booming signal. We did a blind analysis, we opened the box, there was one there. Unfortunately, when we looked at that signal in more detail, we're quite sure that this is not a gravitational lens, which would be achromatic, the same for all frequencies, but instead, instead it's a plasma lens. Um, which is different at, at different uh, frequencies. So we like this because we've shown you that we can find lenses. We just didn't find the type of lens that we'd like. Most theories, it becomes really interesting when you cross about a hundred or a few hundred events. And uh, we're, 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 we're working on, on that right now. Um, with this, we can also place constraints on primordial black holes, of course. If we see something, that's a measure of how many of these objects there are. If we don't see something, it's a bit harder. We have to really calculate carefully the decoherence and things, and that, that takes some effort. There's a lot of caveats in, in the new limits that we placed, um, but we can do that as well. Okay, let's go on to the next stage, the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector, which is where we're evolving to after uh, Chime. Um, this looks very much like the beautiful picture that, 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 that Cavi showed. And I can't wait for a world where we're covering the southern sky with Hyrax and the northern sky with, with Cord, when we're exchanging people back and forth to learn from each other and, 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 and learn about each other's analyses. Um, Cord is, 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 is going to sit right beside uh, Chime. So this is the Chime telescope. Here's Cord. It's about double, double the collecting area. And it has two outrigger stations as well for fast radio transient science and then borrows a, a, a lot of the heritage uh, from Chime. So um, in addition to uh, the stuff we've learned uh, from Chime, we've developed uh, a new way to manufacture, to manufacture dishes and a very broadband feed. And that's part of the, uh, 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 the magic four cord. The really important part though is that we're able to build and design cord really quickly because we have this army of people that were trained on Chime putting it together and are, are, are ready to go uh, for this. The key science that we're after, fast radio transients in 21 centimeter are everything for our project. We designed the project around that. But when we made our proposal to the government to build cord, we included the funds this time to support the other science which can happen with the same telescope. So think of us as a dedicated experiment designed for the same things as Chime. But this time we're putting a lot of effort in to make sure that we can feed data out for cosmic, cosmic magnetism, for probing the very fine angular scale uh, power spectrum, uh, for, 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 for pulsars, uh, searching for exotic, exotic pulsars, and so on. In terms of a figure of merit, and if, you, if, if, if you want to add things up, we have double the collecting area of Chime, three times the bandwidth. We're going from 300 megahertz to 1500, and our noise is about square root two lower. If you multiply those things together as some figure of merit that is the thing I care about, but it depends on, on your science, uh, you have about a factor of 10 improvement over Chime. It is different. We aren't going to turn off Chime. Chime sees a lot of the sky. It's a wide field in instrument. And Cord, with its six meter dishes, is zooming in on a narrower strip. So think of like the particle, uh, the early particle physics. You build the SPS and you produce W bosons and you discover them for the first time. And then you come back with LEP and you build a precision machine to measure the parameters. This is the precision machine, especially for, for fast radio transients. And Chime is the big proton collider that sees a big mess on the sky, uh, but sees it fast and first. Um, yesterday, Josh, when he was talking about Hera, dreamed of the future incarna incarnation. And he said the recipe for power spectrum happiness, I changed his words a little, um, is, a redundant, is a very redundant, very precise beams on the sky. And we have fully converged. When, he, when these guys designed Hera and we designed Chime with cylinders, they went for something where they could do a delay spectrum at a certain level, but didn't care about the floppy, floppiness of their mesh. We've now converged, I think, if he represents the, represents the community there. We've converged. We both agreed we were perhaps a little bit wrong, and then come towards something which is uh, a, a precision beams on the sky. 
Um, so, so, so at, at the NRC, at, at DRAO, they've developed, uh, 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 they've gone through this process of the deep dish development. And, 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 and we've now built three six meter dishes and we've ha had them on, on the sky now for, for a little while. I'm almost done. Uh, so, so that's one of our, 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 our key, key technologies. Um, the other key technology is the wideband feed so that we can see a much broader, a much broader regime on the sky. We've also spent a lot of time uh, developing a new prototype to, to replace the ICE system so that we can directly digitize all of the uh, information across that, that wide band. Um, so if there's, if there's something I love to talk about, it's anything to do with FPGA signal processing. So if you have no one to talk to at, at coffee time and you want to talk about that, I am your person. I'll show you just some, some quick images of, of, of the development array. This is our uh, one of two versions of, of the foundation that, that that we built. The mount here allows us to change in elevation, but we actually do that manually. So we're, we're, we are going to have a pointing strategy. We're going to choose whether we look low in the sky or high, and then we can go and change, change to different elevations. It's going to take us about 10 days of labor to go and repoint the array. So of course, we'll choose to do that relatively slow, slowly. Oh no, we're in Canada. So we have to have a dome, uh, a ray dome on top to keep the snow out. In all of our development, uh, this was probably the most spectacular failure. We were smart enough to do it early and put, put one on. We got the biggest snowfall in the last 15 years at the DRO and it collapsed. So we've redesigned that as well. Just a, a, a view of the dish itself. I've talked so much about these precision dishes, but actually over at our outrigger sites, there's no reason to have precision at all because that's only for the fast radio burst science. So one of the things I'm interested in exploring, if anyone has a dish factory in their backyard or experience with that, as I know there is here, here in India, is, is the possibility of building less lower precision dishes that are, that are easier to ship and using those for our outrigger sites. The timeline for our experiment, we're, we're, we're turning on a very small version with 60, 64 dishes. This is like the motivation to get the software chain so it works when, when the full array comes on. Uh, 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 that's that's meant, meant to turn on midway through next year in, in 20, 2023. We broke ground about four months ago for a big facility to fab, fab the dishes in. And uh, the first light is expected in 2025. I'm going to just show my conclusions because I think I've used more than the time I have. Thanks, Matt. So we have time for two questions. Thanks, Matt. That was very exciting. Uh, I was wondering if, um, presumably, when you mentioned about uh, lower um, mass black holes and these lenses that are expected, uh, is the idea that you already are probably sitting on data that has detected this and you need to dig through it, is that the idea? Or oh, no, no. I, I did not mean to say that I know that we have a detection at all. I understand. Yeah. yeah. And we did our first analysis blind uh, with 100 events. And we have, uh, oh, I'm not going to get the number. We have several thousand events, but we didn't have our, there's this baseband buffer. We record, we record the voltages that we turned on later in the project. So it's a lower number of that, but scale of thousands. And we haven't analyzed those events yet. And we are going to do it where we refine our analysis. We understand uh, the plasma lenses and then run it through the whole thing and finally look. So it's not the case that I know the answer. And I won't know the answer till, till then. Yeah. Sure. But, um this is going to be using archival data. There's nothing in the pipeline that's kind of thrown away some events that could potentially have looked similar. I'm just asking the way these pipelines go, right? No, yeah. So, so we, we trigger on anything that we th think might be FRB-like. And this is a second order thing, right? We, we get an FRB, and of all the FRB data, we search within that data for, for a second copy of the image. So yes, if, if it's out there on the sky and our telescope saw it, and it's above signal to noise of nine, which is our, our trigger th threshold, we have that in the can and we should, be able to, we should be able to discover it. So your beam for Chime is terrible. Oh my god, it's, 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 <laughs> it's doing it a lot character. of... It has character. Yeah, it has character. Um, so is it temporally varying? at all? Or is it stable in time, hypothetically? Or is it the reflections caused yeah, toward no. temporal so, so variation? One of the things we've done better than we anticipated, better than our design spec, is our, 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 our uh, calibration with time. So, so after we built Chime, we came back and retroactively put in a noise source. We created noise, and we broadcast it to, to each uh, one part of our correlator for, for each element. And we're able to very well uh, to calibrate that, that very well. And then we have sources on the sky that, that we use to measure the forward complex gain. Mm -hmm. We get that about three times better than our design spec. 
and our design spec was that we had to have that variation less than 1%. Largely that design is a little bit easier than the beam because much of that comes in as random fluctuations and integrates down. So we're better than we planned and it's not, you know, it wasn't the most important thing. The beam isn't, isn't that terrible. It's getting to know it. And I really need to emphasize that in the analysis that I've shown so far, we aren't putting in that knowledge of the beam yet. It, 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 it's not just not important when you're looking at a point source in cross, uh, cross correlation, mm -hmm. but it's extremely important in the power spectrum. Right. And our, uh, the level to which our noise is integrating down to what we expect from the radiometer equation is, is actually really good. It's like one and a half right now or something. So we, we are uh, underperforming what we wish we could have been doing at proposal time and maybe overperforming with respect to some other efforts at it. Well, I mean, that's. That's great, though, because then um, hypothetically you can continue. If, it, if the beam was temporarily... <laughs> when, when your noise is one and a half times what you expect there, it depends what the source of, of that is. If, we, right. if, we, if we've hit the systematic limit, we've, we've hit it. We already know that our contamination from our bad beam is the main thing, and we have, our progress on the beam is, is, is continuing quickly. So you know, our, our, our main direction is to measure and understand that beam better. If right. someone could just take planet Earth and tilt it the other way for a few days, it would really, really help. Yeah, no. Uh, so I have a very naive question. So uh, why it turns out that uh, a cylindrical telescope is good for FRBs? Is what? It is uh, good for FRBs, not uh, the... Um, it's just because it allows us to see so much of the sky. So our, our, our field of view is 200 square degrees, and our search ability basically is proportional to our sensitivity times the field, field of view. The perfect FRB machine that you could ever imagine would be you would take our cylinders, you'd fold them down so that it wasn't curved up, and you'd populate uh, a, 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 a two-dimensional uh, a feed array. Then we'd see the whole sky like Nicole does, like, like others do, uh, like antenna arrays do. Uh, and then it would be great if only we had enough collecting area and you know enough money to correlate all of those signals. So you know it's been really good to see uh, certainly the brightest FRBs. With Cord, we're actually you know it seems counterintuitive, and we're doing the opposite of what Whaley and Taiwan are doing, where where they, they are building that those field that field of antennas, but they're going to have very little sensitivity to dim far away FRBs. They're going for the super bright ones, and we're going the opposite direction. I want to do the precision FRB science, and we're zooming in and going really deep. And I hope to see FRBs on, 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 on the other side of the universe, or maybe they'll be too dim to see, but every once in a while there'll be a galaxy cluster in front of them, and I'll get a factor of you know, hundreds of, of, of magnification to see those. Thanks, Matt. Our next speaker is Nassim Kanekar. Fine. So I'm going to be telling you about H1 and galaxies at Cosmic Noon, and this is the GMRT CATS1 survey. The work has been predominantly done by Aditya Chaudhary, who finished his PhD last year, with me and Jairam, and then Bornali, Shiv, and Dwarka have been involved uh, at various stages uh, of the project. And just to emphasize that this talk is about galaxies and not about cosmology, I am not a cosmologist, damn it. Uh, I thought I'd show you a cartoon of a galaxy rather than, you know, this expansion of the universe that you keep hearing about. So that's a galaxy, and the galaxy is that small little kid in the center of this image. This is about 500 kiloparsecs. And just to emphasize the point that what matters for galaxies is not just the disk of the galaxy. It's the ecosystem of a galaxy. And that includes, it includes the circumgalactic medium. So, so the life cycle of a galaxy involves accretion of gas from the circumgalactic medium, uh, condensation of gas, of ionized gas, onto, into the atomic hydrogen phase on the disk of the galaxy, cooling of that uh, H1, to form H2, perhaps via transition through cold H1, uh, fragmentation of H2 to form stars, and then the stars go boom, and they chuck metals into the ISM. They also drive out outflows into the CGM. The outflows can quench star formation in galaxies, and they can also pull back gas from the CGM and trigger star formation again. So that's kind of the life, the life cycle, if you like, of a galaxy. So that's, what, that's the picture that we have of galaxies, and we have some amount of evidence for this, for this picture, but the bulk of the, I'm not sure why that pointer is still there, okay. The bulk of the evidence that we have is for the constituents of the disk. And these are the stars where, of course, we can observe them, the ultraviolet, H alpha, near infrared, basically every band that you have, you can observe the stars in. The near IR, mid IR are good for stellar mass, and the rest for the star formation rate, the star formation history. For the molecular gas mass, which is the proximate fuel for star formation, 
we typically use CO rotational lines. And with ALMA, we now found a whole bunch of CO detections in high redshift galaxies. This was very difficult until a few years ago in normal galaxies. The H1 mass, which is the primary fuel for, for star formation, our only probe today, as Schiff pointed out, is 21 centimeter emission. And that's going to be the focus of the talk. I'll tell you a little bit about stars and a little bit about, uh, maybe a lot more about uh, H1. So we've had about 25 years of fairly intense work on high redshift uh, studies of stars and galaxies, triggered by one, the HST and Keck and VLT coming online in the 90s, and then the realization that you can use the Lyman Drake technique to find high redshift galaxies. So I'm going to summarize 25 years worth of you know, our superb work in, in a couple of slides, <laughs> describing uh, stars and galaxies. The first thing you should take away about stars and galaxies is that they follow 90% of the star formation of the universe happens in what is called the main sequence. And which kind of is the relation between star formation rate and stellar mass? It's, it used to be thought to be a power law, but it, there's evidence now that it flattens at high stellar masses. And the thing that you should also take away is that there is evidence, we have strong evidence of cosmic downsizing. This is a little artificial in this figure because they've chosen to kind of separate the, the, the different main sequences. So that's the main sequence of redshifts of six, and that's the main sequence today. And there's this actual transition that happens downwards, the amplitude of the main sequence, and also perhaps in the curvature of the main sequence. And this shows the, the, the delta star formation for each of these curves relative to the fit, and the, the offsets are of the order of uh, 0.3 dex, so fairly small, reasonably good a relation between the star formation rate and the stellar mass. So that, that, gives, that describes things in galaxies. Besides that, we also have evidence for what happens with the evolution of star formation activity in the universe. Via what is called the star formation rate density, the cosmic SFR density, it's solar masses per year per cubic megaparsec cubed, where we have evidence now that the star formation rate density rises from redshifts of about eight to a redshift of about three, and then goes flat. And there's a speed of about redshifts of one to three where the star formation activity in the universe is at its peak. We still don't know why this goes flat over here. We have some physical reasons why this can be, why this, this can be explained. And then, from around a redshift of one to today, over the last eight billion years, there's a steep decline in the star formation rate density. Note that this is a log plot, and so this is by a factor of 10. So, st so galaxies today are forming stars at a much, much, much lower rate than they were eight billion years ago, by a factor of about 10. And so that's a picture we've had uh, of star formation. And we have known some version of this for at least 20 years now. Another thing that we've known more recently is which are the galaxies that cause this transition to happen. And you can do that by doing the same plot, but now in units of per unit, unit, so, per unit stellar mass. What's been done over here is to take two redshift bins, 1.1 to 1.5 and 0.8 to 1.1, both sides of this drop and just plotting SFR density per unit stellar mass. And what you see is that 85% of this drop in the SFR density between these two redshift ranges, blue is the high redshift, orange is the low redshift, happens for stellar masses larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses. So the high mass galaxies dominate the drop off in the star formation rate, rate density of the universe. So if you want to find reasons for why this happens, go look at them. So what do we know about, so we, you know, we know a ton of stuff about stars. What do we know about H1? And what would we like to know about H1? So, hello. Uh, so what do we know about H1 and galaxies? I like, I mean, I, I will admit, there's no reason to put this plot up, but I just like this plot. So this is a picture of NGC 6946 and stars, exactly. It's, this is Westerbock, right? <laughs> so this is 6946 and stars, and this is just a gorgeous Westerbock image. It's, it's about 192 hours of time for Denzel Boomsma's PhD thesis, and that's it in H1. And this is a tiny little object. It is, it is spectacular in stars as well. It's called the Fireworks Galaxy. It has tons of supernovae. But the H1 goes out way, way, way beyond. So galaxies are much bigger in H1 than in stars. So what do we know about galaxies in the nearby universe? We can measure their H1 mass from 21 centimeter. We can get their, their H1 size. We can get the depletion time scale, which is how fast the H1 is consumed. We can get the distribution of H1 across galaxies uh, embodied in the H1 mass function. We can get scaling relations uh, of galaxies. How does the H1 mass depend on various properties of the galaxy? We can get the dependence on the environment, looking at H1 and galaxies in field, clusters, groups, etc. We can get the Tully-Fisher relations. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. So wonderful, we know a lot about H1 in nearby galaxies. What do we know about H1 and high redshifts? At redshifts of, say, one. I have good news for you. We basically know zilch, as of a couple of years ago. So this, this is short. And now how do you get to a point where you know a little bit more than zilch about redshift one galaxies? 
There's basically three ways of doing it. One is you build a huge telescope. You know, you get your favorite billionaire to fund you, and you build a gigantic telescope, and that's one approach. It's a perfectly good approach. The speculometer arrays is following that approach. The next one is that you do ultra-deep integrations. So you spend thousands and thousands of hours integrating away, and Laduma and the Beatcat is an example of this. They're pushing out with about 3,500 hour integration to redshifts of 1.4. And the third approach is 21 centimeter stacking. And that's the one that we've been following. And each of these has advantages and disadvantages. Of course, you know, the square kilometer array has the big advantage of doing both of these, if you like. Laduma has the problem that even with a huge integration, you will never get to low H1 masses. You see the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. The stacking has the problem that you will see the average properties of galaxies, but not individual galaxies. So pros and cons, take your poison. How do we do stacking? So the way we do stacking is that somebody, a friend of yours, gives you a bunch of optical positions and redshifts of galaxies. And then each of these slices over here is a plane of the, of the 21 centimeter cube. And I've chosen to illustrate this via two things. One is a 2D thing where each galaxy, shown in the red circle, has its signal in, in one of the planes. And, uh, and so that's 2D stacking. And over here, uh, 1D stacking, where instead you take a spectrum through each, through each galaxy. In reality, of course, we don't do either 2D or 1D stacking. We do 3D stacking. We basically take a small cubelet around each galaxy, and then we stack the corresponding spaxels for, for, each, uh, for each galaxy. But that's what we will basically be doing. So we don't detect any of these galaxies, but you stack them. And as time goes by, you'll see a small thing uh, uh, appearing in the center over here and a feature appearing in the spectrum. That's the game. And then you can you know, do stuff. If, if you do detect the signal, you can maybe break up your, your sample into pieces via the properties, and maybe then do a characterization of the H1 properties, average H1 properties of galaxies on the basis of the stellar properties. And that's what you keep doing, and you can see this thing you know, steadily building up, and that goes on. What do you need? As I said, you need lots of galaxies within the primary beam and the redshift coverage. The line is really weak, right? So over here, you know, it stops at 400, you see the signal loud and clear, you need far more to get redshifts of one. The next thing you, you need is good optical positions, and that's easy, but what you really need is good optical redshifts, and that's actually hard. You need redshifts of accuracy of about 100 kilometers per second. You need to align the redshifts to better than 100 kilometers per second. That's a huge restriction on the kind of things you can do with uh, even low resolution spectroscopy. And of course, the corollary to all of this is that you, need, you want a large bandwidth, so you can cover a lot of redshifts, and you want a wide field of view, so you can cover a large region of the sky with, again, more galaxies. So we've been trying this out at the GMRT for about more than a decade now, with very little success. What changed was with the upgrade of the GMRT, about four years, which finished about four years ago. And so now we have three receivers, which are called band three, shown in blue as a function of frequency, band four and band five. I've plotted the sensitivity here as a function of frequency, and you can see the sensitivity is about flat. And the redshift coverage for 21 centimeters shown up over here, and that shows again the Madau plot uh, over here. And so we've been trying all three of these surveys at all three of these bands. And these are three surveys uh, that we've been doing over the last few years where the data analysis is more or less completed. So one is at band five, where we've done a deep single pointing on the, on the grot strip, covering a redshift of 0 to 0.42. We have redshifts from 0.2 to 0.42. The next one is what I'll be talking about today, which is a 510 hour survey of the, of the, band, of the deep two fields, seven fields, very large region in the sky, about 10 to the seven uh, megaparsec cubed, and covering this interesting redshift range of 0.74 to 1.45, and that's out over here, where you cover a part of this epoch of galaxy assembly, cosmic noon, and then a part of the decline of the SFR density. And then finally, we started off a survey at redshifts of about three, two and a half to three, 200 hours so far taken in the cosmos field, covering this uh, frequency range and this redshift range deep into the heart of the epoch of galaxy assembly. And I'll tell you primarily about this survey right now, and this has become possible because we have these new receivers and a new correlator with the 400 megahertz bandwidth. But the thing that we really needed for the survey was actually not merely our system. It was the fact that Sandy Faber, Mark Davison company had you know, kindly carried out the Deep 2 Galaxy survey about 20 years ago. That was done the Keck DMOS spectrograph, and they gave us redshifts for more than 30,000 galaxies in this redshift range, remarkably well matched to our frequency coverage. Not entirely by chance, because of course that redshift range is interesting for purposes of galaxy evolution. And they gave it to us in four sky regions. One region is, is the Grot Strip, 
The other three regions are here, and these are really nicely matched, and this is coincidence, to the GMRT primary beam. So what I've shown over here is seven pointings of the GMRT on these three sky regions, and the blue galaxies over here, or, or the colored galaxies over here, are the galaxies whose redshifts place the 21 centimeter, centimeter line within our frequency coverage. So we can basically observe 21 centimeter from all of the galaxies in these seven, in these colored uh, blue, orange, and green regions. And uh, the numbers are written down over here. It's about, you know, something like 1600 to about 2450. So, that's the, so the, the, the average is around 2000 galaxies per pointing. And as I said, we're covering this redshift range. The other thing that is really important about Deep 2 is that their redshift accuracy is 62 kilometers per second. They observe with a resolution of 5,000. They want to separate the O2 lines. This makes it perfect. It's really hard to get spectra of such quality for such a large number of galaxies, which is wonderful. And the, and the, and the redshifts are also, uh, I should mention this, based on the oxygen lines, not on Lyman alpha, which means that there's no intrinsic redshift uh, errors. So that's what we did. We went and chased after these seven objects. And I'll cut straight to the chase. That's what we saw. So this is after Shiv showed you an earlier version of this, of this figure in the, of, this, of the spectrum in the morning, which is from the 2020 paper. This is now after 510 hours. That was from 90 hours of data. This is now 11,500 galaxies. And that's about a 7.1 sigma detection of the stack 21 centimeter signal. It's about 360 kilometers per second wide, full width at half maximum. We get an H1 mass, an average H1 mass, let me emphasize, of about 1.4 times 10 to the 10 solar masses at a redshift of one. And this is sort of stellar mass of 10 to the 10 solar masses. So we have stellar mass estimates for all these galaxies from the optical photometry and the infrared photometry. And the first thing that jumps out is that the H1 to stellar mass ratio for the sample is much larger in the local universe. There's much more gas in these galaxies. The ratio is about three and a half times higher than at redshifts of zero for galaxies with exactly the same M star distribution. So these are much more gas rich at a redshift of one. With this high single to ratio, you can do more fun stuff. You can break up your sample now into bins. And so the, the, the thing that we wanted to do was to ask the question, how fast is the H1 eaten up by star formation? And so what we did was that we, we estimated the gas depletion time, which is basically the H1 mass divided by the star formation rate. We got the star formation rate by stacking the 1.4 gigahertz continuum, detected at about 70 sigma for these galaxies. And what, what has been plotted over here is the H1 depletion time scale. MH1 upon star formation rate for three stellar mass bins. In each bin, we measured uh, the H1 signal with more than four sigma sensitivity. It's about four and a half sigma in each case. The red points, the red circles, are for the deep two survey, redshifts of one. The blue ones are for redshifts of zero. So the first thing that jumps out at you is that depletion times are much, much shorter at redshifts of one compared to redshifts of zero by about a factor of four or so. But the other thing that jumps out is that for stellar masses larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses, and remember, let me emphasize, these are the galaxies which dominate the decline in the star formation rate density. The gas depletion time is less than a giga year. It's about 0.8, 0.85 giga years. And that is actually comparable to the molecular gas depletion time, which is about 0.7 giga years. So the rate at which atomic hydrogen is eaten up by massive galaxies at redshifts of one is comparable to the rate at which atomic gas, atomic gas molecular gas are eaten up at the same rate. What this tells you is that if you want to keep these galaxies on the main sequence and continue forming stars at the same rate, you need to accrete gas from the circumgalactic medium on that time scale. If you don't, that's it. Star formation you know, essentially switches off. And it turns out that this one giga year time scale is pretty much the gap that we can get within our redshift range. So we can actually, from a redshift of 1.3 to 1.0, that's about a gap of one giga year. So if galaxies do not accrete gas, sufficient gas, then you would expect that if I did a measurement of the average H1 mass in two samples of galaxies at a ratio to 1.3 and 1, I would expect that the H1 mass of the galaxy at a ratio to 1 would drop. And so that's what we did, and that's what we saw. So we stacked the 21 centimeter signal, the stellar mass matched samples, again, identical stellar mass distributions, into a ratio of bins. The orange curve is for the high redshift bin, 1.25 to 1.45, average redshift 1.3. The blue curve, the blue spectrum, is for the low redshift sample, average, average redshift of one. And you can see just visually, these are both more than five sigma uh, detections, and that's the H1 mass. So you see a decline in the H1 mass of galaxies between a redshift of 1.3 and one. Really small time interval, sharp drop 
in the average H1 mass by a factor of about three and a half. This is about a 3.4 sigma result I should mention right now. So we conclude from this that, I mean, it's clear that the H1 mass of galaxies drop steeply uh, in this redshift range. We conclude from this that the combination of the, of the short gas depletion time and the observed decline in H1 mass te is telling you loud and clear that the decline in the star formation rate density at redshift of one happens because of insufficient gas accretion. I mean, this, this is basically smoking gun evidence that why does it happen is a good question. There are possibilities. One possibility which I incline towards, but it, it's not the only one, is that these galaxies are big galaxies. And they're off the mass where you would expect a transition in the mode of accretion, where you'd expect that you'd shift from cold mode, where you essentially flow along, the gas flows along filaments onto the disk of the galaxy, and the, there's not much cooling time. It just flows onto the disk. Accretion times are very short to the hot mode. In the hot mode, the gas flows in along pretty much radial orbits and gets shocked to a high temperature, to the radial temperature, and now it takes a lot of time to cool down. So I suspect this is what is happening. The other possibility, which, is, which we can't rule out right now, is that there could be hidden AGN. So there could be feedback from uh, supernovae, for example, these big galaxies, which could be, uh, again, uh, causing the accretion to slow down. We don't know the answer to this. We have some ideas of how to go forward. What next? The, the next thing that we can do is that we can actually answer this question about what is the baryonic composition of galaxies at high redshifts. And this is something, again, which people have argued about in the literature. A lot of people have said that most of the gas in high redshift galaxies is molecular in nature. So the good news here is that we have direct measurements of the H1 mass now in a bunch of galaxies. We have stellar mass estimates. And Linda Taconi, Ranad Genzel and company have given us molecular gas mass estimates as a function of the stellar mass by the scaling relation. So I can now estimate the molecular gas mass for each of the D2 galaxies. And I can basically plot you know, the, the, the ratio of the average atomic gas mass, the average stellar mass, and the average molecular gas mass to stellar mass. Red is atomic gas, uh, blue is molecular gas. And you can see that you know, at, at low redshifts from the X gas sample, the, the atomic gas to stellar mass ratio is less than one. It's about whatever, about half or so. There's very little molecular gas. And the molecular gas to stellar mass ratio rises, and it reaches about one at redshifts of 1.3. But there's this spectacular jump again at redshift of 1.3. The atomic gas is five times, uh, has five times more mass than the molecular gas in galaxies of the same stellar mass. And so there is a jump that happens there. And you can see the same thing by looking at the ratio of, of, the, of, the, of the, the constituent, stars or atoms or, or molecules, to, to the total baryonic mass. In the local universe, stars make up about 60% of the, of the baryonic mass. I, I've ignored uh, ionized gas for the moment. And if you look at the atomic gas, it rises to more than stars by redshifts of one. And then by redshifts of 1.3, it makes up 70% of the baryonic mass. So essentially, in galaxies at high redshifts, above redshifts of one, atomic gas is the game in town. It's the place where the baryons are. Two minutes, thank you. What else can we do? I said we would love to get scaling relations. And even with the 5, 10 hours that we have so far, we have, we've already gotten a bunch of scaling relations. I'll just show you two of them, because you can do stuff with these. The first one is the H1 mass to stellar mass relation. And this is over about two orders of magnitude in stellar mass. Interestingly, you actually see about the same slope at redshifts of one. So these are the D2 galaxies. And these are the X-cast galaxies. You see approximately the same slope in the MH1 M star relation, but higher normalization. So even at low stellar masses, you have about uh, three and a half to four times more H1 uh, than in the local universe. And I'll, I'll show you something that we, we can do with this in a, in a minute. The other thing is the MH1 MB relation. This is the tightest scaling relation we have in the local universe. It's between the H1 mass and the absolute B band magnitude. And uh, the, the red solid line over here is the local universe fit. And you can see over here that we are very close to local universe fit. It's consistent at about at a little less than two sigma significance. And this is interesting. It looks a little flatter visually. And I think the, the, the big question over here is, is whether it is really flatter or if it, is, if, it, if it actually matches. There are implications to this. So I'll show you one of the implications. Uh, using this, using this MH1 MB relation, you can actually get the H1 mass function. And this is something that Frank Briggs and Sandhya Rao came up with about 30 years ago in the days before the, uh, you know, the wide field surveys like you know, high pass and alpha alpha and so on. And what they pointed out was that you could combine the MH1 MB relation and the B-band absolute luminosity function. This was in the local universe, and get the H1 mass function. There's a little bit of subtlety, which they had missed, which is that you have to assume some scatter in the MH1 MB relation. And without knowing the scatter, you can't actually do this. You, you, it turns out you underestimate the, the high mass galaxies, the number of high mass galaxies. 
we've assumed an unchanging scattered in the H1 MB relation, and these show you two results for the H1 mass function. The blue curve is for, uh, is, is from alpha alpha in the local universe. The green curve is assuming that the slope doesn't change uh, over here in this relation, that we have the same slope uh, at redshifts of one and at redshifts of zero. And the red curve is a complete fit. In both cases, there are roughly 10 times more galaxies with H1 masses more than about five times 10 to the 10 at a redshift of one, so more than about here. This is the number of galaxies with mass above a uh, given H1 mass. So lots of high mass galaxies. There's good news for Laduma, I think. You can do something even cuter. You can actually combine the MH1 M star relation and the MH2 M star relation, and then you can assume what Nick Scoville has called the continuity of main sequence evolution. You can basically assume the galaxies continue forming stars on the main sequence continuously, and ask the question, how does, can you estimate the, the amount of gas accreted? And you can do this fairly trivially with these assumptions. And so I'm just gonna show you the results, chat with me about uh, uh, offline later if you like, you're writing this paper up as, almost as I speak. These give you the redshift averaged rates from a redshift of 1.3 to 1.0. That's the star formation rate uh, as a function of stellar mass, the blue curve. The orange curve is the H2 formation rate and the green curve is the average gas secretion rate. And what you see you know, clearly is that the gas secretion rate for all stellar masses is well below the star formation rate. Galaxies basically do not make up their, uh, the amount of mass that they lose to consume in stars. And the effect is much more, of course, for high mass galaxies uh, at, at, with, with stellar masses of about 10 to the 10 and above at redshifts of 1.3. Where are we going from here? We're pushing on with a, so as I said, we've, also, we've done 350 hour survey of, of the EGS uh, at redshifts of 0.35. We're doing a 200 hour band 5 survey of Cosmos, partly because the EGS results are puzzling and don't quite match uh, the, the mighty H1 results, and the fields of view are small. We're doing a 580 hour band 4 survey. We've taken the data already for this of the D2 fields in the same redshift range. And the reasons for this are, one, to get the scaling relations much, much, much better and uh, verify the, the slope of these of the scaling relations. Also to look for environmental dependencies. We already have some curious results in that uh, there, there seems to be more H1 and galaxies and clusters at about two and a half sigma significance at redshifts of one uh, uh, compared to galaxies in the field. And that is surprising. It's exactly opposite of what you see in the local universe, but perhaps not entirely surprising. We're also doing a 140-hour band for survey of Cosmos because in Cosmos we have HST imaging, so we can do a dependence in galaxy morphology. And finally, we are pushing like mad on uh, the redshift two and a half uh, survey, doing a 650-hour band three survey of Cosmos. So this is what we have right now. We finally detected 21 centimeter emission from a bunch of galaxies at a redshift of 0.7 to 1.5. We have a much higher H1 mass relative to stellar mass than we have in the local universe. We have a really short gas depletion time, less than a giga year in massive galaxies. Stellar mass is larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses. And we see a sharp decrease in the average H1 mass in these galaxies from redshifts of 1.3 to 1. And this leads us to conclude that essentially ins insufficient gas accretion gives you the decline in the star formation rate density of redshifts less than 1. We found that atomic gas dominates the baryonic composition of galaxies redshifts of 1.3. And there's a sharp jump, as I said, from redshifts of 1 to 1.3. We've gotten the first H1 scaling relations redshifts of 1. You've got the H1 mass function, at least at the high mass end, uh, at redshifts of one, and we find there are lots more H1 massive galaxies uh, at redshifts of one than at redshifts of zero. And we have an estimate now of the average accretion rate um, at redshifts of one, and we find that uh, for all stellar, for, for over our stellar mass range, and we find that this is lower than average SFR at all stellar masses. Lots of stuff still, still coming, but I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thanks. So we have time for two questions. So uh, thanks for the great talk. I was always, uh, I was uh, uh, trying to correlate your results with the MITEI survey when they first came out. And I know that they have slightly different redshift ranges. Yeah. Uh, but I was just, yeah, but I was just wondering, since some of your redshift maybe covers it, um, I, I was wondering what, uh, when they have, they also have stellar to H1 masses, and so we were looking at depletion time scales in the context of the halo models and so on, and they felt, they were, I don't know if they made the point that atomic gas is the player here, because they, did, uh, they, they probably did they, not. Oh, they don't see that at all. Yeah. So, so there are, I, have, I can make a number of comments on my Sure. Yeah. So the, the first one is that they're at 0.37. They're down over here. Over here, atomic gas is not the main player, and they don't claim that, which, is, which makes sense. We don't see that either. The second thing is that they actually see, so they get the, the, the paper by Sinigagli et al, they get the MH1 M star scaling relation, 
And what they get is a flatter scaling relation than the local universe. We get actually the same slope uh, in Apurva Bera's work. We get the same slope as the local universe. They get a slightly higher normalization, which is consistent with our redshift one result. Apurva gets a similar normalization. So there's a debate happening over there. There are two reasons why that debate is uh, relevant. The first one is that the mighty results right now are based on extremely low synchronized ratio data. They're three sigma detections, and so one should be very wary of them. Conversely, Apurva's results are based on a really small field. Costing variance is important. So the, you know, there are two caveats which you should bear in mind for any comparisons now. So I don't think one should be do doing the comparisons now. One should be going deeper with Mighty and going wider with Apurva's work. I may ask one more quick. Uh, She's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, is it that uh, the, when you have H2 masses, which I mean, for example, you have this uh, H1 masses going down, you see that, and you also see the decline in SFR. Uh, what about it? Does it all rule out uh, immediately that molecular gas is not contributing to it and H1 is just doing something on its own? So, so this is an estimate that uh, from Takoni, this is from Gensel et al. 2015, but this gives you a feeling for, so th th they, they were the ones who actually pointed out that the molecular to stellar mass ratio is going up with redshift. And, and they get basically the same result as we do at about a redshift of 1.31 or so, the, the m mol to m star is about 1, right? These are the estimates from Descartes et al. There's Cole Z uh, of the H2 mass density. The problem with all of these is that, I mean, you see kind of, you know, if you spiggle your eyes a little bit, you see that there's some mild evidence for a decline. The problem is that the fields of view over here are tiny. Cosmic variance is huge. And that's not going to be solved at any, time, at any time in the near future. So there's ALMA stuff, there's BLA stuff over here. It's, it's not going to be solved soon. Thank you so much. So since it was only time for two questions, and the two questions were just taken, so I will just give a comment. <laughs> um, so um, maybe just an anecdotal ahead? thing is, of course, that if everybody wonders why is there a square kilometer array, of course the square kilometer was set as the specification to observe the Milky Way at redshift 1, yeah. right? That's where the square redshift, kilometer... Redshift 2, actually. The original one was redshift 2. Oh, the original? Oh, yeah. well, there must have been a 10 square kilometer array. Uh, then, uh, that was so, because uh, it was the days of CDM. Yes, yes. Once lambda CDM happened, then it became redshift 1. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I think what, what your results show is that, right, that, that the SKA will have a lot to look at uh, yeah. at, at these redshifts. Sure. So, uh, so I think it's, it's wonderful to yeah. see your uh, results. So uh, since I can't ask a question, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> As many reviews or papers I read about this star formation falling, there's also this understanding that the star formation efficiency has reduced. I mean, like Mary Putman 2017, the review yeah. I can recall, yeah. it was about how H1 hasn't fallen to as much as star formation rate density has increased throughout. So it was that the star formation efficiency, has, the gas is there, but uh, galaxy is not forming stars. Yeah. So I, I would have two comments on that. One is that, you can look at this, the H1 depletion time scale is essentially the inverse of star formation efficiency. So this plot is telling you, so if you just flip this around, you see that the star formation efficiency is much higher for the high redshift galaxies at the same stellar mass. So it is absolutely correct to say the star formation efficiency is falling mm -hmm. as you come to lower redshifts. Mm -hmm. that, that's a straight off thing. The second comment which I would make, which is a nasty comment, is that a lot of the comments made in the, in the literature are actually vis-a-vis -vis H2 not vis-a-vis -vis H1, because people didn't know the H1 properties. So one should be wary about that. But the, 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 and, and, and there's a little bit of a danger over there. I, I, sh I, should, I, sh I should say that. Because the H2 depletion time scales do not change as much as the H1 depletion time scales. The H2 depletion time declines, but it declines slowly. And so the change in the star formation efficiency is much smoother, much slower, vis-a-vis -vis H2 compared to H1. I mean, for example, you know, the H2 depletion time over here for redshifts of 1 is about you know, 0.7 or so giga years. In the local universe, it's about 0.8 or so giga years. So there's not that much of a difference. If you go to redshifts of two, it's about 0.5 giga years. So the change is not by factors of four or five in H2. So you do see evidence of a change in the star formation efficiency vis-a-vis -vis H2, but it's a much slower effect. And also you said that it's, it's for very high mass galaxies. Obviously, like if you go for redshift more than one, you know the... It's not only for very high mass galaxies. So the scaling relation shows that the H1 mass at you know, a few times 10 to the 9 is, has about the same, the slope is about the same. So, okay. so this, the, these are now bins in stellar mass. So the, the depletion time is, is very short in high mass galaxies. Mm -hmm. But even in low mass galaxies, the depletion time is much lower than in the local universe by about a factor of 5 or so. So the pattern is the same. It's just that the highest mass galaxies have a very short depletion time. 
much shorter than the low mass galaxies. So let's take the rest of the discussion to tea. And let's thank Ms. <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Nirupam Roy. Okay, um, so uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Nirupam from Indian Institute of Science, which uh, people who do not know is about uh, three kilometer away, another institute, uh, much larger one, a bit older than, than these. In fact, there are long standing uh, deep connection between this institute and IISC, um, including a joint under, uh, graduate program that we done. And um, today I'm going to talk about this um, interesting uh, sort of somewhat lucky detection that we have about uh, 21 centimeter emission from a galaxy at, at 1.3. Um, and as I have said, uh, thanks to gravitational lensing, um, this is basically it in the sense that this is what my talk is going to be. So if, if you were there in Sieb's talk this morning, Sieb mentioned that in the first half of his talk, he was talking about astrophysics and then he wanted to switch to cosmology. I'm going to step uh, back one more uh, step and this is going to be more like astronomy, not even astrophysics. And I have warned about this to, to Saurav when he asked me to give this talk telling that this probably has very little connection with cosmology. He said, no, no, this is like, so-called low, low redshift uh, cosmology. I think the aim here is that um, to show this result, which is more like a chance detection and then excite the community enough so that people will eventually be doing astrophysics and cosmology with similar thing in near future. Um, so what I'm going to, uh, what I plan to do is start with a bit of background, but then after Sibs and Nisim's talk, I think most of this first point is sort of uh, redundant. Uh, which reflect here in the in the black screen here, but this is the this is the only astrophysics part in the in the talk. In the sense, uh, what I'm going to say is that thanks to all the excellent numerical simulation, including dark matter as well as baryon, in the last uh, decade or so, we now uh, sort of have some some good idea about the galaxy evolution overall from this numerical simulation point of view. With um, uh, you know, almost all the features that we um, talk about have been captured more or less successfully in this in this simulation in one way or the other. So this is one such simulation, the, the TNG simulation showing you the growth of a particular galaxy here, um, which, um, um, which is basically accreting the, the gas through these filaments uh, from the surrounding and, and so on, which uh, the details of this Nisim has already talked about. So I will, you know, not go into the details and uh, skip this thing. But from an observational point of view, just to come back to this overall uh, picture. So you have, we have some fairly good idea about these components, as I said, from, from numerical simulation. And from the observ observer's point of view, the tracers of these various things that are happening on the scale of galaxy evolution, you can have uh, um, ionized gas in the CGM traced mostly through UV lines, but other tracers as well. The molecular gas, again, um, through various uh, line transition, which has been done routinely up to quite a very high redshift, I'll say. Stars can be probed through multiple tracers and so on. And in a way, the, the key component, which is not so much probed at quote unquote high redshift. So when I'm talking about high here in terms of H1, it's not really high, it's like low, um, right? So that has uh, remained sort of a, a missing uh, piece uh, to a large extent. And that comes out uh, nicely here if we look at sort of the, the uh, status of the, of the field. We uh, have seen this plot multiple times about the, the star formation density evolution with redshift, uh, the, the stellar uh, component, the molecular component, and you see this component here, which is sort of least populated uh, from observations, right? And the idea is how, how we can have more constraint on, on this. At the lower end, one can have uh, large volume surveys detecting individual galaxy at the higher end. Some of this constant has come from the, the DLA uh, systems, then stacking somewhere um, in the intermediate range and so on. And again, Siv and Nisim talked about various ways of um, populating this, increasing our uh, observational constant on this component, this very important component of the galaxy evolution overall um, by building bigger telescope, integrating deeper, and so on. And one of the components which 
now I'm sort of going to again uh, talk about is uh, lensing. So uh, I don't think I need to go through this slide here, apart from pointing out that this number is extremely low, which make it very, very hard to detect the 21 centimeter in emission from uh, reasonably um, uh, high, low redshift, whatever you call it. So, uh, so far, this is the, the record holder, which is uh, redshift of uh, 0.4, about 0.4 from the Chile survey with the VLA. Uh, you can see this is 178 hours of observing time, which has resulted in the detection of, of uh, this source here. Right? Of course, one can go into uh, stacking. Nisim uh, talked about this in, in details, but there, again, it's not um, economical in the sense that you need to really have uh, spectroscopy uh, for a large number of sources. You need to put um, hundreds of hours to have this uh, detection from stacking where you get to know the average properties of, of these sources, of course. right? And you can this way go up to 1, 1 1.3 by stacking. The individual galaxies, uh, so far as I mentioned, was at a redshift of 0 0.376, a single object at, at that redshift, right? Um, so here, here comes the other thing which can sometimes be helpful. Um, and again, if you remember uh, Sib's talk, what he mentioned, the numbers um, for the detection and the RMS noise, like 10 microjansky versus 250 microjansky uh, being the RMS noise for a reasonable amount of observing time. So if somehow you can enhance the signal by that factor of 20 to 30, you have a chance of detection. And that's what may happen in some of the cases if you are lucky enough through uh, strong lensing, if you have a foreground galaxy, which is basically um, uh, enhancing the H1 signal by uh, that factor, compensating for your low sensitivity of the current telescopes, right? So the, so the source so from 21 centimeter, now I move to a, a very different uh, regime here in centimeter, which is 8 into 10 power minus 5, so 8,000 8, angstrom. Um, these are showing HST observation. So there is this uh, sample we come across, which is uh, basically possible uh, gravitationally lens system uh, selected from SDSS uh, data release, where you see multiple nebular um, lines uh, at different red shift from the same source. And that sample has been followed up um, uh, through HST uh, from the SLAC survey, basically um, imaging at 8,100 uh, angstrom filter. And what uh, these people have done, so uh, Sue et al. 2017, what they have done is they have carefully modeled the, the foreground galaxy, uh, looked at the residual, and tried to um, make, make a model of this in, they have like two different methods of trying to uh, build this parameterized or, or pixelized version of, of the, the lensed uh, background galaxy. And uh, this is effectively, of course, the details here will de depend on the parameter of the, the lensing galaxy here. And this is, this is the final image here that you see is the target that we, for which we have got this H1 data, which basically show that uh, through this, this modeling, you can actually identify almost complete Einstein ring-like structure for a, for a background uh, galaxy being strongly lensed by the foreground object here. And the estimated, so, so this modeling basically gives you a fairly good idea about the parameter of the lenses already. So that goes into your modeling when you can um, observe the H1 for this galaxy. And uh, the, optical, the optical magnification in this case is actually above 100. Okay? So this type of sources can be very promising targets for H1 follow-up to detect, uh, detect the 21 centimeter emission because you can beat the difference between your sensitivity and the expected signal um, if you get uh, that type of a magnification of the uh, H1 signal also. Of course, one has to be a bit careful because the magnification in optical and the H1 is not necessarily going to be same because the magnification factor at the end uh, depend on various parameters, the most sensitive one being the, the size of the source and the optical size of the source is much smaller than the H1 size. So typically, we'll expect the H1 magnification to be lower than the optical magnification. Uh, so this was the source for which we um, come across the, the GMRT uh, data from the archive. And uh, so I will probably skip this part. The, the stellar mass inference for this galaxy was uh, not very easy. In fact, I will um, 
uh, say that this is this is more like build on on uh, various scaling relations which have been used but whatever stellar mass we have got it should be taken with a uh, pinch of salt but in this case as as it happened the galaxy signal was modified by a factor of 25 or so by a foreground um, early type galaxies which make the 21 centimeter line uh, detectable so i'll quickly go through um, uh, the, the data which were taken from the GMRT uh, for this target using band 4, 550 to 650 megahertz with a spectral resolution of about 24 kilometer per second. And it was about 24 hours of observation with about 18 hours on source time. So this you can compare with you know, hundreds of hours that you may need to uh, detect the H1 at similar red shift through a stacking experiment. Um, the source red shift, the background galaxy is at 1.29 uh, Z and the lens is at uh, 0 0.13. Uh, as I mentioned, the optical magnification is 105. Um, and uh, so I will just quickly show the, the, the nice uh, continuum image which sort of uh, tells us about the, um, the data quality which was quite nice and in fact, Band 4 is one of the cleanest band at GMRT. Here, what I'm showing you is the flagging fraction. So even at the cleanest band of GMRT, RFI is a big problem. You can see in some of the ranges, there are like almost all data has been flagged. Thankfully, not in the central part here where the, the galaxy signal is expected to be. In fact, uh, between these two lines, this is about 5,000 kilometer per second around the gal galaxy systemic velocity, which has a very um, less amount of RFI, uh, thankfully. And when we looked at the data, finally, this is what we get. This is the, this is the H1 um, spectra. Uh, at that expected um, frequency with the, the average H1 emission, which is detected at about uh, uh, almost close to six sigma significance here. The peak here is detected at about five sigma significance. <laughs> so uh, this is the first detection of, of lens um, 21 centimeter emission, and this is also so far the highest relative detection of H1 emission from a single object. Um, so. Uh, this is, this is sort of it, uh, you know, the part of the, the astronomy that uh, we have got. Now you can do a bit of modeling to find out the H1 mass from this spectra. This is quite non-trivial. If you do not have lensing, of course, you can integrate over the line, know the factor, know the redshift, you can estimate the H1 mass. In this case, it's a, it's a bit difficult because there is a magnification happening and which can in principle be chromatic in the sense that different channel, the, the H1 may have a different magnification factor. So what we did is we basically, again, so this, from this point onward, it becomes somewhat model dependent. Um, we assume, uh, you know, so this is sort of a standard form for the H1 surface density, including the, the molecular mass ratio, which is parameterized by this um, RC mole parameter. And then we assume some sort of a relation between the mass and size. Um, we build this model, we use a singular isothermal ellipsoid profile for the, for the lens mass, which was very well constant from the HST modeling already. And then we um, basically use uh, this uh, graphic package for the ray tracing to uh, run um, 10 power 4 realization of simulation, varying these parameters and see for uh, uh, which set of parameter we get a good match between the, the observation and the, and the data. Um, and that will uh, basically give us um, an idea about how much of the um, magnification happening for the H1 signal overall. So this is sort of the, the model one can build, um, uh, convolving it to the same resolution as our data finally to match the, the data and model. And then once, once you do that, basically the outcome of this entire thing is, is the overall magnification of the, of the H1 signal. Um, and that goes here in your uh, H1 mass estimation. Uh, the magnification we got in H1 is 29 plus minus uh, 6. The corresponding mass is about, uh, you know, very close to 10 power 10 solar mass. Um, the inferred stellar, ma stellar mass, as I mentioned, is this, but this number should, as I, as I said, it has come from a very convoluted argument based on various scaling relations that people have observed, so one should probably be a bit careful, but the, the, the thing is that it is probably significantly higher than what we see at the, at the local universe. That much we can say confidently, we, we cannot say this number, uh, this number very, very confidently. 
Okay. So, uh, but I think I'm I'm almost at the end of end of uh, my talk. So, um, you know, so we we, uh, we got this this mass estimation. The the error here reflects basically the uncertainty in the magnification factor, and the rest come from the um, uh, RMS noise of the of the spectra that we have got finally from here, which has been estimated using uh, various methods, and we find that to be um, consistent with with each other. So, um, you know, so I, I come to the conclusion, which uh, is basically that this is a fast detection of lens 21 centimeter emission um, being the highest redshift detection and a, a very significant evolution probably of, of this ratio. Um, and uh, so I want to uh, sort of end this presentation by drawing um, your attention to some of the um, uh, projection in a way. So, of course, um, this is something which is not uh, unthought of earlier, and one of the uh, very early work in this field was uh, from uh, people here um, who uh, looked at this potential of detecting. Um, of course, they were uh, thinking about much higher red shift range, not at 1.3, uh, but something around 3 to 4, I, I guess, their predictions were for that range. And um, observation with the SK are expected to detect a few H1 clouds in the field of every cluster through this, through this lensing. Um, and even non-detection will be able to put useful constant on the H1 content. Of course, the, the reason I'm telling all this that with single source detection, as I said, this is just the first step. We cannot really do any cosmology from here. But the potential of detecting many such sources in future by um, trying to uh, look for this lensed um, uh, signal uh, can actually have significant uh, implication and improve our understanding on, on uh, the H1 content at, at high red shift. And similarly, um, there is this recent study, Gene et al, um, that uh, red shift 0.5 to even 2, the order of magnitude increase of lens galaxy fraction, um, this basically indicate that SK1 mid as well as the precursor will detect, so this is, sorry, 10 to the power 4, uh, not 104. This is 10 to the power 4 uh, of the order of 10 to the power 4 lens galaxy and will have uh, significant impact on, on our understanding. So uh, this work demonstrated that this is actually possible. You can actually have detection of this with a significant um, uh, magnification and uh, that if we are uh, looking for it with the precursor as well as upcoming SK, we have a lot of potential here to do cosmology with that. Um, so I think I'll probably stop here. I'm almost out of my uh, time. Um, I just want to quickly flash one more uh, slide to highlight the potential of UGMRT after the um, wide band uh, has, has come in. So it's not only H1 emission at, at higher rates. If we, in fact, recently had, uh, so this is preliminary result where we have a detection of H1 absorption from a source of uh, 5.84, uh, in fact, a, a system. Uh, so as I said, this is very preliminary work, but uh, this is the Red Sea range which uh, was earlier um, sort of completely unexplored and now uh, GMRT can, can do it. Uh, so we got uh, some detection from archival data and then recently we have uh, re-observed it and we um, detect the line at the same barycentric frequency, so shifted in the, in the topocentric frequency after you Doppler correct. Uh, so this is again the, the highest redshift H1 absorption detection uh, so far in, in 21 centimeter. Um, and I just want to highlight that uh, UGMRT has this very um, important potential to look at the very high redshift H1 um, thanks to the larger band that UGMRT offer. So with that, I'll stop here and I'll uh, leave you with this one. Thanks. Thanks. So kind of naive question, but uh, did I understand that from the HST lens systems, you chose one to follow up? Uh, so, so did you look at many and then one showed up this or the no, one you no. chose? So, 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 so the way, so that's why I said that it's a um, uh, lucky chance detection okay. in, the, in the sense that um, um, we were preparing a proposal for GMRT and we are trying to find out targets which are um, most promising, um, decided by optical magnification times one plus z by dl square from that sample. 
and out of the past six or seven sources, we wanted to see what data is there in the archive already. Um, this data was there, so we hold on that proposal, thought we will look at this data first, see if we can detect it before we go ahead with the larger proposal. Okay. So, so that's how we So this is like up. detecting in the pre... Yeah, yes. But this was the most promising one because of very high <laughs> optical uh, magnification factor, uh, which basically made it the most promising target in, in, in that uh, list that we are looking for. Another naive question. So in the optical HD image, there's an, a ring. In the radio, it's a blob. Uh, so is the blob, let's say, the beam, the synthesized beam? It's is beam, yeah, yeah. Is the, the, is the, contains the entire ring? Yes. So yes. you have no, yeah. you don't yeah. see the, the right. actual lensing except the magnification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe a comment, and, and most of you don't know, but I also have a life in gravitational lensing. I'm actually the, the PI of the Slack survey. Um, so this was, I think, one of the very first lenses we, we, we found. And, and years ago, we put in a proposal to find radio emission from them. I put in a VLA proposal. It was not for H1. It ended up in the lowest of the lowest of the lowest in the ranking. We didn't like it at all. So I'm really happy <laughs> that you picked these lenses and, and for H1 and are finding actually very nice results because many of these lenses, of course, were picked to be star forming. They also have very strong emission lines, oxygen three, etc. And so you can actually we've made a ranking of all of them based on the strength of their emission lines. So this might be a useful also all right way of, of picking your targets for the future. So I'm I'm really happy <laughs> that you you did this and uh, and finding H1. So. Yeah, and in fact, this galaxy, based on the SDSS spectrum, it is uh, most likely a star, for, star forming galaxy. So you expect the H1 to be. Yeah, I should remember that name, but unfortunately, uh, Ble Bletcher, probably Bletcher. Tariq Bletcher, yeah. Yeah, congrats. But they probably, uh, sorry, just, uh, yeah, they yeah, probably were ahead. looking for the continuum um, sorry, associated with the H1 because they. <laughs> did not propose a narrow bandwidth observation with a lot of channels. They did a like wide band uh, observation. Yeah, so congratulations. This is really impressive. So the more exciting thing for me was, for whatever reason, the, uh, the 21 centimeter forest, uh, sort of the absorption that you have uh, spotted uh, uh, um, at higher redshift. Uh, have you correlated it at all with the optical spectrum of that quasar? And is uh, this? Uh, I mean, is they, it yeah, yeah. This is this was again. I mean, it it is a it is a archival data, but this was a targeted observation at that frequency. And you see this indication here from the from the spectrum where you expect a, a, a component at uh, five point eight four. Is this what you are asking for? Or? Uh, yeah, it's so this was a not a blind search for each one absorption. This was a targeted. Like the wrong side of the. I would have expected it on the other side of the Lyman alpha, but maybe I'm. Yeah. Anyway, this is all really nice. Uh, how this is uh, eighteen hours or twelve hours? Eight uh, hours. The, yeah. So this previous observation was uh, six hours. Now we have got uh, twelve hours, but the spectra that I have showed is from the eight hours. The last four hours block has been observed just a few few weeks ago, we have not analyzed that part yet and combined, but with uh, already with um, eight hours, we see the, the line at the same uh, signal to noise. So I thought I'll just, you know, so this as a preliminary possible H1 absorption. I mean, this probably has to be the IGM, right? Because you, you don't see any evidence of no, a DLA is, or a, anything. No, no, this is a DLA system. Is that a DLA? Uh, but you don't see a DLA in the spectrum. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank them. Uh, we'll start the lightning talks now. Um, we have five talks lined up, five each minute. This will be chaired by Sonali. So, yeah, please take this. Hi, I'm Sonali Sashdeva. I'm a postdoc here. Uh, I work on formation and growth of galaxies in optical infrared. So, if uh, so you would have understood that I'm not registered. I'm not supposed to tell that. <laughs> Uh, so my job here is very simple. There are five talks. You are not supposed to ask questions. They have five minutes. And uh, the first person is Ankur. Uh, I'm here to advertise my poster 
on a project which I did with Tirth and Aditya two years ago, my MSc thesis. So basically, I'm going to talk about a new way to make reionization simulations faster. Uh, there are two reasons why you may want to do this. First is that parameter estimation is costly. So let's say the hard work most of you are putting in here pays off and we get some observational data for uh, the H1 power spectrum as a function of redshift. And now you want to fit it and obtain parameters for EOR and cosmology. So that will be costly because you need one simulation per point, uh, per sampling point in the parameter space. So we have semi-numerical methods like script, which are fast, but they only work if you have given the underlying dark matter distribution. So if you are, say, doing a joint parameter estimation on EOR parameters and cosmology, then you will be limited by your dark matter only simulations, which can take days to run, even though script will run in minutes. So it will be good to have some way of generating a large number of realizations of cosmological simulations for different parameters like H0, NS, etc. The other reason could be uh, is because uh, EOR simulations require a very high dynamic range. On one hand, they should be big enough that uh, the volume they sample is comparable to that sampled by surveys. On the other hand, they need to be able to resolve the sources of ionizing radiation, which are really small scale halos. And this will give you that, it will tell that you need to run a simulation like 8,000 cube or bigger, which is just absurd. So what people usually do is they use subgrid methods. These, uh, for example, sample halo stochastically from a known uh, analytical halo mass function. Instead of that, it will be good to have some real, as in numerically simulated n-body halos, which obey real correlations with density, etc. So we came up with a method which does exactly that. We take halos from a small but high resolution simulation, and we put them in a box with, uh, which has a large size, but it is of low resolution. And we do this along with, uh, while, while we do this, we also transfer the density and velocity fields rigidly. And this preserves all the cross correlations between halo density and velocity. And it's a perfect package. It basically gives you a high dynamic range box with halos put where they should be. And all you have to do is run two small, small, I mean, narrow dynamic range simulations, which run very quickly because uh, the cost goes cubically with dynamic range. So if you reduce the dynamic range by two, a factor of two, you will get at least four times uh, higher speed. And this sounds too good to be true, but uh, the motivation comes from something like this. So these are matter density power spectra for three boxes with overlapping dynamic ranges, along with, uh, for two boxes with overlapping dynamic ranges, along with a reference power spectrum with the full dynamic range. And you can see that they actually overlap. What this means is that the two narrow dynamic range boxes pack enough information to build a hybrid high dynamic range box. Uh, it doesn't have all the information needed. We do miss some modes, but what we have ended up showing is that it doesn't cost us too much in terms of accuracy of the H1 power spectrum. So what's the secret recipe? I will show you when you come see my poster. It's at the uh, water dispenser. Here I will show a teaser, two teasers. Uh, on the left hand side is the halo mass function. Can you make out the reference? No? That's the idea. It's almost matching perfectly. On the right hand side is the H1 power spectrum, uh, which does not match perfectly, but it is within the uh, cosmic variance bounds, uh, the shaded regions versus the line. Uh, and it does match for the large scales. There is some issue with the small scales, but mostly we care about large scales. Next speaker is Divesh. So hi, I'm Divesh Jain, and I'll be presenting a glimpse of my poster, which will be which is on uncovering patchy reionization bias on primordial gravitational waves. And you can check out this poster at FC12. This is based on the work we have submitted to MNRS and is available under this archive identifier. So what is the problem we are trying to address? Is we have heard from the first day Akito's talk that future CMB experiments will be targeting a five sigma detection on the tensor to scalar power spectrum ratio R. 
But there are challenges to these detection and this arises from the foregrounds. A lot of work right now is going on to take care about the lensing B modes arising from large scale structures and B modes arising from the galactic emission. But often overlooked uh, contribution to B mode arises from the patchiness in the process of reionization. And this is what something we would like to understand is if neglecting this uh, B mode contribution from reionization would impact our inference of the tensor to scalar power spectrum ratio R for the upcoming uh, experiments, uh, CMB B mode experiments like CMB S4 and PICO. So how do we do it? We need a model of reionization. We use script here, which is an explicitly photon conserving seminumical scheme of reionization. You have heard about this code in yesterday's Barun's lightning talk. What script does is uh, given a dark matter snapshot and giving, given source properties at a redshift, it can generate ionizing fields. And in this work, we have used script, combined it with a modified version of CAM to create a self-consistent package that can calculate the CMB observables of reionization. Primarily that is the kinetic sunyaev zildovich signal, the Thomson scattering optical depth, and the uh, B-mode polarization in CMB. So what we do is we take these three CMB observables of reionization, put it under a Bayesian framework in context of the upcoming CMB experiments, and we try to infer uh, uh, the tensor to scalar power spectrum ratio R uh, for two cases of B mode power spectra. And for one case, which is the template, here we are considering the model feed for the B mode power spectra to contain all the sources of B mode spectrum. And that is the primordial contribution, the lensing contribution, and the patchy B mode contribution coming from reionization. And in order to study the bias, we consider another model of uh, the B mode spectra, which will just contain the primordial and the lensing contribution to the B modes. So the idea is any inference we get uh, using this model of B mode spectra into this likelihood, will the inference on R will get will give us the true recovery of R, but any inference which we get from this particular model will give us a biased recovery of R, and this is primarily due to we are not accounting for the total contribution to the B modes. In order to generate the mock data, what we have done is confronted our model of reionization with the recently available uh, CMB measurements on optical depth tau by the Planck and uh, the KZ signal at the multipole of 3000 by the SPT team, and from which we derive two parameters. One is the best fit model, and another is the, a model which we call Max BB, which really is the, sets the upper limit on the uh, B mode uh, contribution allowed by the three sigma contours of the Bayesian chains. What we observe is uh, for a mock of R of 10 to the power minus 3, B mode observations from CMB S4 plus, the S4 would uh, start to observe a bias in the measurement of R at 0.18 sigma. And if we go towards more sensitive observations, this bias would increase to at 0.2 sigma. But this may not be the true scenario for the universe and the R value for the universe might be a little bit lower. And if we tested it for a mock of five times to the power minus four, and if we try to worsen the situation by considering the max BB model of reionization, we start to see that same B S4 B mode observations will see a bias of 0.55 and the PICO would, being a more sensitive uh, uh, experiment, will see a bias of 0.73 sigma. So the key takeaways would be that uh, neglecting B mode contribution from reionization introduce a bias in our inference of R. And this bias can go as high as 0.73 sigma, which will affect uh, the target five sigma detection, which we plan for R. And to know more about this poster, uh, visit FC12. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Janki Raste, postdoc at NCRA. She will tell about studying the end of reionization with the 21 centimeter signal. Um, hello everyone, I am Janki. I am a postdoc at NCRA and uh, this work was done while I was at TIFR with uh, Girish and uh, uh, Catherine and others. So um, I'm, I'm working specifically on studying the end of the epoch of reionizations, which was uh, uh, with the power spectrum and the bispectrum. So this model, which was 
which already Girish presented, and uh, this is the uh, this is this is the concordant model in the sense that it is in observations with a large range of uh, observational probes. For example, we have uh, constraints on the IGM uh, from various quasar uh, observational uh, quasar spectra and other observational probes on the IGM at uh, ionization fraction. So this model, uh, ionization history, is in agreement with that. It's also in agreement with the Planck uh, reionization optical depth. And for contrast, just for contrast, we have taken a fiducial early reionization model. Uh, another observe, uh, something interesting to observe about this model is that not only the reionization is late, it's also patchy, which, and which means that towards the end of reionization, we have large neutral islands of up to spanning up to 100 megaparsec. Uh, persisting up to redshifts 5.4, as as low as that. So um, this is the this is what uh, reionization would look like in this model. And um, then the next step is that we calculate the 21 centimeter power spectrum for this reionization model. And uh, uh, to do that, we have ignored the spin temperature fluctuations because if spin temperature fluctuations are there, they are not constrained yet, so they might uh, dominate the ionization fraction. Uh, fluctuations, and we wanted to focus on the ionization history. So this is, uh, with that term neglected, we have calculated the uh, brightness temperature uh, map uh, history corresponding to the ionization history of the universe. And we see similar uh, large um, positive regions corresponding to the neutral islands. This would what the uh, uh, global 21 centimeter signal would look like, and uh, this is the power spectrum. So compared to the uh, early reionization model, we expected to have orders of magnitude improvement, I mean, uh, orders of magnitude enhancement in the power in the late reionization model, because reionization is still go ongoing at this redshift. So to see if uh, this redshift is uh, um, promising for studying uh, from observational point of view, we calculated the sensitivity of uh, these four instruments, HERA, MW, LOFAR, and SK1 low, uh, with the publicly av available package 21 centimeter sense for 1080 hours of observations. And uh, we assumed foreground uh, model to be uh, moderate, within, uh, which means that we have ignored the horizon wedge, but we have assumed that the ER window is going to be clean. So with this assumptions, we have um, the sensitivity, which look really promising that uh, towards the end of reionizations, because the synchrotron foregrounds are comparatively uh, better, we have sensitivity, improved sens sensitivity for all the instruments. So this is our, this is our uh, power spectra for the late reionization model, and this was for the early reionization model. And these are the sensitivity for various instruments at uh, k equals 0.1. And these are the upper limits given by various uh, instruments so far. And this is, uh, as we can see, that the upper limits have improved by orders of magnitude over the years. And these are the latest uh, HERA upper limits, and which is like very close to uh, our predicted uh, results. And it is already ruling out some of the uh, very uh, more um, different uh, power spectra uh, models. But the main thing I would like to point out here is that this region so far is empty because uh, when people had uh, designed this instrument, they had something like this in mind. And uh, that's why they focused on redshifts always higher than 6. But we still have a large power and redshift 5 point, uh, between 5.4 and 6, which is uh, uh, in the models which are predicted by uh, Lyman Alpha and CMB observations. So uh, it would be really interesting if uh, we have future observations focusing on uh, this redshift range. And uh, finally, just to study the um, non-Gaussianity in the islands towards the end of reionization, I'm now uh, we are now focusing on the bispectra because these uh, neutral islands are the uh, lowest density voids in the IGM. They expected to be highly non-Gaussian, and uh, while I can't explain all of this, uh, I would like to focus this large redshift towards the, uh, which is the large redshift in our simulation before the reionization is completed. And it shows multiple uh, zero crossings. And we see, we think that that is one of the uh, signatures of the uh, neutral islands non-Gaussianity at the end of reionization. So um, thank you. Next speaker is Akansha Kapatia, again postdoc at NCRA. She will tell about semi-numerical simulations of the epoch of helium reionization. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Hi everyone, I'm Akanksha and I'm a postdoc at NCRA. And this work I've carried out with teeth. I'll be talking upon uh, on the epoch of helium reionization. So, so far we've heard talks which focus on hydrogen reionization. So, what is helium reionization? Uh, so, helium reionization refers to uh, when the second electron of helium was ionized. And why it corresponds to a different epoch is because the second electron of helium has a much higher in ionization energy compared to the first electron of helium and hydrogen. So both the first electron of helium and hydrogen were ionized by early star forming galaxies. But in order to ionize the second electron of helium, we require sources with much harder spectra. And that was not possible until the quasar, the number density of quasars picked up. So that happened at a redshift of somewhere after four. So this epoch, uh, it corresponds to the epoch of helium reionization when the second electron of helium was ionized. So uh, the, uh, the, the way we look, uh, study epoch of helium reionization is that we, uh, it will have impact, two, two types of impact on the IGM. It will heat the IGM and also because it is ionizing. So the, uh, if we look at the Lyman alpha forest lines of distant quasars, then the lines would become shallower and narrower, uh, sorry, broader, shallower and broader. So uh, by looking at uh, helium-2 Lyman alpha forest and H1 Lyman alpha forest measurements, uh, uh, we know that uh, it ended somewhere around a redshift of three, but still we don't know exactly when it uh, ended because for helium-2 Lyman alpha, uh, the number of sight lines are very few. And for H1 Lyman alpha, we, we have a lot of sight lines and what we actually infer is the uh, temperature uh, of the IGM. So I'll come to that later on. Uh, and the importance of studying helium reionization is that uh, it, it is going to uh, determine the spatial variations of high redshift uh, UV background around these redshifts. And uh, second is the thermal fluctuations of the intermediate redshift IGM would also be, uh, it's going to impact uh, during these uh, uh, redshifts when helium is reionized. So uh, now when we want to study helium reionization, we need efficient simulations because so far parameter estimation has not been done. And in order to do parameter estimation, we need uh, codes that can run fast. So how we do that? So first, uh, we need sources. So uh, like I already mentioned, the sources would be quasars. So the first step is to um, model quasars as sources of reionization. And the way to do it efficiently is to map the uh, masses of quasars to the masses of dark matter halo. So first we have an n-body simulation, we use gadget 4. And from that n-body simulations, we'll get dark matter halos. For every halo, we will have a mass and we associate a luminosity to that mass using something that is called as abundance matching. So abundance matching is nothing, but as the name suggests, it just counts the number of uh, sources above a certain mass and uh, equ equates it with how, what, what luminosity it would correspond to if we have the luminosity function given to us. So we will have the luminosity function observationally and we will have the mass functions. And uh, there will be a, just a certain fraction of those halos which would host quasars. So there will be one parameter here which we call F1 which depends upon quasar lifetimes TQ. So quasar lifetime means the lifetime over which the quasar is active. So once we have our quasars, uh, we have uh, luminosities of the quasars. Using some uh, a quasar ACD model, we can assign how many ionized helium to ionizing photons that quasar will emit. So uh, knowing this, we and uh, with a, a quasar ACD model, uh, we can assign the number of ionizing photons. Now uh, we so uh, already in earlier talks, uh, people have mentioned about script. So script was the code that was originally uh, um, developed for hydrogen. So we modify script for helium by introducing these discrete sources. Script takes an ionizing, ionizing field and also it takes in the matter density field. So our matter density field is again taken from gadget 4. And we modify script to include helium. So we have helium, uh, new, helium 2 and in uh, this ionizing photons from the sources. We work in a regime where helium-1 and H1 is assumed to be uh, completely ionized and is in uh, equilibrium with its uh, ionizing background. So with all of this, we will get the ionization history of our, uh, from our code. And in this, we have introduced uh, three free parameters. One is TQ or F1, which TQ goes in F1. Uh, the quiz is SCD. We, we can use models which already exist, but we can also modify alpha, uh, alpha and see how uh, ionization varies. And 
Uh, third is the clumping factor, which would go into this uh, recombination. So uh, wherever the clumping is higher, the recombinations would be higher. So that would slow down reionization. So having generated our ionization history, next is thermal history. So like I said, the another impact is uh, of ionization is photoionization heating. So if our photons have energies which are higher than the ionization threshold, that extra energy is distributed into uh, the um, uh, heating the uh, uh, gas. So, uh, so in order to solve the ionization history of the IGM, uh, we use this uh, analytical framework. This just comes directly from the first law of thermodynamics, where uh, the first term is uh, due to the expansion of the universe, which will just cool, cool the IGM. Second is due to the structure formation, which where high density regions would get heated up and uh, there will be cooling, adiabatic cooling in low density regions becoming more lower in density. And then there are other processes. So what other processes we have is photoionization heating due to helium reionization and due to hydrogen which is an ionization equilibrium with its background. And further to in order to incorporate effects of baryons, because when we are talking of heating, what we are heating is baryons, and so far we've been working with dark matter. We use a separate formalism for density and ionization. And uh, finally, we what we intend to get is an equation of state of the IGM where we constrain T naught and gamma. And uh, ideally, we expect that they will be, uh, uh, theoretically, there will be one single equation of state. But in simulations, we will see multiple equations of states because different regions will heat and cool at different timings. So uh, yeah, so finally, if you, so if you come to my poster, I can explain that. Uh, so this is the impact of clumping. Like I said, clumping will delay reionization. And this is how T naught and gamma naught, the mean, if we fit the mean, uh, uh, mean equation of state of the IGM, this is the kind of evolution we obtain for T naught and gamma naught. So thank you. And please come to my poster for details. Last speaker is Anshuman Tripathi. He will tell about comparing various sampling methods to chart global 21 centimeter parameter space using ANNs. So first of all, uh, I, I, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So my name is Anshuman Tripathi. I'm a PhD student in IIT Indore. And today I will talk about this comparing the various sampling methods to chart the global 21 centimeter parameter space using artificial neural network. So, uh, I mean, in the uh, last two, three days, you already seen these pictures many times. So, uh, for the completeness, I just pasted here. So, this picture nicely shows the evolution history of the universe from its very beginning of the time when the Big Bang happened to till the present day. And I just listed the important timeline line of the universe when the uh, cosmic microwave background release, cosmic dawn, and the uh, uh, epoch of reionization happen with the corresponding red shift range. So, uh, in 21 centimeter cosmology, what we are looking, so basically we target to measure the uh, fluctuation of the brightness, brightness temperature, delta TV, and this delta TV measures the contrast between the spin temperature and CMB temperature. And to measure uh, this signal, there are various kind of effort people are doing. Uh, based on uh, different experimental techniques, uh, like they are uh, some are based on the single radiometer technique where they target to measure the signal as a, in terms of the sky average signal or we call as the global 21 centimeter signal. And apart from that, uh, there is another kind of setup where we use multiple uh, dishes instead of one single radiometer. And here we target to measure the signal in terms of the power spectrum or tomography of the intergalactic medium. So I just listed the experiment names uh, from both uh, the techniques. So uh, as we know, uh, our the signal we are actually we are looking to measure is very much uh, observationally very much challenging. The first major challenge is the high amplitude foreground, which is 10 to power 4 to 6 order higher than the actual signal we are looking for. And apart from that, the Earth atmosphere also distort this signal significantly by introducing the directional dependent effect. And uh, uh, there is uh, radio frequency interference also when actually we are looking from uh, the Earth. And the sy other systematic effects also uh, corrupt this signal and make the observational more challenging. So the motivation of uh, this work is like, uh, as we know, like without any observational constraint, we have like a uh, huge parameter space. And uh, often we use the uh, non-parametric technique. Uh, but the problem is uh, this parametric technique cover only the small 
portion of the parameter space and that can be uh, introduce a bias in the inference. So to avoid the bias, we, uh, I mean, we are actually trying to cover the whole parameter space and we actually try to generate the uh, all possible kind of the uh, global 21 centimeter signal realization. But the, the main problem is like when we are going to cover the whole parameter space, so the data set is enormously huge. So to cut that thing, so we, uh, I mean, how we can uh, avoid those things? So we can do the sampling and uh, so uh, we can do, uh, we can cut the computational cost by using uh, this, the various sampling technique. But again, the question came uh, like, which sampling technique is much better for, uh, for sampling this parameter space and how many samples we have to draw. So, so we basically, uh, to chart the parameter space, we use three sampling technique. So the first one we use very basic one, uh, the uniform random sampling method. So here we uh, draw the sample uh, like uh, using the uniform distribution. And uh, the second method uh, we use to draw the samples, uh, we use Latin hypercube sampling. And Latin hypercube sampling is basically a stratified sampling method and it divides the sample parameters into equal size of bean. And we, and randomly we select the sample from the each bean. And the third uh, method we are using is like Hammersley sampling. Hammersley sampling is like quasi random based uh, sampling technique. And here uh, the, sam uh, I mean this technique use uh, like to generate low dis discrepancy sequence of the point in the hypercube and uh, the general. Discrepancy. So here I just draw the 100 uh, data point just for the demonstration how the sampling uh, will look like. Yeah, so, uh, so the, our ultimate goal is once we, uh, we sample the parameter space, so to generate the training data set. So we just, once we just generate the set of the uh, parameters, we just put the parameters into our uh, sampler, uh, which is based on the 10 hyper, uh, 10 parameterization and a risk, it's a kind of combination of that. And we generate the signal from that. And that signal we uh, divide into three uh, portions so that we can train our artificial neural network. So we divide it, uh, some of the portion as a training data set and some of the portion we uh, keep as for the validation and some we uh, just keep like for the test uh, our ANN, trained ANN. So uh, here I just, uh, like constructed 100 set of the data set and check the R2 score uh, for the each sampling technique. So for the 100 uh, set of data set, uh, we found like uh, the R2 score uh, uh, for the random uniform sampling is about like 73% uh, and the Latin hypercube and uh, it's like 70 around. But once we increase our data set to 10,000, so here the Latin hypercube is like Every uh, sampling has improved, but you can see the Latin hypercube I'm is like uh, improved sure much. Okay, sir. So I just plotted uh, this the output of our uh, ANN uh, prediction. So the x-axis basically represents the original parameters value, and uh, the y-axis is uh, predicted by the ANN. And I just listed the R2 score for the each parameter. And we uh, corrupt the, uh, our signal with the constant foreground and uh, we try to extract the signal from uh, by the training of that data set. So here you can see that the hammer uh, like performing uh, quite better in for the thousand also and the 10,000 also. And uh, here the list of all the other parameters. So, uh, the takeaway for uh, like this work is like uh, we can say that for improving the accuracy of the artificial neural network for each sampling method, we need to increase the number of data set for the certain extent. And uh, the performance of the ANN uh, will be uh, like more robust when we train the our ANN with more diverse set of the uh, data set. So yeah, you can visit my poster for the further discussion. So at FC. 15, thank you.